With tensions skyrocketing in Ukraine, a confrontation between the United States and Russia is more likely than ever. But what would that look like, and how do these two military heavyweights compare? If Russia and the US come to blows, anyone caught in their way better make sure not to get underfoot of these two military titans. The US remains the world's premier military superpower, but Russia holds fast to the number two spot, just barely edging out over China's rising star. In Russia, crippling sanctions over the annexation of Crimea have bled Russia dry for almost a decade and been an absolute economic disaster for the nation. Not only is the Russian economy critically weakened, but sanctions and stagnation have led to a slow but steady brain drain of Russian talent out of the country. Russian professionals, entrepreneurs, academics, and artists are all migrating out of the country and seeking better opportunities in Europe or the US. The lack of a diversified economy is a crippling vulnerability for Russia, and the global fall in oil prices has only made economic woes even worse for the nation. This has directly translated into a sharp decline in military capabilities, as budgets shrink and planned replacements for aging equipment fail to materialize. Slowly but surely, the gap in technological capabilities between Russia and the US is growing. The United States has its own financial woes, seeing the worst inflation it's seen in 40 years. With interest rate hikes coming in 2022, the American economy is sure to feel the pinch as investors tighten their purse strings. However, the American economy remains strong and well diversified, leaving it far less vulnerable to economic disruption than Russia, whether that disruption comes from social change, technology, or war. But what do the numbers say about a possible war between the two heavyweights? Population matters in a prolonged war. Without population, there are no reinforcements, and an economy is far more vulnerable to mass conscription and casualties. The United States has a population of 334,998,000 versus Russia's 142,321,000, giving the US over a 2 to 1 advantage in population. However, that's only part of the story, because Russia's aging population only makes its disadvantages even worse in comparison to the US. The US has approximately 147,399,000 conscripts potentially available to fight a brutal multi-year conflict, while Russia only has 69,737,000. Of those potential conscripts, though, approximately 122,274,000 are fit for combat duty in the US while in Russia, only 46,681,000 potential recruits are fit for combat. Every year, 4.4 million American youth reach military age, but Russia's population crisis sees only 1.3 million youth reach military age. Both nations are experiencing a decline in birth rates, with the US birth rate at 1.70 and Russia's at 1.50. This is below the 2.1 birth rate required to sustain a population, but the United States continues a positive population growth thanks to healthy amounts of immigration. Russia, on the other hand, is experiencing a population decline. In simple terms, if the two powers engage in a mass casualty conflict that spans multiple years, Russia will be bled dry long before the US is. A modern war, however, will likely be too fast and brutal for population trends to determine a winner, even if it doesn't turn nuclear. That's why what might matter most is the number of personnel both countries can muster within months of hostilities starting. The United States enters a potential conflict with a military of 1.39 million strong, while Russia maintains an active duty force of 850,000. The difference is staggering, with the US military almost twice as big as the Russian military, giving the US an immediate numerical advantage. Another advantage the US enjoys is a professional all-volunteer fighting force, while Russia has had to cancel plans to transition to an all-volunteer force due to economic woes and shrinking budgets. However, Russia has come a long way from when its military was staffed primarily by conscripts, and today only about 30% of the Russian military is conscripted, or about 225,000. The disadvantage is still significant, though. A professional all-volunteer military is more likely to retain highly trained individuals who over time transition into senior leadership positions. This fills the upper echelons of an all-volunteer force with seasoned veterans who make all the difference in combat operations. A conscripted military, however, struggles greatly to retain individuals over the long term, leading to veterancy issues and a lack of well-tested command corps. There's no direct way to measure the advantage of an all-volunteer military versus a partially conscripted one, but throughout history, volunteer soldiers routinely outperform conscripted soldiers, which is what made mercenaries so attractive to world powers throughout most of human history. The United States thus enjoys another advantage over Russia, though that advantage has shrunk due to Russia's growing professional military. A critical component of any army, though, is the strength of its reserve force, especially in modern high-intensity warfare that can see regular forces quickly rendered combat ineffective. 
The United States maintains a significant reservist force of 442,000 personnel versus Russia's 250,000. In terms of reservists, the U.S. enjoys both an advantage in numbers and training. American reservists receive regular training and even partake in combat deployments, making their competency comparable to many nations' regular forces. This is not an accident, but rather by design. The United States keenly understands that in a modern high-intensity conflict, it will face significant initial losses and is prepared to mitigate this loss in capabilities via a strong reserve force. By comparison, Russian reservist training has been historically spotty at best. Efforts to retain veteran soldiers with reservist contracts hopes to counteract a critical lack of training, but at the moment the Russian reserves simply pale in comparison to American reserves and capabilities. A lack of training also extends to the Russian regular forces as well, though great leaps have been made to increase the readiness of combat troops. Large exercises, however, are not cheap and can produce a great deal of wear and tear on equipment, something that is a critical concern for a Russian army fielding aging equipment and with a limited budget. Thus, while the Russian forces have undergone an increase in military drills in the last decade, they still fail to match the training tempo of their American counterparts. The Russian air forces have also seen a dramatic reduction in training, with most pilots flying only between 100 and 120 hours per year. The United States was matching this rate until 2019 when it pushed for an increase to an average of 200 hours per year. Aging military aircraft in both militaries is directly leading to skyrocketing maintenance expenses, and flight hours are threatened with further reduction for both militaries. Big buys of F-35 and 4.5 generation F-15 and F-18s by the US, though, seeks to replace its aging fleet, which has an average age of 28 years. Russia, on the other hand, is procuring jets at a much slower rate. The US spends $770 billion on its military, while Russia spends $154 billion. While adjusted for purchasing power parity, though, the Russian defense budget is closer to $170 billion, given that Russia buys much of its equipment from its native defense contractors. The US still retains a massive advantage, but not as large as one might think, given that salaries and benefits are much more expensive for the US than for Russia. Still, in sheer value, the United States purse is exponentially deeper than the Russian war purse, leading to a much greater proliferation of hardware. In the air, the United States fields a fleet of 13,247 aircraft, over three times as large as Russia's air fleet of 4,173. America's fighter fleet is over twice as large as Russia's, with 1,957 fighter aircraft versus Russia's 772. Both US and Russia have nearly the same number of attack aircraft, with 783 versus 739, though this is only because the United States prefers multi-role aircraft over dedicated attack platforms. A significant technological advantage in munitions allows even non-attack aircraft in the US fleet to effectively carry out air-to-sea or air-to-ground strike missions, while Russia struggles with a lack of smart weapons and support platforms for said weapons. This disparity in numbers and capabilities means that the United States Air Force and Navy aren't just better positioned to secure air supremacy, but to exploit it with devastating fire support missions against Russian ground targets, though American air supremacy will still have to contend with one of the world's best air defense forces. Knowing that it can't match America in the skies, Russia has historically put a lot of weight behind ground-based air defenses, creating some of the most advanced air defense systems in the world. It's assumed, then, that Russian ground forces will operate under the cover of their ground-based air defense assets, seriously threatening the survival of American attack platforms. However, due to a need to operate under this umbrella of safety, Russian ground forces would be unable to rapidly maneuver, potentially leaving the decisive advantage of momentum in the US hands. In a defensive mode, however, Russian ground forces would be incredibly difficult for the US to break if it was denied its air power by robust air defenses. Mobility is incredibly important in modern warfare. And here, the U.S. shines with the largest air and sea mobility fleet in the world. The U.S. operates 982 transport aircraft versus Russia's 445, giving it a decisive advantage in quickly maneuvering troops and equipment in theater. The U.S.'s focus on a large mobility fleet, though, is a matter of necessity. Just like the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans both make the United States invulnerable to invasion by any power on Earth, it is just as a big barrier for American troops needing to get to the front. As Russia lacks any capability whatsoever to threaten the US with land invasion, a conflict between the two would be indubitably playing out in Eastern Europe, necessitating the rapid movement of troops and supplies from America to Europe. Once in theater, though, the American Air Mobility Fleet will make it an agile force capable of quickly exploiting opportunities, which can just as quickly replenish losses. One area of air power where the US absolutely dominates Russia or any other world power, though, is in the number of special mission aircraft. 
These highly specialized platforms are critical for the success of a modern combined arms military and run the gamut from airborne early warning to maritime patrol aircraft to electronic warfare platforms. These aircraft can be everything from eyes in the sky to specialized platforms that listen in on or jam enemy communications and are critical for modern high-tech warfare. Here, the United States fields a whopping 774 special mission platforms versus Russia's 132, putting the logistical, intelligence, and technological advantage firmly on the U.S. side. Attack helicopters are absolutely critical for supporting any ground offensive, and the U.S. operates 366 more of these platforms than Russia, with 910 versus 544. Russia operates three main attack helicopters, the Kamov Ka-50 Black Shark, the Mi-24 Hind, and the Mil Mi-28. The U.S. operates the AH-64 Apache and the AH-6M Little Bird. With a focus on special operations, the AH-6M Little Bird provides an extremely agile air support asset for soldiers in dense urban areas, while the U.S. Army's Apache is designed to destroy enemy armor and provide direct fire support for American infantry. The Russian attack helicopter fleet represents the shifting of priorities and ideologies between its years as the Soviet Union and its modern life as the Russian Federation. The Hind is a heavy fire support platform with the capacity to ferry up to eight fully equipped troops into combat, while the Ka-50 and the Mi-28 represent a more traditional attack helicopter design. Tanks make up the backbone of any modern army, and here both nations shine. The United States has a tank force of 6,612 platforms versus Russia's 12,420. It appears that Russia enjoys a 2 to 1 advantage over the US in the tank arena, but the truth is that Russia inflates the size of its armored forces by counting units kept in storage as part of its active force. In reality, Russia operates closer to 3,000 tanks, with 9,000 mothballed and in reserve. Not only would these tanks require weeks for them and their crews to be prepared for combat, but most are Cold War relics with extremely questionable survivability on a modern battlefield. As Stalin once put it though, quantity is a quality all its own, though Stalin never lived to see the blistering speed and overwhelming firepower of modern anti-tank platforms. The bulk of Russian tank forces is the T-72, which has received modernity upgrades alongside its M1 Abrams American counterpart. However, pound for pound, the Abrams continues to outclass the T-72. While most comparisons of the Abrams capabilities rely on the shocking display of overwhelming superiority against Iraq's T-72s, this is a grossly unfair comparison. For starters, export models of Russian T-72s are not nearly as capable as those fielded by the Russian army. Secondly, Russian tank crews are overwhelmingly better trained than their Iraqi counterparts in Desert Storm. The Abrams, however, is still the better tank in 2022 with armor, sight, and electronics upgrades integrated into the active tank force on a consistent basis. Russia, on the other hand, has struggled to keep its own tank forces fully modernized. The one advantage that the T-72 enjoys over the Abrams is its ability to fire anti-tank missiles from its barrel, though doing so requires the T-72 to stand still while guiding its missile to target, during which an Abrams could simply scoot out of the way or kill the T-72. Both Russia and the U.S. place a strong emphasis on mechanized infantry, with the U.S. fielding 45,193 armored vehicles versus Russia's 30,122. While this leaves the U.S. better able to replenish losses, Russia still fields enough armored vehicles to provide ample mobility and protection to its infantry. In a battle of attrition, though, the numbers favor the U.S. There is one area, however, where Russia dominates not just the United States, but the entire world, and that's artillery. It's said Russia can field enough artillery that if it all fired at once, you'd feel the explosions on the other side of the world. And the numbers are truly astonishing. Russia absolutely dwarfs the US in numbers of self-propelled artillery, with 6,574 platforms versus America's 1,498. The story remains the same for traditional artillery, with 7,571 howitzers versus the US's 1,339. Russia also enjoys a 3 to 1 advantage in rocket artillery with 3,391 units versus the US's 1,366. The difference is a product of both geography and priorities. Russia has traditionally had to be concerned with fighting a massive land battle in either Europe against NATO or Asia against China. The nation has also had to contend with the reality that in battle against its greatest competitor, the United States, it could not count on air platforms to provide fire support for frontline troops. Facing off against a technologically superior foe, Russia placed an emphasis on sheer firepower. Superior American Abrams tanks don't matter much if they can't advance due to withering barrages of Russian artillery. The US, however, has by necessity shifted most of its fire support capabilities to more mobile airborne platforms. 
As it faces no threat of invasion or major conflict on its own continent, mobility is more important for the United States military. With a greater focus on technology, mobility, and smart munitions, airborne fire support simply makes more sense to the U.S. military than masses of artillery that need to be transported thousands of miles to any conflict zone. American air-based fire support is far superior even to Russia's masses of artillery on delivering effective fire on target, but only if Russian air defenses can be neutralized. Otherwise, American soldiers might find themselves completely overwhelmed by the world's largest artillery corps. At sea, Russia operates a larger fleet than the United States, with 605 ships versus America's 484. However, the capabilities of America's Navy far surpass those of the Russian Navy, which has historically been the least important of its military branches. Funding priorities reflect this, and today the Russian Navy is in a state of serious decline, operating largely Cold War-era equipment that rarely sees upgrades. The United States currently operates 11 aircraft carriers, with its carrier air forces by themselves larger than most nations' entire air fleets. Russia, by comparison, operates only one, and operates is a term we're using rather loosely here, as the Admiral Kuznetsov is infamous for breakdowns. A remnant of the Cold War, the Kuznetsov is in a perpetual state of disrepair and would be incapable of posing even a moderate threat to U.S. forces before it was destroyed. However, America's mighty carrier fleet is its own vulnerability, with Russia having developed hypersonic anti-ship missiles that present a lethal risk to American naval power. Currently, the United States has no defense against these weapons, except to attack and degrade Russian kill chain assets such as radar tracking installations, communication nodes, and satellites. The United States also operates nine smaller carriers to support amphibious assault operations, while Russia completely lacks this capability. Amphibious operations would likely not play a big role in a U.S.-Russian conflict, but with the ability to fly the F-35, these many carriers would only complicate matters for the Russian Air Force and Navy. Russia does outnumber the U.S. in numbers of submarines, with the U.S. operating 68 versus Russia's 70. However, modernity is an issue with Russia's submarine fleet, and it's unknown how many subs Russia can actually put to sea in case of a war, given the state of poor logistics in the Russian Navy. By comparison, the United States submarine fleet is being steadily upgraded with the acquisition of the Virginia-class attack submarine and are on the whole more capable than Russian boats. The United States outnumbers Russia in numbers of destroyers, with 92 guided missile destroyers versus Russia's 15. While outnumbered and outgunned by major combatants, Russia has a far greater fleet of smaller vessels, which could pose a serious threat if massed together or used to harness U.S. supply lines. Russia has also mounted its caliber cruise missiles on civilian vessels, meaning that any Russian ship could be a potential deadly threat to an unwary American vessel. On the whole, the American military is larger and more capable than the Russian military in 2022. However, Russia has achieved a breakthrough in hypersonic weapons that the U.S. has yet to match and has even begun to press those weapons into service. This gives Russia a decisive advantage at the opening of any major hostilities, though its weak economy means that the nation can't fully capitalize on this advantage by fielding hypersonic missiles in significant numbers. This is a trend that tracks all across the board and has repeated itself with the Su-57 fifth-generation fighter and the T-14 Armata tank. Both of these weapon platforms present deadly threats to their U.S. counterparts, but due to a lack of funding, Russia has been forced to postpone any significant purchases for years, if ever. Today, Russia faces a modernity crisis as its legacy forces are being rapidly outclassed technologically by potential rivals. The United States has its own technological problems, however, and over-reliance on technology might become a critical vulnerability for the U.S. military should its satellite or command and control networks be compromised. An addiction to technology by the United States has also led to a legacy of weapons acquisitions in the post-2000s that is, frankly, catastrophic. Funneling billions upon billions into moonshot after moonshot, the United States has failed to bring few of its new weapon systems in the last 20 years to full maturity. The F-35's capabilities are still so in question that both the U.S. Navy and Air Force purchased significant amounts of F-15s and F-18s to compensate for the potential crisis. The Zumwalt destroyer and littoral combat ships were both complete boondoggles that cost billions and left the U.S. Navy high and dry. The failure of the future Force Warrior program left the U.S. Army with few working technologies and a massive waste of taxpayer money. A focus on technological moonshots has eroded the United States' technological advantage significantly, and today the American military is in desperate need of new weapons platforms that can not just match but outcompete those being developed or already in service with the armies of China and Russia. The U.S. has sent nearly $30 billion worth of aid to Ukraine, with a significant chunk of that being military equipment. The equipment has directly supported the nation's stunning counterattack, 
with US equipment taking center stage in shaping the battle before it was even launched. Russia is now finding out why the US doesn't have free healthcare, but what equipment has the US sent, and why does it seem like Russia is helpless against it? Javelin A week after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was one name the Russian army and the rest of the world had become very familiar with – Javelin. This premier American anti-tank system first entered service in 1996 when it replaced the M47 Dragon and has proven absolutely lethal against Russian armor. This is the weapon US infantry would have used themselves in a war with Russia, and its effectiveness is nothing short of terrifying. The weapon consists of two components, the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit. The clue is the brains of the system and features four times magnification at both day and night with its thermal sight. This system allows US infantry to no longer be reliant on supporting heavy vehicles for target identification, and the clue can be used by itself even when no more missiles are available to provide infantry with a portable and very capable thermal sight. A 12 times magnification narrow field of view option allows gunners to effectively zoom in on a target and properly identify it. When the gunner is ready to fire, he switches to a seeker FOV mode at 9 times magnification. This is effectively now being fed into the missile guidance unit. With target selected, the gunner squeezes a second button and the missile is on its way to deliver 19 pounds of supersonic tandem charge high explosive American Freedom to its target. In order to defeat modern reactive armor, the Javelin missile features two warheads that detonate in rapid succession. The first is a smaller charge, which is meant to blow away explosive reactive armor panels being fired up at the missile in an attempt to disrupt it. The second shaped charge creates a narrow stream of molten metal that penetrates through tank armor to deliver an extremely emotional event to the crew inside. When targeting armored vehicles, the Javelin switches to top attack mode, in which the missile fires straight up into the air and then comes down directly on the tank's thinner top armor. You've probably seen pictures of Russian tanks with what were termed cope cages. These metal cages were being welded onto Russian tanks at the start of the invasion to protect from anti-tank missiles, and in some cases could actually be effective. However, against modern anti-tank weapons, the cages were simply wasted labor, and as St. Javelin took a horrible toll on Russian tanks, the Russian Ministry of Defense quickly sought out a new solution. Nowadays, you're probably not seeing many of these cages on Russian tanks because A, most Russian tanks are now Ukrainian tanks, and B, they didn't work. So why are Javelins so effective against Russian armor? The truth is that modern anti-tank missiles of the quality being supplied to Ukraine are frankly terrifyingly effective. Even Western tanks would be hard put to defend themselves against them, which is why the US is gradually adding the trophy protection system to its own tanks. This anti-anti-tank missile system fires explosive charges at incoming missiles that are more effective at disrupting the weapon than explosive reactive armor panels. However, the real reason why Javelins are pounding Russian armor into scrap metal is that Russia has very poor military doctrine and uses its tanks improperly. Tanks are not meant to operate on their own, but are rather meant to be directly supported by infantry. Supporting infantry forces are responsible for keeping enemy hunter-killer teams at bay. Yet, the Russian military has routinely shown that it does not operate armor and infantry together well at all. Often, Russian armor is simply left to fend for itself with predictable results. Kamikaze Drones Odds are you've now become familiar with the names Phoenix, Ghost, or Switchblade. Russian infantry is not only aware of the names but actively fears them. The Phoenix Ghost drone is a loitering munition developed under the US military's big safari weapons program. This acquisitions program is meant to rapidly deliver new weapons to meet unexpected or evolving threats, allowing the US military to quickly counter enemy capabilities using pre-existing technology rather than going through a whole development and testing cycle of new tech. To date, the US has sent around 700 of these weapons to Ukraine, with a significant impact on the battlefield. The loitering munitions can hover over an area for six hours and conduct surveillance at both night and day thanks to its infrared sensors. Once a target has been detected, the drone kamikazes down onto its head with an explosive finale. The drone is great for taking out entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles such as trucks. The Switchblade is the name most people are familiar with, and has sort of stolen the Phoenix Ghost's thunder. The weapon was conceived by the US Air Force Special Operations Command as a way of rapidly giving infantry a way to provide their own air support in Afghanistan. Traditional air support may not always be available or take time to respond, plus it can cause serious collateral damage. The Switchblade 300, however, can be carried by individual soldiers and used for both reconnaissance and attack, dropping down from above directly on an enemy's head. 
When the weapon was first sent to Afghanistan, it was on a test case basis and in limited numbers. In 2012, US soldiers received 75 switchblades to try them out in real-world conditions. The result of that test remains classified, but very shortly afterwards the US Army made a request that the weapon be immediately made available in far greater numbers. Insurgents soon feared it and US soldiers loved it. Soon after its debut in Afghanistan, the switchblade was tested from the open bay of an Osprey transport, successfully tracking and impacting its target. This paved the way for a new development between switchblade manufacturer Aerovironment and Kratos Defense and Security Solutions for a high-speed, long-range, unmanned combat air vehicle that could act as a mothership to a host of switchblade drones. The UCV would be designed to rapidly deploy an overwhelming number of switchblades in order to overcome enemy defenses. The US has provided over a thousand of both the anti-personnel and anti-armor version of the switchblade drone, which Ukraine has used to devastating effectiveness. In response to the overwhelming success of the switchblade, Russia has announced development of its own loitering munition, the LAOP-500, which it boasts twice as powerful as the switchblade. Given the fact that Russia is bringing T-62s out of museums to fight in Ukraine, take that boast with a grain of salt. So why can't Russia stop these American drones? The easiest answer is that Russia simply wasn't prepared for modern warfare. Despite its many pre-invasion boasts of being able to take on even the military forces of the US, Russia has proven it simply has no idea how to fight a modern war. It has failed to conduct large-scale combined arms operations and displayed time and again a complete disregard for electronic and signal security. The devastation delivered by Western-provided smart munitions proves that it fundamentally was unprepared for the consequences of a smart battlefield. The hard answer, however, is that nobody is really prepared for the loitering munition threat posed by modern drones. There is simply no way of providing adequate protection to infantry forces from loitering munitions, though the US has been working on the problem for a few years now. Electronic warfare capabilities meant to disrupt drone signals or even shoot them down with electromagnetic pulse weapons are now being seen as integral to the very structure of the traditional American infantry platoon. So, the next time big, tough US infantrymen go to war, expect to see Geek Squad fighting right alongside them, because without electronic warfare support, infantry is too vulnerable in future conflicts. Stinger At the start of the war, Russian air forces operated in large numbers across the country. By now, Russian rotary aviation is conspicuously absent from the front lines. The reason is the US-made FIM-92 Stinger and similar platforms provided by other Western countries. Russian aviation is having traumatic flashbacks to the Afghanistan war, when its helicopters were mauled by US-supplied Stingers. Today the weapon system has been updated, but remains relatively the same as it was when liberating communist aviators from their earthly troubles in 1985. The Stinger is a shoulder-fired manned portable air defense weapon or man pad that can engage targets up to 3,800 meters away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft such as helicopters. Its smart seeker head can differentiate between the exhaust plume of an enemy aircraft and its engines, helping it home in for a successful kill. To fire the weapon, a battery coolant unit or BCU is inserted into the grip stock. This delivers a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which cryogenically cools the seeker to operating temperature. This causes the seeker to be very sensitive to heat sources, thus allowing it to lock on to enemy vehicles with great precision. Once fired, a small ejection motor pops the missile clear of the operator and to a safe range, where the main rocket motor is activated, sending the missile on its way. The warhead is relatively small, only about 2.26 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminum powder. However, the weapon is designed to directly impact the vehicle's engines, which can be easily damaged or destroyed even with a small amount of explosives. So why is the Stinger once more violently reuniting Russian aircraft with the ground? Once more it comes down to doctrine. Russian forces are doing a poor job of integrating air power with ground forces, leaving low-flying Russian aircraft at great threat from man-portable weapons. However, the real culprit is Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its ground attack aircraft lack targeting pods meaning they have to come in low for any attack to have a large degree of precision. This puts them directly under the threat of the Stinger. Hi Mars We couldn't possibly do an episode on US weapons Russia's having a very bad day with and not mention the vaunted HIMARS system. This thing is not very impressive on paper. The high-mobility artillery rocket system is, at first glance, underpowered rocket artillery. Unlike its more capable cousin, the M270 MLRS, the HIMARS system has half the number of munitions available to it, six GMLRS rockets. It's basically just a truck with a single pot of missiles on its back, so why in the world has this weapon single-handedly changed the face of the Ukrainian war? 
In the early 1990s, the US Army was retooling itself from fighting World War III against the Soviet Union and its allies to the expected Bush Wars of the future, which would feature low-intensity conflict. This meant the Army needed to slim down and start providing weapons that were mobile and flexible, something traditional rocket artillery is not. HIMARS was developed to meet the need of a light footprint force such as US paratroopers or a small contingent of overseas troops fighting a conflict requiring precision rather than overwhelming firepower. Mounted on a truck, the system has far greater mobility and speed than any of its tracked cousins. And this was a huge draw for a future low-intensity conflict. However, it was exactly this capability that would make HIMARS so valuable to Ukrainian forces. Faced with overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform that could rapidly deliver a fire mission and then flee before enemy counter-battery fire or air support could respond. Traditional tube artillery would be based around areas in Ukraine, could enact some form of air defense which protected them, but made them very inflexible weapons. HIMARS, however, could quickly drive to a launch site, pop off its missiles, and drive away in minutes, allowing the weapon system to be anywhere it needed to be with short notice. But it's HIMARS' precision and range that makes it truly deadly. Each of the six GLMRS rockets have a range of 57 miles and are armed with precision warheads. This gives Ukraine the ability to punch behind enemy lines at targets out of range of traditional tube artillery, which has a range of around a dozen or so miles. But it's the precision that really matters, because each rocket can be programmed to hit a specific target or to double up and defeat enemy fortifications, striking exactly at their weakest point. The error radius of HIMARS is classified but believed to be no more than a few meters at most, and is likely far, far less than that given the history of US smart weapons. With just a dozen of these weapons at the start of summer, Ukraine began to batter Russian command posts and logistics nodes, leading to an immediate effect on the battlefield as Russian forces were slowed to a crawl, as they contended with the chaos being wreaked behind their lines. Russia quickly moved to neutralize the weapon, dedicating large amounts of air power and special operations forces to locating and destroying these mobile rocket launchers. Within weeks of the deployment of HIMARS to Ukraine, Russia claimed it had destroyed all of them, yet the US confirmed that not a single HIMARS had been lost in combat. Was Russia lying? Normally the answer to that question would be yes, but in this case they actually might have been telling the truth, at least from their own point of view, because the weapon is mounted on a generic heavy-duty truck frame. Ukraine created multiple HIMARS decoys using trucks painted green. Other decoys were mere mock-ups made of wood, and it's confirmed that Russia has destroyed at least 10 of these decoys with caliber cruise missiles. Russia took the bait and expended significant effort and resources better used elsewhere to find and destroy these fake HIMARS, leaving the real HIMARS safe from attack. The US quickly agreed to supply Ukraine with more HIMARS, and the nation now has just under two dozen of these platforms with plans for more to be delivered. As of September 8th, Ukraine has struck 400 Russian targets with the weapons, making it the hardest working weapon in the Ukraine war, and one that has forced Russia to radically rethink how it deploys its forces. No longer safe behind the front lines, Russian command and control nodes and logistics hubs have been forced out of HIMARS range, which means the rate of the offensive has slowed to a crawl as units have to wait even longer for resupply. Russia has threatened to retaliate against the United States for further deliveries of the weapon system, but given that it can't handle 16 of these and the US Army is equipped with over 400, it seems Russia's mouth is cashing checks its military can't cash. Russia's bluff has been called, and now its military might must clash with NATO forces in Eastern Europe. As both sides prepare for battle, there are high stakes in the skies over Eastern Europe as a squadron of F-22s and Su-57s rush to meet each other in a battle the world has been dreading for decades. But who would win between these two state-of-the-art aircraft? The F-22 was developed by Lockheed Martin to be the air dominance fighter of the future and first took flight as a prototype on September 7, 1997. Its origins, however, lie in the Cold War, with the US looking ahead to a future conflict with the Soviet Union. That's why when the plane was officially procured in 1999, it faced a very uncertain future. It was the world's most cutting-edge fighter, and an extremely expensive one at that. The age of great power conflict was thought to be over with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the F-22 was a plane without a mission. Inevitably, Congress approved the termination of future production of F-22s and the specialized tools and equipment used to create the most advanced fighter in the world were put into storage in case of emergency. The Su-57 Felon is a twin-engine stealth multi-role fighter aircraft developed by Sukhoi for the Russian military. Its origins are much more recent, with development beginning in 1999 as Russia began its process of trying to impose itself as a global power once more. 
Over the years, though, the Su-57 ran into serious budgeting problems. Initially, Russia, like the US, planned to buy hundreds of the aircraft, but eventually only 16 were actually built. The death blow to the Su-57 program was the ever-worsening Russian economy, as well as the pull-out of India's partnership in the program when it was determined that the Su-57's capabilities were not as advertised or worth the investment. Both aircraft depend on stealth for survivability and lethality, but which is better? The Su-57 features specialized design to reduce its radar cross-section, or RCS. This is achieved via techniques such as carefully aligning the edges of the wing and control surfaces so as to minimize the number of directions that radar waves can bounce back. Weapons are carried internally and its engines are coated with radar-absorbent materials, or RAM. Its canopy features a 70 to 90 nanometer thick metal oxide layer to both absorb radar waves and protect the pilot from UV and thermal radiation. From the front, the Su-57 is more stealthy than a fourth-generation fighter. However, from the side, the aircraft is significantly less stealthy and very vulnerable to detection and targeting. This represents a lack of expertise in stealth by Russian engineers, but is also a design choice, as the Su-57 is meant to operate within the protection of Russian air defenses. Outmatched technologically by the US, Russia has long operated its military under a fortress doctrine that makes maximum use of large numbers of long-range air defenses and ground artillery to fend off advanced US threats. Simply put, a squadron of Su-57s would not be operating far from friendly forces. Unlike US F-22s, which are expected to be the very tip of the spear, driving deep into enemy territory. The F-22 was designed with stealth as a top priority, and so much attention was paid to the plane's stealth characteristics that even the design of the pilot's helmet was taken into consideration. Like the Su-57, stealth is built straight into the design of the plane with a delta wing configuration curved vanes that prevent line of sight to the engine faces and turbines, and special alignment of control surfaces. The plane features a signature assessment system that warns a maintenance crew when the plane's radar signature is degraded and requires repair. And while it is coated in RAM, it's less reliant on it than the B-2. The B-2 is so delicate that it requires a special air-conditioned hangar, like the true prom queen of the US Air Force that she is. But the F-22 was designed to be rugged and tough, and can undergo repairs directly on a flight line. But hiding from the radar is only part of its stealthy design. Its flat thrust vectoring nozzles don't just look super cool from behind, but are specifically engineered to reduce the thermal signature of the big engines and thus reduce the range at which the plane is targetable by heat-seeking missiles. The plane is also designed around tight control of electronic emissions to prevent targeting or detection via electronic noise generated by its powerful radar and radio. It's also specially designed to be quieter than other aircraft and to be difficult to detect with the naked eye at a distance. The result is an aircraft with an RCS which is classified. But Lockheed Martin has confirmed that from some angles the aircraft has an RCS of a steel marble .0001 squared meters. The Su-57, on the other hand, is believed to have an RCS of 0.1 to 1 square meter. There's no question that when it comes to stealth, the F-22 is the top dog, but at a price. In order to maintain its stealth features at an optimal level, the plane has a mission-capable rate of 62 to 70 percent, meaning that if the Su-57 were ever fielded in large numbers, their relative lack of sophisticated stealth technology would make them available for operations more often. Though if Ukraine is anything to go by, maintenance is a very weak point of the Russian military, and both aircraft might struggle to stay in the air throughout a lengthy conflict. In a dogfight, power and maneuverability are what matters, and here the two aircraft show some striking differences. The F-22 features thrust vectoring engines that can pivot up and down, giving it the most maneuverability of any US aircraft. However, the F-22 falls very short of the Su-57, which is one of the most maneuverable planes ever made. Its twin engines feature independent thrust vectoring in all directions, meaning each engine nozzle can point in any direction independent of the other nozzle. That's why the Su-57 impressed spectators at air shows all over the world. And in a dogfight scenario, the F-22 pilot would be reaching for the ejection handle far more frequently than the Russian counterpart. When it comes to power, both planes are also unmatched. The F-22 is equipped with two Pratt & Whitney F-119 afterburning turbofan engines, with each delivering 35,000 pounds of thrust. This gives the F-22 a total of 70,000 pounds of thrust and the ability to supercruise at a classified speed of at least Mach 1.82. Supercruise is an important capability for modern fighters, and one that very few can attain. It's defined as the ability for an aircraft to cruise at speeds of one and a half times or greater the speed of sound without the use of afterburners for extended periods of time. 
using afterburners burns through an aircraft's fuel tank very quickly, and thus most planes cannot maintain supersonic flight for very long. With great speed, though, comes great fuel consumption, and the F-22 is limited by its size and fuel use to a range of 1,864 miles with external fuel tanks. Its combat radius is believed to be just over 500 miles, with a surface ceiling of 6,500 feet. The Su-57 is equipped with two NPO Lyulka Saturn Izdalai 117 turbofan engines, a significant technological step forward for the Russians. Each engine can produce just shy of 20,000 pounds of dry thrust, giving the aircraft the ability to supercruise at just over Mach 1.6. However, the Su-57's larger body allows it to store more fuel, increasing its range to 2,200 miles with a combat radius of 930 miles and a ceiling of 66,000 feet. The Su-57 seems to have the advantage here, even though its inferior aerodynamics and larger size means it's slower than the nimbler F-22. But the Russian Air Force has been having serious problems with developing the Su-57's engines, making them unreliable. Current Su-57s in operation are equipped with older engines, and in 2014, before walking away from a deal to help fund development of the Su-57, the Indian government expressed concerns over the engine's reliability. Russia hopes to sweep away these issues with a new engine designated Izdelai 30 and projected to be equipped on the Su-57 in the mid-2020s. However, this was before Russia was sanctioned by the world and cut off from critical technology supplies. The current fate of the planned engine upgrade is unknown. When it comes to engines, the F-22 is simply more reliable, with over 180 of the aircraft in operation for over a decade, while the Su-57 struggles with older engines in a planned upgrade that might never materialize. If Russia were to solve the engine issue, though, the Su-57 may outclass the F-22 in power, if not speed, due to the size difference. But a fighter is nothing without its weapons, so what kind of heat is each plane packing and who's really bringing the smoke? The Su-57 has two tandem main internal weapon bays that run along the entire length of the body of the aircraft, and two side weapon bays for smaller missiles or bombs. Designed as a multi-role fighter, the Su-57 can strike surface targets with ease, packing the 550-pound KAB-250 or a 1,100-pound KAB-500 precision-guided bomb in its main bay. It can also carry the KH-38M air-to-ground missile, the KH-35U anti-ship missile, and the KH-58 UShK anti-radiation missile for striking enemy radar arrays, and the KH-59 Mark II cruise missile, though all of these in very limited quantities. However, if stealth is not a concern, the plane has six external hardpoints that can fit most Russian fighter-capable bombs and missiles. The KH-47M2 Kinzhal hypersonic air-to-ground missile is also being developed especially for the Su-57 and meant to fit within the dimensions of the plane's internal weapon base. However, if going up against the F-22, the Su-57 will bring four beyond visual range air-to-air -air missiles with a range of up to 120 miles and two shorter range air-to-air -air missiles in its side weapon base. The F-22 has three internal weapon bays laid out in a different configuration from the Su-57. Its main bay is housed at the bottom of the fuselage, with two small smaller bays directly on the sides of the fuselage and aft of the engine intakes. Up against a Su-57, the F-22 can carry six beyond visual range AIM-120 AMRAMs and one AIM-9 Sidewinder in each bay. This gives the F-22 a significant three-missile advantage over the Su-57, but this is hardly a surprise. The F-22 was designed specifically to take out enemy aircraft, while the Su-57 was designed to be a general-purpose machine capable of hitting both air and ground targets. The F-22 can also strike ground targets with the replacement of its four main bay launchers with two bomb racks that can each carry one 1,000-pound or four 250-pound bombs. The plane can also carry GPS-capable weapons, such as the Joint Direct Attack Munition, but it lacks the targeting pod required to self-designate targets for laser-guided bombs. Like the Su-57, the F-22 is equipped with external hardpoints for when stealth is not a priority, and it has four hardpoints rated at 5,000 pounds each. For a good old-fashioned knife fight in the sky, the F-22 carries the M61A2 Vulcan 20mm cannon and is equipped with 480 rounds meant for half-second bursts. The pilot's heads-up display projects a radar projection of the cannon's fire path when the weapon is in use to dramatically increase accuracy. The Su-57, meanwhile, is equipped with a 9A1 4071K 30mm autocannon with 150 rounds. 
While it has less rounds to fire, the 30mm cannon will provide a significant advantage if a hit is scored, and given the Su-57's incredible maneuverability, the odds of a hit are good. In terms of firepower, the F-22 takes the cake for air-to-air -air combat, even if it would do well to stay out of the dogfight range of the Su-57. However, the Su-57 is easier to configure for ground strike missions, making it more flexible. But all that smoke means nothing if you can't even detect what you're supposed to be aiming at. So how do the two planes compare in radar and avionics? The F-22 is a champion of sensor fusion, where it gathers data from all onboard systems, filters it for relevancy, and presents it to the pilot for greatly enhanced situational awareness while lowering his workload. It can even receive data from other platforms to add to its tactical picture. It's equipped with the Sanders General Electric ANALR-94 Electronic Warfare System, Martin Marinetta ANAAR-56 Infrared and Ultraviolet Missile Launch Detector, Westinghouse Texas Instruments ANAPG-77 Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, and TRW Communication Navigation Identification Suite. It has over 30 antennas blended into the wings and fuselage to give the airplane complete all-around radar warning receiver coverage. This system can reduce its radar emissions to a confined narrow beam, down to 2 degrees in azimuth and elevation, exceeding over 250 miles in range and greatly increasing the plane's stealth by limiting excess electronic noise. In other words, if you take a shot at the Raptor, it's going to immediately know trouble is on the way. The system can even be used for a passive detection system that can search for targets and even provide lock-on for weapons at a classified range. The APG-77 radar equipped on the Raptor has a low observable active aperture, electronically scanned antenna that can track multiple targets while conducting scans in any weather condition. The Raptor can also focus its radar to overload enemy sensors in electronic attack configuration, degrading the effectiveness of enemy radar and increasing the survivability of fellow Raptors in formation. To reduce the chance of interception or degradation, the APG-77 changes frequency over a thousand times a second and has an estimated range of 125 to 150 miles for a target with the profile radar cross-section of a Su-57. Not good news for the Russian fighter. Head-on, the Raptor is likely capable of targeting a Su-57 at just over 30 miles. By narrowing its beam, however, the APG-77 can increase this range by approximately 100 miles. Its two Hughes Common Integrated Processors are each capable of processing up to 10.5 billion instructions per second, making the F-22 one of the smartest planes in the sky. In fact, its avionics are so robust that the F-22 has threat detection and identification capabilities similar to the RC-135 rivet joint. However, its radar is less powerful than dedicated signals intelligence and threat detection platforms. This capability, however, allows the F-22 to designate targets for allied aircraft, making the F-22 not just lethal on its own, but lending its lethality to fourth-generation aircraft who can fire weapons from outside the threat envelope an F-22 is currently operating inside of. In effect, the F-22 can grant friendly aircraft pseudo-stealth capabilities through its big brains, giving the enemy one hell of a headache to worry about. The Su-57 is Russia's first attempt at achieving sensor fusion. To manage its various electronic systems, the Su-57 is equipped with an information management system developed by GRPZ. The plane is equipped with an N036 AESA radar system and an L402 Himalayas electronic countermeasure system. Its radar is configured across three platforms with a traditional nose-mounted radar and two cheek-mounted radars that greatly increase angular coverage. It also allows a pilot to guide a missile to target without having to point its nose at it, a significant advantage in close quarters combat. Two N036L-1-01 L-band transceivers are mounted on each wing's leading edge flaps and used for friend or foe identification, but can also be configured for electronic warfare and used to degrade enemy radar, albeit at significantly less efficiency than the F-22. It's also equipped with a redundant radio telephone system and encrypted data exchange capabilities between itself and other aircraft. However, the largest difference between the two aircraft is the inclusion of the 101 KSV infrared search and track system on the Su-57. While the F-22 lacks any such capability, often touted as a stealth killer, ISRT systems allow an aircraft to search for and target enemy aircraft by their heat signatures. This heat comes not just from the engines but from the body of the plane thanks to friction it experiences during supersonic flight. While the F-22 lacks ISRT capabilities, it's also designated to fly cool at faster speeds than the Su-57, and with engine outlets that dramatically lower its infrared signature. Thus, the Su-57's ISRT will still have some difficulties targeting an F-22, and its effective range will be lowered considerably. Even so, this feature still gives the Su-57 an advantage in close quarters combat. So, which is the superior aircraft? 
The F-22 takes the cake by a long shot. It's without question the world's premier fighter aircraft, with the most advanced avionics of any non-classified fighter in operation today. Its radar lacks the angular coverage of the Su-57, but can detect even stealthy targets at longer ranges compared to the Su-57, and more importantly provide good lock for weapons at increased ranges as well. With an increased number of air-to-air -air missiles, the F-22 has more chances to shoot a Su-57 out of the sky as well, another significant advantage. Yet, the Su-57 has the advantage in close quarters, and an F-22 pilot would do well to ensure he keeps a healthy distance between himself and the Su-57. But ultimately, this is a minor advantage, as the F-22 is simply built to not just be lethal on its own, but operate within a larger network of weapons and friendly platforms. This is a capability the Russians lack, and the US military remains the most networked armed force in the world. This means that it's not just the F-22 that's lethal to a Su-57, but a whole host of support platforms, all using the F-22's targeting and tracking data to guide their own weapons to target. Not only can the F-22 win a fight on its own, but it can invite all its other buddies to that fight as well, leaving the Su-57 pilot frightfully alone. However, ultimately, the F-22 is superior for one single reason. It's an operational aircraft, and the Su-57 is not. If war were to break out between the two nations, it's highly unlikely an F-22 would ever meet a Su-57 in battle, given that there are only six non-testing models in operation, while the Russian Air Force would have to contend with over 180 Raptors. Snow falls in the frigid Siberian Arctic, where an American force shelters in a small village along the Trans-Siberian Railway. Suddenly, an explosion decimates the side of a building. From across the tracks, a Bolshevik force comes flooding out of the forest. The Russians fire their rifles. With each bullet, a stream of smoke exits their muzzles as it drifts in the freezing air. The Americans return fire. They're about to be overrun by angry Russian soldiers. No one wants to die in this frozen wasteland, so a retreat is ordered. The platoon of Americans covers one another as they run down the railway toward another regiment stationed to the north. The craziest thing is that the US soldiers aren't entirely sure why they invaded Russia in the first place, and now they're paying dearly for it. About a year before the United States sent troops to Russia, Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky incited the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. The US had just deployed troops in Europe to help the Allies defeat the Germans in World War I. When the revolution happened, the new communist regime pulled Russia out of the conflict and agreed to a tentative truce with Germany. The Allies continued to fight on, and eventually the tide of the war turned. By the following year, the Bolsheviks controlled a large part of Western Russia, but forces identifying themselves as the White Russians fought to take back their country from the Communists. This group was made up of a motley crew of mostly loyalists and reactionaries, with some Democrats sprinkled in, all of which were against Russia becoming a Communist state. At this point, American troops had been engaged in battles across Europe, and the German army was slowly falling to the Allied forces. On November 11, 1918, World War I came to an end, but as American soldiers prepared to return home from the brutality of war, a select group was ordered to remain behind. These soldiers were sent on a mission in northern Russia to help the White Russians maintain control of an important railway that allowed supplies to be transported to areas where the White and Red armies were engaged in battle. The United States maintained that they were staying out of the internal affairs of Russia, but secretly President Woodrow Wilson and other Allied leaders knew that if the Bolsheviks were victorious and defeated the White Russian forces, the country would become a full-fledged communist state that would pose a threat to capitalism and democracy around the world. Two American forces were ordered to go over the Russian border and help maintain supply lines for the war against the Red Army. The wording used by Wilson for these missions was vague and had no clear goal. This was likely because if the United States took a side in the conflict playing out in Russia, they could be thrown into another war. The invasion needed to remain as covert as possible, and having no clear orders or objectives, the American soldiers within the borders of Russia were given plausible deniability. Unfortunately, having troops stationed within a country undergoing civil war can only lead to rising tensions and casualties. The US troops, who were now technically an invasion force in Russia, found themselves in a very dangerous situation. The Bolsheviks were becoming more and more powerful. It would only be a matter of time before the American forces and the Red Army met. When this happened, the United States would have to take a stand or at least make some very difficult decisions. The invasion of Russia technically began in July 1918. The war in Europe could still have gone either way, but the Allies seemed to be losing. Since Germany no longer needed to worry about protecting their eastern front due to their newly formed peace with the Bolshevik government, German forces were able to focus on pushing west. They advanced further and further into France, leaving a wake of destruction in their path. 
The only way the German advance could be stopped was if the Allies somehow reopened the Eastern Front. British and French expeditionary forces were already in northern Russia where they were working to open up this new front. At that same time, they hoped to supply the white Russian forces with resources that would allow them to defeat the Bolsheviks and rejoin the war. The other Allied leaders convinced Woodrow Wilson to send 13,000 troops across the Russian border to help with this effort. President Wilson agreed, and when American troops crossed into Russia, the invasion had officially began. Since the United States wanted to maintain some form of deniability that what they were doing was not actually an invasion, Woodrow Wilson wrote a vaguely worded memo. The American expeditionary forces being sent to Russia had three main objectives. The first, guarding large caches of Allied weapons and supplies that were housed in Archangel and Vladivostok. These supplies were sent to the Russian cities before the country left the war, and therefore Allied command wanted to make sure they did not fall into the hands of the Red Army. The second objective was to support the 70,000 soldiers in the Czechoslovak Legion who were still a part of Allied forces in World War I. The Czech Legion was fighting the Red Army in Siberia, and since they were part of the Allies, the United States soldiers were to support them in any way they could. The final objective that Woodrow Wilson put into his memo was that the US soldiers were to avoid interfering with internal Russian affairs. However, they were also supposed to aid the Russians in self-governing or self-defense. Basically, Wilson was saying that the American soldiers should be helping the white Russians defeat the Bolsheviks by any means necessary, but they were not to let the communists find out that that was what they were doing. The reason that Wilson couldn't just outright say the US forces entered Russia to try to defeat the Bolsheviks was that it would have looked like they were declaring a war against a previous ally, but the lack of clarity around what the troops were actually doing in Russia ended up causing all sorts of confusion. This resulted in a very different mission evolving and the loss of hundreds of American lives. The US soldiers who were deployed to Russia were a part of the 339th Regiment. This group of soldiers was mostly from Michigan, which military strategists decided would make them ideal for the extreme cold that they would face in northern Russia. Before the invasion force left for their mission, they were trained in England by Antarctic explorer Ernest Shackleton to give them additional skills to survive in the brutal environment they were about to enter. After their training, the 339th packed their bags, boarded a plane, and flew to the Archangel, which sat just below the Arctic Circle. The men nicknamed their regiment the Polar Bear Expedition, which wouldn't be too far from the truth. As they approached the Archangel, temperature plummeted and the wind picked up. The soldiers looked out of the plane windows at the frozen landscape below. This mission was going to be brutal, and they weren't even entirely sure why they were there. Once the planes landed, the US soldiers were debriefed by the British commanders stationed at Archangel. Although their orders were only to defend the cache of Allied supplies in the city, this turned out to be a very small part of what they would actually end up doing. The British told the Americans to suit up as they were about to leave Archangel and head southeast toward Kalas. This was not what they had been instructed to do, but at that same time, the vagueness of their orders also meant they could pretty much do anything they wanted. The 339th deployed with the British soldiers to Kalas. Their goal was to secure a railroad crossing that they could then use to connect supply lines to the Czechoslovak Legion fighting the Red Army to the east. British officer Lt. Gen. Frederick Poole ordered the Polar Bear Expedition Force to sweep south along a critical railroad track and remove any Bolshevik forces that stood in their way. The Polar Bears moved down the railroad toward Kalas. They encountered small bands of Bolshevik soldiers who they easily dispatched. The weather conditions were brutal, but the men had all been well trained. They pushed the Bolsheviks away from the railway and secured long stretches of it to aid in the movement of troops and supplies to other forces fighting the Red Army in the Siberian region. Unfortunately, the polar bears would never make it all the way to Kotlas. On November 11, 1918, the same day that World War I ended in Europe, the American soldiers found themselves in a bloody battle against Bolshevik forces. The polar bear expedition along with Canadian and Scottish troops were making their way south when they encountered a large Red Army force. Bullets pelted the snow all around them as the polar bears dove for cover. The Red Army had captured a town along the railway and still had a large number of men stationed there. Grenades blew craters around the tracks. The Allied forces returned fire but were unable to break the Bolshevik line. They had to retreat back to the dense forest and regroup. When they reached safety, the soldiers heard the news that Armistice Day had been celebrated in France. They couldn't believe that while they were being shot at and killed by Russian soldiers, the boys in Europe were being sent home. This was demoralizing and made no sense to the soldiers still stationed in Siberia. If the war was over, why were they still fighting? The soldiers started to complain to their superiors and question what their actual orders in Russia were. Many Allied soldiers once believed that the Bolsheviks were secretly on the side of the Germans, which made fighting them a worthwhile cause. But now that Germany had been defeated, the American soldiers were freezing their butts off for no apparent reason. At this time, Major William Graves commanded another expeditionary force that invaded Russia from Vladivostok. 
This regiment had been deployed to protect the Allied supplies housed in the city. But like the polar bear expedition in Archangel, these soldiers also had vague orders and would end up pushing further into Siberia than originally planned. Graves wrote later that at the time of the deployment he was given no information as to the military, political, social, economic, or financial situation in Russia. This shows just how little the American soldiers who found themselves in the middle of a civil war in Russia actually had to go on. As 1918 turned into 1919, the Czechoslovak Legion controlled much of Siberia, including the Trans-Siberian Railway. In order to fulfill the ambiguous orders he was given, Graves ordered troops to be deployed along the railway and at the coal mines, which powered the whole thing. This meant that American forces would be moving further and further into Russia. Although no one wanted to say it, America had now invaded Russia on two fronts. The Trans-Siberian Railway was a vital lifeline for both the Czechs and the White Russians that were fighting against the Bolsheviks. Without the railway, supplies could not reach the forces spread throughout the country. But as the Americans worked to secure and maintain control of the railway, the White Russians did something drastic. In November 1918, a White Russian admiral named Alexander Kolchak overthrew a Czech-supported government in Siberia. This caused panic amongst the Czechoslovak Legion. Rather than continuing their fighting against the Red Army in northern Russia, they focused their attention on returning home. This put Graves in a precarious position. It was now his sole responsibility to maintain control of the Trans-Siberian Railway and secretly move supplies to the polar bears and other forces who were trying to capture Kolchak. In January of 1919, the Bolsheviks launched attacks along the Trans-Siberian Railway and deeper into Siberia, where American forces were positioned. It all started one freezing day 500 miles north of Moscow. Lieutenant Harry Meade and his platoon of 47 polar bears were held up in a small Russian village. They lit fires within the snow-covered homes as the temperature dipped to 45 degrees below zero. They had received word that the Red Army might be advancing on their position, but wouldn't reach them for several more days, at which point they would be long gone, or so they believed. Lookouts had been posted and the soldiers took shifts digging trenches into the frozen permafrost that surrounded the small village just in case they needed to defend themselves. The sun rose on January 19, 1919, causing a pink hue across the freshly fallen snow that made it look like cotton candy. One of the lookouts rubbed his eyes and stretched. He'd been up all night keeping an eye out for the enemy. It had been quiet, and his shift was about to end when he saw something move in the trees out of the corner of his eye. The sun was still low, and the trees from the forest cast long shadows along the railway. The darkness from the densely packed pine trees kept anything hidden within it. The lookout grabbed his binoculars and stared at the forest. He could have sworn something moved just on the edge of the trees. Perhaps it was a deer or a lone wolf. He put the binoculars down and rubbed his eyes, chalking whatever he thought he saw up to exhaustion. Suddenly, dozens of rifles fired simultaneously from the tree line. Rockets flashed as they ejected from their launchers and slammed into the buildings of the villages. The men started screaming as wood and rocks flew everywhere. Meade awoke his troops and ordered them to return fire. A wall of screaming Bolshevik soldiers ran out from the cover of the forest. The sunlight glinted off their bayonets attached to the rifles. The Americans continued firing. But there were just too many of them. Meade ordered his men to fall back and seek shelter. The Red Army soldiers shot at the retreating polar bears, killing several men in the ambush before they could scramble behind cover. Meade and his men took shelter in the buildings on the far side of the village just as shells began to fall from the sky. The Bolsheviks had set up mortars on the outskirts of the town and were unleashing a barrage of explosives that decimated the structures the Americans had taken shelter in. When the iron rain stopped falling, Meade peered out of the window and saw a terrifying sight. Bolshevik soldiers had moved to the flanks and were now closing in on three sides. They wore white uniforms and jackets that allowed them to blend in with the snowy landscape. The enemy looked more like ghosts than men. Meade ordered the machine guns to be mounted in the windows to keep the Bolsheviks at bay, but every time the polar bears would slow the Bolshevik advance on one side, the other two would move closer. It was a hopeless situation. The waves of Bolshevik soldiers never seemed to end. It was only a matter of time before Meade and his men's position was overrun and the Red Army slaughtered them all. Meade ordered a full retreat. The American soldiers exited the houses they were taking shelter in and headed for the edge of town. Every time they stepped out from behind cover, someone else was gunned down. The Bolsheviks were unrelenting and ruthless. If a polar bear fell, their body had to be left behind. Twenty-five Americans died in the battle. Their bodies lie where they fell so the rest of the expeditionary force could make it out of the village alive and retreat further up the railway. When Meade and his men met up with another American platoon, they had lost over half of their force and had 15 injured soldiers who desperately needed medical attention. This was the beginning of the Bolsheviks' offensive into northern Russia in January of 1919. The Red Army had the polar bear expedition outnumbered 8 to 1. They pushed the Americans further and further north. 
seemed that if something wasn't done to immediately bring the men home, they would either be driven all the way to the Arctic or killed by the Bolsheviks. Politicians and military leaders worked tirelessly to try and get the US soldiers home, but there were still those in government who believed the polar bears needed to be kept in Russia to keep the country from falling to the Bolsheviks. The polar bear expedition was pushed all the way back to Archangel, where they'd held out until May when the ice began to thaw and the White Sea became passable. As the men loaded up everything of importance onto the ships leaving the city to head back to Europe, the Bolsheviks began to seize Archangel. Battles broke out on the outskirts of the city, but eventually the Red Army gained the upper hand and the Bolsheviks pushed into Archangel. Fights broke out in the streets as polar bears desperately tried to hold the Bolsheviks at bay for as long as possible. The ships were finally loaded, and the Allied forces still in Russia managed to escape. On June 15, 1919, the last of the polar bear expedition left Archangel and headed back home. In all, around 235 Americans died on the Western Front of the invasion of Russia, and not a single man could explain exactly why they were there in the first place. As the polar bears were headed home, the American soldiers who had been launched from Vladivostok continued to fight in Siberia. Even though the polar bear expedition had been a disaster, Woodrow Wilson still wanted American troops in Russia to maintain control of the Trans-Siberian Railway and to keep the white forces resupplied. However, there was a new threat looming on the horizon. Japan had been a former ally during World War I but had quickly become aggressive as the emperor dreamed of expanding his country's borders and influence. 72,000 Japanese soldiers were launched across the sea and landed in Siberia. They advanced toward Major William Graves and the American forces that held the railway. Even though they had once been allies, the Japanese soldiers no longer were considered friendlies. Their expansion into Asia and Siberia posed a serious threat to the white Russians and the American men who were still there. As all this was happening, Graves' worst nightmare came true. The very army they were trying to help turned on them. The white Russians wanted the Americans to either formally fight with them or get out. They were tired of American forces being in their country without choosing a side. The Japanese troops shared the same sentiment but wanted the Americans out of the region for their own reasons. Without the Americans there, the Japanese would be able to advance further into Siberia and claim the Trans-Siberian Railway for themselves. White Russian forces began to work with Japanese forces as they swept through Siberia, causing unprecedented amounts of carnage and chaos. Innocent people were executed and tortured. Cossack generals Grigory Semenov and Ivan Kalnikov roamed the frozen regions of the country, killing anyone they thought was sympathetic to the Bolshevik cause and taking whatever they wanted with the support of Japanese troops. Eventually, these forces turned their attention toward the Americans. It seemed that fighting would break out between the US soldiers still stationed along the Trans-Siberian Railway and the white Russians at any moment. If this happened, the United States would have no choice but to openly declare war and either send more troops to Russia or risk the lives of the Americans stuck in Siberia. As tensions rose, the Bolsheviks became stronger and stronger. They secured more cities and transportation routes while growing in numbers. The white Russians were losing badly on all fronts. Admiral Alexander Kolchak pleaded with the Czech Legion for help, but he'd already burnt that bridge when the white Russians invaded Czechoslovakian territory and committed countless crimes against the people in the region. Rather than helping Kolchak, the Czechoslovakians turned him over to the Red Army in return for safe passage home. In January of 1920, Woodrow Wilson and his advisors decided the secret war in Russia had failed. They ordered all US troops out of the country as the Trans-Siberian Railway was all but lost to the Bolsheviks. By April 1, 1920, the last of the American invasion forces was withdrawn from Russian borders. 189 men were lost in Siberia. Each one had only a very vague idea of what they were doing there in the first place. Woodrow Wilson's decision to invade and keep troops in Russia in order to influence its internal affairs foreshadowed future endeavors by the United States to do similar things in other countries. The US had no business being in Russia after World War I, just as it had no business being in other countries later in the century. Somewhere in the east of Ukraine, a drab green military truck roars to life and pulls out of its temporary shelter inside some trees. On its back is a single pod of six 227mm rockets. Despite having less power than a traditional multiple rocket launch system, this single truck is the deadliest weapon in the Ukrainian war. The driver clears the trees and the crew gets to work. As the rocket pod lifts up off the bed of the truck on its own and swings to the left, targeting data provided by the US satellites and secret intelligence sources is fed into the firing computer, which in turn programs each rocket with its own impact point. Once ready, a simple press of a button sends six of the big rockets screaming into the sky. As soon as the last rocket clears the launcher, the truck is already on the move. This single piece of rocket artillery provided by the United States is Ukraine's most important weapon and is the single most hunted piece of hardware of the entire war. 
Russian troops are on the hunt for each and every one of these 16 trucks currently in the nation, and their commanders have been ordered to expend any amount of life required to destroy them. Thus, the trucks are constantly on the move, never staying still in one place for long and always under heavy cover when idle. They pop out of their tree cover or camo netting to fire a salvo, and then immediately retreat to avoid counter-battery fire or an air attack. It's a dangerous game of cat and mouse, but to date, the Ukrainians have been winning to devastating effect. The truck is long gone by the time its rockets find their target, several dozen miles behind enemy lines well out of reach of any other artillery. Russian Colonel Andrei Vasilyev, commander of an elite paratrooper regiment, is taking a meeting with his senior officers. To date, Russia has lost a whopping 55 colonels in its half-a-year effort in Ukraine, a casualty figure so staggering, the only parallel is from the Second World War. Thus, Colonel Vasilyev has taken great pains to keep his exact location a secret. But US intelligence has found him and transmitted the GPS coordinates of his secret command post to the Ukrainians. One rocket impacts the command post with a precision of half a meter, instantly incinerating the good colonel and his officers. For him, the war is over. But for those Russians still living, the deadly reign of rockets continues. Supplies and ammunition for artillery pieces is destroyed, as dozens of other soldiers are killed or wounded in the precision strikes. Colonel Andrei Vasilyev is now the 56th Russian colonel to die in Ukraine, but he won't be the last. And a large part of Ukraine's stunning success in recent months is all down to one single gift from the United States, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, otherwise known as HIMARS. The impact of HIMARS in Ukraine cannot be understated. While the Javelin has become the patron saint and protector of Ukraine, this American weapon is far deadlier to the Russians than even the Javelin, and that's thanks to its range and precision. With just 12 of these weapon systems in the country, Ukraine has ground the Russian offensive to nearly a complete halt. But how in the world could so few weapons be given Russia so much trouble, and why can't Russia overcome such tiny numbers of US weapons? The HIMARS was developed in the late 1990s for use by the US Army. The system is not much different than any other rocket artillery, save for the fact that instead of the two rocket pods used by the Army's M270 MLRS, HIMARS has only one pod for greatly increased mobility. This allows the system to very quickly move into firing position and then escape before enemy counterbattery fire or a ground attack mission arrives on scene. And it's why Russia is having such a great difficulty neutralizing the dozen units provided to Ukraine. HIMARS can be loaded with a standard six rocket pod or can carry a single tactical ballistic missile with a quick conversion. Its rockets have a range of between 1.2 and 190 miles, or up to 190 miles when using the Army's ATACM surface-to-surface missile. It can even be equipped with a SLAMRAM missile, surface-launched variants of the AMRAM anti-aircraft missile. But its versatility doesn't end there, because unlike any other rocket artillery in the world, HIMARS can even engage targets while loaded up on a transport ship. In October 2017, the US Marine Corps fired a single rocket while at sea from the deck of an amphibious transport dock ship, successfully hitting a shore target with precision. This now makes HIMARS deadly not just on the land, but even when it's still loaded on a ship and waiting to be delivered. The weapon system saw wide use in the Iraq-Afghanistan conflicts, and in a prelude of what was to come if Russia had been paying attention, HIMARS's high precision allowed it to target Taliban commanders' hideouts in October of 2010 forcing them to flee the country temporarily. With its impressive range and precision, HIMARS has fired over 400 rockets at Islamic State militants since November of 2015, and the year after it fired rockets into Syria in support of Syrian rebels there. In January 2016, manufacturer Lockheed Martin announced that HIMARS had reached 1 million operational hours with US forces, achieving an incredible 99% operational readiness rate. Compare that with strike fighter aircraft who have been loitering around 70% readiness rate for years, and you can see why HIMARS and its precision fire has become an incredibly important tool for the US Army. And now it's the most important tool in the Ukrainian Army. Russia must have been sleeping through the last decade, because upon making an appearance in Ukraine, HIMARS' impact was immediate, pun intended. The first four units arrived on the 23rd of June, and just two days later, they were in use against Russian forces killing over 40 Russian soldiers on a precision strike at a military base in Izium. For the first time since the war began, Russian rear areas were under threat from Ukrainian weapons, and the fear this realization struck was palpable, especially as successful fire mission after successful fire mission took place. Within days of its opening salvo, the Russian military said that the US's ML270 MLRS and M142 HIMARS were the most dangerous weapons in Ukraine and that it was vital for Russian forces to destroy them at any cost. 
Yet, not all Russian officers were convinced, and it was believed that their air defense units such as the S-300 and S-400 systems would be able to knock the American rockets out of the sky. That, however, never happened, prompting the Russian government to launch an investigation into the manufacturer of the S-300 air defense system, just one of many ongoing investigations into failing or underperforming Russian weapons. For Russian air defense operators, HIMARS rockets fly too fast and too high for their systems to understand them as a threat. They have the flight trajectory of traditional artillery but with the speed of a fighter jet, and this can cause havoc when trying to identify a HIMARS attack. Russian software will need to be patched to begin targeting incoming rockets, a development which could take months to complete, if Russia can manage this feat given all their current difficulties. Any doubt amongst Russian officers as to the deadly efficacy of the HIMARS, however, was ended in the coming weeks, as Ukrainian bombardments targeted Russian command posts and supply depots, inflicting crippling casualties in Russia's command and control networks and destroying over 50 supply depots. On the 4th of July, Ukraine even honored the American independence holiday with help from the Russians with the suspected HIMARS strike against a massive ammo depot. HIMARS has been so effective in countering Russian forces that Ukrainian commanders report that the Russian shelling is down tenfold after successful HIMARS strikes, sparing the lives of hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers. But how in the world could 12 weapons be turning the tide of the war in Ukraine? It has everything to do with precision. Russia has the largest amount of artillery in the world and has come to be called an artillery army, yet the vast majority of that artillery is completely unguided. It is fundamentally the same artillery that was in use since the Second World War. HIMARS, however, is a complete game-changer because it's smart while Russia's artillery is dumb and it has greater range. With its extended range, HIMARS can hit targets well behind the front lines, putting areas normally considered safe from enemy attack at great risk. This means command posts, staging areas, supply depots, and even long-range air defense or ground attack systems, all juicy and very high-value targets that traditional artillery simply cannot reach. With command posts and supplies being forced to relocate further behind battle lines, Russian troops can't move or react as quickly as they once did, slowing down an offensive and limiting the Russian military's ability to exploit battlefield opportunities. Overextension becomes a very real problem and could lead to outright disaster. But the system's real strength comes from precision, because HIMARS can accomplish with one salvo what it takes traditional artillery dozens if not hundreds of rounds to do. And Ukraine is using that precision to great effect by targeting Russian supplies and command posts. This is a strategy in effect since the start of the war, with Ukraine devastating Russian logistics even to the point of ignoring targets such as artillery, troops, or tanks. After all, without fuel and ammo, an army can't fight. And Russian forces are discovering that they are having acute supply issues thanks to HIMARS destroying their supply hubs, greatly slowing the pace of their advance and even halting it in places. The use of just 12 HIMARS systems has helped open up a window for a Ukrainian counterattack in the south, which is expected to commence at the end of July and will probably have started by the time you watch this episode. But precision is worthless if you don't know where the enemy's juiciest targets are, and this is largely where the US comes in. The United States has been feeding vast amounts of intelligence to Ukrainian forces since the start of the conflict, and the US is very good at sniffing out enemy VIPs and other high-priority targets. That's partly thanks to one of the largest intelligence apparatuses in the world, but also thanks to the Russians themselves, who have almost no concept of operational or communication security. A fundamental lack of encrypted radios has allowed Ukraine and the US to snoop on Russian communications and take appropriate action. U.S. intelligence has led to over a dozen Russian generals earning an early and permanent retirement, and with HIMARS on the front lines, that list is only bound to grow. The U.S. is committed to keeping Ukraine resupplied with rockets it needs to keep blasting Russian targets and is even shipping additional HIMARS units over the next couple months. Ukraine has said that with 100 of these systems it could push Russia out of its territory and though we don't know how many the U.S. will end up sending to Ukraine, we know that an additional four are already being planned for delivery. For its part, Russia has publicly downplayed the threat that HIMARS poses. Yet, the facts don't lie. Russian use of artillery is down significantly in areas where HIMARS is in play, as Russian artillerymen are forced to conserve ammunition and destruction of the American weapon has become a top priority. Russia claims it has destroyed four of the units to date, a claim that both Ukraine and the Pentagon deny. Now we have news that the US House of Representatives has approved a measure to provide $100 million in funding to train Ukrainian pilots in the use of American F-16s and F-15s. If the bill passes the Senate in September, then Ukrainian pilots could begin training as early as January of next year in US planes. 
By next summer, Russia could have yet another headache on its hands, as it now faces modern American weapons both on the ground and in the sky. The real question is, though, with all its bluster about destroying NATO, how exactly does Russia plan to do that when it can't even handle a dozen US HIMARS? With nearly 400 HIMARS units in service, other NATO members are now requesting the weapon system from the US, which is bad news bears for Vladimir Putin's dreams of Russian expansionism. President Joe Biden has warned Russia that there would be clear and severe consequences if Russia were to use chemical weapons in Ukraine. But what if that thin red line was crossed? What if the US and Russia were to go to war over Ukraine? Two hours before war. Somewhere in western Ukraine, a Ukrainian base hosting several dozen American trainers comes under attack from Russian missiles. This is where America had been training Ukraine's conventional and special forces for the last eight years, and where US trainers now work hand-in-hand -hand with their Ukrainian counterparts to get 100,000 Ukrainian reservists ready to fight in the east. The attack is symbolic more than anything, Russia flexing its muscles and warning the US to back off from the war in Ukraine. However, a lucky missile strike happens to hit the American barracks. 15 American soldiers die from the Russian attack, one hour and 45 minutes before the war. The casualties are quickly confirmed and relayed back to Washington, D.C., via the US military's advanced extremely high-frequency satellite network. The constellation of six satellites sits in geostationary orbit and relay data via jam-resistant communication links for the US, Canadian, Australian, Netherlands, and British militaries. News of the casualties are on the president's desk just two minutes after the attack occurs. President Biden immediately calls for an emergency session of Congress, 15 minutes before war. The deaths of US service members is unacceptable to the American people. Russia has been warned that any attack against American supply convoys or personnel would be an attack on America itself. With a few dissenting votes, the American Congress approves a formal declaration of war against Russia, with the stated intent of neutralizing Russian forces inside Ukraine and preventing them from re-entering the country. Five minutes before war. Addressing the world and the nation via the White House Oval Office, President Joe Biden announces a declaration of war by the United States of America against the Russian Federation. He makes it clear that the military objectives of this war are to neutralize Russian forces in Ukraine and liberate the eastern-occupied regions. U.S. ground forces will not be entering into Russia itself. This is an attempt to limit the escalation of hostilities and prevent an immediate escalation to nuclear conflict. As the president is delivering his remarks, the United States military is already on the move. War, Hour 1 From the decks of U.S. ships across the world's oceans, SM-3 missiles modified to carry out anti-satellite attacks fire into the sky. Their targets are Russian military and civilian satellites that help provide communications and GPS navigation to Russian military units. American F-15s aid in the attack, launching their own anti-satellite missiles from high altitude. The attacks are limited and focused. Destroying a satellite in orbit causes a massive debris cloud that can damage or even destroy friendly satellites. Russia, which also has been preparing for the possibility of war with the US ever since the start of the invasion in Ukraine, responds with its own attacks against American satellites. However, Russian weapons are greatly limited in number. Only two of the American advanced, extremely high-frequency satellites are neutralized in this way. By comparison, Russian GPS is rendered completely ineffective due to kinetic strikes and electronic attacks against the Russian space network. American ships and cruise missile-laden submarines in both the Pacific Ocean and Baltic Sea launched several additional salvos, this time targeting Russian ground and naval infrastructure. Within minutes of President Biden's declaration of war, hundreds of American missiles are streaking toward targets in St. Petersburg, Kaliningrad, and the Pacific naval bases of Kamchatsky, Magadan, Petropavlovsk, and Sovetskaya Gavan. An American submarine, having secretly transited into the Black Sea weeks ago, launches its own attacks against Russian naval facilities in Sevastopol in occupied Crimea. Russian air defense units detect the incoming barrage of missiles and begin to go to work. S-400 and older S-300 units track the incoming missiles. American cruise missiles are subsonic and easy prey for advanced air defenses. And Russia boasts some of the best in the world. However, this first salvo is immense, and while dozens of American cruise missiles are destroyed, some manage to slip through the blistering barrage of air defenses to hit their targets. Air defense radars are primary targets for the U.S. Navy, but Russia has defended these well, knowing that the U.S. retains the advantage in the air. Only a few U.S. missiles find their mark, punching holes in the Russian air defense network of Kaliningrad, where most of the strikes have been focused. In the Pacific theater, more U.S. missiles find their targets, given the thinner air defenses there. With the war in Ukraine going poorly for Russia, critical air defense units have been stripped from Russia's less important Pacific theater to bolster its defenses in the east. Most of the Russian ports in the Pacific are rendered unusable. 
The Russian Navy has a fraction of the capabilities of the US Navy, and its ships are being kept close to home, where they can enjoy the cover of air and ground-based defenses. However, some Russian submarines are on the prowl in the Atlantic and Pacific, and the hunt for these Russian infiltrators is on. By the end of the first hour of the war, US troops and European bases are being recalled from leave for mobilization. NATO holds a hasty assembly, but most of the member nations do not wish to invoke Article 5. This was after all prompted by a strike on a Ukrainian facility that happened to hold American trainers. Only Poland agrees to join the American war effort, mostly out of necessity. Poland borders Kaliningrad and Belarus both, and will be pushed into the crosshairs of the Russian military anyway, as it's the only place the US can stage a push into Ukraine. Hour 3 A barrage of Russian missiles is detected incoming at high speed by long-range airborne and ground-based air defense radars in Poland. The targets are Polish air bases where US Air Force troops and aircraft are stationed. Missiles inbound from Kaliningrad are more difficult to defend against given the faster flight time half managed to evade US and Polish air defenses in the region. The US has positioned Patriot batteries in Poland since the start of the war in Ukraine, but these have been tasked with protecting the Polish Aegis Ashore facility that even now is nearing completion after years of delays and construction challenges. Poland is one of NATO's most important states given its proximity to Russia and the Russian enclave in Kaliningrad. This means that the powerful Aegis Ashore facility will one day be the cornerstone of one of the most robust missile and air defense networks in the world. But that day is not today, and the facility is still not operational. Russia pummels the construction site with long-range missiles, but missile defenses manage to stem the bulk of the tide. A few slip through, causing some moderate damage that will ensure the facility will not be completed before the end of the war. Polish air bases also take a pummeling, but the ferocity of the strike is not as great as it was feared to be. That's because Russia has exhausted many of its precision weapons in the fight against Ukraine, and crippling sanctions have made resupply impossible. Russia produces almost none of the sophisticated electronics its advanced missiles need, and what started as a massive stockpile of thousands of missiles has been severely reduced. Any that remain will be needed to counter US forces inside Ukraine itself. Hour 8 Aircraft from across US air bases both at home and abroad take to the sky. They're moving to European airfields from where they'll be able to support the offensive against Russian forces on the ground. America's vast fleet of 650 tanker aircraft, the largest in the world, flies orbits around the Atlantic Ocean, allowing shorter-range F-15s and F-16s to make the transit to Europe from the homeland. Hour 36 US mobilization is ramping up, and troops are preparing to move equipment and personnel into transport ships for the journey across the Atlantic. The largest airlift campaign in the world is already in full swing, with American cargo planes ferrying troops and heavy vehicles to Europe. However, even America's impressive logistics fleet is simply not enough to move large enough quantities of equipment for an offensive. For now, Ukraine is on its own, and Russia is pouring all available manpower into the conflict before the US arrives. Hour 40 Russia does not wish to antagonize other NATO members, thus expected incursions into the Baltics never materialize. Neither do long-range strikes against America's most important bases in Germany. Instead, Russia scrambles to put together a massive offensive in the east of Ukraine. Its strategy is simple. If it can overwhelm Ukrainian defenses, then it can deny the US the very country it's trying to push Russia out of. But the Ukrainian defenders are resilient as ever, even as Russia mobilizes its reserve battalion tactical groups for battle. This will put tens of thousands of additional troops in the east of Ukraine in the next few days, overwhelming the defenders. Meanwhile, inside Russia, an emergency draft is instituted. Hour 42 Hastily prepped for their missions, American B-2 bombers have been flying from home bases in the continental US for the last 17 hours. Now, the stealthy planes have penetrated deep inside Russian air defense zones and unleashed their cargo on Russian radar and communication hubs inside of Kaliningrad. The goal is to shut down the military enclave's ability to defend itself from air attack, and thus pin massive contingents of Russian forces down, preventing them from launching an offensive into Poland. Two B-2s are lost in the attack, but the damage to Russian communications and air defense infrastructure is significant and greatly expands gaps in air defense coverage. The US Navy takes advantage of these gaps by launching additional missile strikes, supplemented by strike aircraft from carriers in the Mediterranean and ready forces stationed across Europe. The US Suppression of Enemy Air Defenses or SEED mission is slowly but steadily stripping away Russian air defenses inside the military enclave. Russian fighters alone are no match for American planes with superior sensors, electronics, and weapons, but working in conjunction with very robust air defenses, they become a serious threat. Dozens of aircraft are destroyed on both sides of the conflict, as Russia tries to keep its air defenses online and deny the US and Polish the skies. Hour 60 
A Russian attack submarine scores a devastating blow on an American destroyer operating inside the Baltic Sea. This is one of Russia's most modern subs, and while not as capable as American counterparts, still a significant threat to the US Navy in turbulent waters of the Baltic Sea. The submarine is pursued relentlessly by surface vessels working in conjunction with the airborne ASW aircraft, but manages to slink away, using a heavy storm as cover. Hundreds of American sailors die in the attack, and a multi-billion dollar ship sinks beneath the waves. The Russian surface navy has yet to show itself in battle, sticking close to shore where it's too dangerous for US forces to target them. Day 4 a flood of cyber attacks rocks both Russia and the US, with both sides unleashing the full force of their cyber warfare capabilities against the other. The damage to civilian infrastructure on both sides is intense, but the US proves more robust and within 48 hours American markets are operating as normal again. Day 6 the war over Kaliningrad has reduced Russia's local air defenses to small bubbles of protection, but at the cost of many American aircraft. The Enclave, however, is now being mercilessly pummeled from the air as American B-52s launch punishing sorties from their home bases in the United States. Supply and logistic hubs are being set up inside Europe to allow the big planes to be closer to the action, and thus fly more sorties. But for now, the planes must make the day-and-a-half round trip to strike their targets and return home, slowing down the pace of the offensive. However, the vast amount of firepower each plane brings to the fight is devastating for Russian forces. With ground-based air defenses severely attrited by the air and missile strikes, American and Polish fighters can now fly air superiority missions over Kaliningrad, daring Russian MiGs to rise up and meet them. As shown in Ukraine, the Russian Air Force is not nearly as capable as once believed, though it is still very numerous. The US has many times more planes, but for now, they're not in Europe, bringing a numbers parity to both sides. US and Polish forces, however, have the advantage with superior sensors, while Russia has the advantage in maneuverability and thrust-to-weight ratio, making their planes deadly in dogfights. Unfortunately for Russia, the age of the dogfight is gone and most engagements are carried out from beyond visual range. Scores of aircraft are downed in the fiercest air battle since World War II, with the losses heavily on the Russian side. By the end of the first week of fighting, Kaliningrad is under serious threat from the air, but the United States has expended vast amounts of munitions in the attacks and must pause air operations to give time for rearming and refitting. For a few days, all is eerily quiet over the skies that were recently roaring with the sound of dueling jet fighters. Week 2 at the start of the second week of fighting, US forces have begun to amass in Europe in significant numbers. It'll still take time for them to prepare for battle, and even America's vast logistics fleet will take months to ferry the US's firepower to Europe. However, smaller and more mobile forces have already begun the trip to Ukraine, and a large number of attack helicopters are being amassed to repel the Russian ground assault in the Donbass region. They are simply waiting for the refitting of the US Air Force so it can provide the needed air cover. New Russian battalion tactical groups have entered Ukraine after being hastily prepared for combat. However, the hasty preparations have wreaked havoc on Russian supply chains, which have already been struggling even before the broadening of the war. Now Russian vehicles and personnel find themselves stalled out in massive convoys reminiscent of Russia's failed push to Kyiv. US aircraft take the opportunity presented to them, but only the F-35 can penetrate dangerous skies still not secured by proper seat operations. Forced to carry weapons internally, the F-35s are very limited in firepower, and the attacks do little real damage to the massive formations of enemy troops. However, they are a massive morale boost to the beleaguered Ukrainian defenders who have been dreaming of the day US air power would come to their aid. As the second week of fighting comes to a close, the Russian offensive in the east once more bogs down. This time, though, because of Russia's crippling lack of logistics, Ukrainian defenders take the opportunity to pull back and create some breathing room, resupplying and redeploying to new defensive positions. Russia attempts to use air power to pummel the Ukrainian front lines, but very quickly discovers this to be a mistake. Lurking over the skies of Ukraine are a number of American F-22 Raptors. Deploying under the Rapid Raptor program, the premier air supremacy fighter in the world was some of the first American aircraft to arrive on scenes. While Russia can threaten Ukrainian airspace with air defenses based on its own soil, the Raptors are too far away from these defenses for detection. Russian aircraft experience significant losses before the air offensive is abruptly terminated. Week 4 The first American Armored Brigade combat team has crossed the border into Ukraine. A second quickly follows. An expected offensive by the US and Poland into Kaliningrad never materializes, as the US doesn't wish to provoke Russia into using nuclear weapons by physically invading its territory. Instead, Russian troops inside the military enclave are suppressed by ongoing air campaigns against them. America has achieved not air supremacy but air dominance in the region. For the first time in history, Russian and American armor clash in combat. 
Both sides have prepared for this conflict for decades, but after the end of the Cold War, corruption and a weak economy has hollowed out Russia's once formidable capabilities. The first assault comes in the dead of night. US forces down to the individual soldier are all equipped with night vision. Russian forces, on the other hand, only have night vision and thermals on their heavy vehicles, with a smattering of night vision devices across their infantry. America owns the night, and the ferocity of the offensive rocks the Russian forces to their core. Russian battalion tactical groups are massive beasts with a very heavy top-down command structure. US forces, however, enjoy a great degree of autonomy and are encouraged to seize the initiative. While the Russian BTG is superior in numbers, the US attacks using smaller, much more maneuverable forces. The confusion of fighting in the dark with few night vision capabilities only makes the situation worse for the Russian defenders. Russian T-90s, T-80s, and T-72s have struggled against Ukrainian tanks. Against modern M1A2C Abrams equipped with the latest upgrade packages fighting in the dead of night, they're decimated. Guided to their targets by superior sensors and fire control computers, Abrams silver bullets bore through thick Russian armor, the edges burning away creating a self-sharpening penetrator that leads to an extremely emotional event for the Russian crew. Russian tanks fire back with cannon-fired anti-tank missiles, but America has sent the very tip of its spear into this first fight. While not every American Abrams has been equipped with a trophy countermeasure system, the tanks leading the charge into Russian lines have been, and the Israeli-developed countermeasures prove an able defense against the few Russian tanks to survive initial contact. The problem for Russian armor is that American tanks are engaging them from greater distances than they're capable of, thanks to the superior fire computers and sights the Abrams are equipped with. While in Ukraine, Russia has failed to use its infantry to screen its armored forces against anti-tank kill teams, the US makes no such mistake, and the offensive is partnered with mechanized infantry forces who quickly engage in neutralized pockets of resistance left behind in the wake of the overwhelming armored assault. Once more, US forces' abilities to see in the dark gives them an insurmountable advantage over the far less technologically sophisticated opponents. Close air support aircraft work in conjunction with the ground assault to pummel Russian positions. Vaunted A-10 Warthogs unleash hell from their massive GAU-8 Avenger 30mm cannons, while F-15s and F-35s provide air cover against a potential incursion by Russian MiGs. Standoff attack munitions have devastated many of Russia's long-range air defenses located in theater, and seed operations have greatly attrited many of the air defenses just over the Russian border that could threaten Allied aircraft inside Ukraine. The campaign has come at a steep cost for the US Air Force and Navy, but the benefits are worth the price, as American close air support aircraft mercilessly pummel Russian positions. Short-range air defenses are much more difficult to target and destroy, and a number of American Apaches fall prey to these and man-portable shoulder-fired air defense weapons. The tough A-10s prove far more difficult to bring down, however, constructed to survive exactly this type of large-scale combat during the Cold War. Overall, though, Russian air defenses manage to score only minor losses on the US air fleet before they themselves are destroyed. While Russia has completely failed to conduct combined arms operations, the US teaches Russia's underfunded and poorly trained forces a masterclass in modern combined arms warfare. Week 5 Additional American Armored Brigade combat teams make the transition to Ukraine. US forces relieve Ukrainian forces along the front of Russia, giving the exhausted defenders a chance to rest and recuperate. The main thrust of the American advance is toward Kyrgyzstan, with the US forces currently engaged in urban fighting against Russian forces for the liberation of the city. American infantry is well versed in urban combat thanks to two decades of fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the terrain favors the defenders. US casualties are significant, but with air superiority and superior training, US forces are pushing the Russians out of Kherson. The local civilian populations that remain in the besieged city welcomes the Americans as liberators and aids them in the struggle against Russian forces, only complicating matters for the Russians. Outside of Kherson, the US Special Operations Forces conduct daily nighttime raids against Russian logistics networks, crippling resupply operations into Kherson. The advantage US troops enjoy during nighttime gives them the significant edge over the Russians, as does the fact that the local civilians throw their full support behind the Americans. Along the Polish-Kaliningrad border, skirmishes are common, but there's no full-scale fighting. Polish forces have created a massive defense front in order to keep Russians from encroaching into Poland. But by now, US and Polish air forces have completely destroyed Russia's air defense networks in the military enclave. Any Russian forces that would threaten Poland come under immediate attack. Losses have been steep for both nations' air forces, but Russia losses have been steeper. Not only are Polish and American aircraft far more modern, but Russia's legacy of internal corruption and poor maintenance haunts it as it tries to fend off constant air attacks. 
Sortie rates for Russian aircraft plummet almost immediately and never recover enough to create a viable defense. To make matters worse, the shortage of critical electronic components has also crippled Russian air defenses. Already during hostilities with Ukraine, the Russian military was running out of air defense missiles, but now all of its stockpiles for use in case of war with NATO have been nearly exhausted, and there's no domestic replenishment available. Within another week or two, the Russians will be reduced to Cold War era anti aircraft cannons, which are completely ineffective against high altitude targets, though still pose a threat to low-flying aircraft. At the end of the first month of fighting, the Russian military is in dire straits. It's already exhausted by two months of fighting in Ukraine. The majority of US ground combat power is not yet in theater, but well on its way, and what elements are already operating inside of Ukraine are putting incredible pressure on demoralized and exhausted Russian troops. US losses are light, Russian casualties are steep, and many of its gains in Ukraine are being reversed. The US has yet to initiate a large campaign against Russian forces, waiting until the bulk of its fighting units are inside the country before launching a massive blitz across the 800-mile front in the east of the nation. For now, the Americans are reinforcing Ukraine's exhausted defenders and relieving them for much-needed reconstitution and resupply. Only in Kherson have the Americans launched a true offensive with the goal of opening a corridor to Crimea. Week 6 Ukrainian forces and their American allies end the Russian occupation of Kherson. The city is the only place U.S. forces have sustained significant casualties. All along the wide-open plains of eastern Ukraine, American forces have remained in defensive postures, repelling initial attempts by the Russians to push them back. Now the front settles into a strategic stalemate as the U.S. waits for the arrival of the bulk of its firepower. In the air, however, the war continues. U.S. forces work day and night to attrict Russian air defenses. The use of drones, standoff attack munitions, and F-35s help curb what would otherwise be very high casualties, as does the fact that Russia is rapidly running out of air defense missiles. Turkey allows the passage of U.S. Navy ships into the Black Sea leading to a brief but intense confrontation between the Russian and American navies. The Russians managed to sink two American destroyers in exchange for nearly their entire Black Sea fleet, which is forced to remain in port or operate under the threat of being sunk. Those ships are soon destroyed at their moorings by the American stealth aircraft. U.S. Marines arrive in Odessa to bring preparations for an amphibious assault into Crimea. Week 9 in one of the fastest mobilization efforts in history, the United States has surged vast amounts of combat firepower to Ukraine over the course of two months. The battle for Ukraine is ready to begin in earnest. Week 10 Russian forces have had their supply lines continuously disrupted by U.S. air and special forces operations. Ammunition is low across the front, as is food, medicine, and morale. Russia has entered this war with an insufficiently large enough logistics fleet, and now after the destruction of hundreds of its trucks, its logistics networks are close to complete collapse. Russian forces have been forced to pull back dozens of miles across the front, but not due to military action, because supply lines are needed to be shortened in order to keep units resupplied with a diminished transport fleet. 20,000 additional Russian forces have surged into the nation, the vast majority of them conscripts. These soldiers are poorly equipped and suffer from extremely low morale. The front has been quiet for two weeks, but all of that is about to change. In a blistering nighttime attack, U.S. forces surge forward across the wide front in eastern Ukraine. The use of nighttime operations throws the Russians into disarray as they still lack night fighting capabilities in any significant number. Only in the cities is the offensive slowed, as the fighting becomes a block-by-block -block slog that favors the Russian occupiers. A thrust into Crimea splits Russian forces into two, as simultaneously U.S. and Ukrainian Marines launch an amphibious assault outside of Sevastopol. The operation is a costly one. Russian resistance is stiffer here after eight years of occupying Crimea. However, the rapid advance of American armor into Crimea cuts off Sevastopol from the rest of Russia. Rather than attempting to take the city by force, U.S. and Ukrainian forces surround it and seal it off from resupply, allowing civilians to flee through humanitarian corridors while keeping Russian forces pinned down. Cut off from outside supply, they will eventually either starve to death or be forced to surrender. With U.S. forces in sight of Mariupol by the end of the week and 100,000 Ukrainian troops trained and equipped in the last two months, Russia faces a choice – admit defeat in Ukraine and retreat to its own borders, continue in a senseless defense of occupied territories that is doomed to failure at great cost to its own troops, or widen the conflict through the use of nuclear weapons. In what's become a modern desert storm, U.S. forces and their Polish allies working in conjunction with Ukraine's defenders have rolled back most of Russia's gains in a matter of weeks. The deciding factors are superior morale, 
training, equipment, and the fact that Russia has been unable to properly resupply its forces for weeks. But victory hasn't come without a cost to the US and Poland. Thousands are dead and wounded, and the loss in aircraft is significant. Stockpiles of air defenses and ground attack missiles have also been greatly depleted. Replenishment will take years and leave the US military vulnerable to any sudden aggression by China in the Pacific. One of America's greatest modern weaknesses is the lack of a robust industrial mobilization capability, leaving it to resupply losses in missiles and equipment through a slow, steady trickle that will take the better part of a decade. The date is March 4, 2022, and after years of deliberation, both Georgia and Bosnia and Herzegovina have officially been accepted as full NATO partners. Ukraine now reinvigorates its push for NATO membership, while Russia has for the last six months warned of military action. Alarmed by what it views as encroachment of NATO on its borders, Russia at last responds to the ascension of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Georgia by massing forces on its western border. Russia is gambling that the other NATO nations will reconsider admitting the two new members, or at least not be willing to go to war over the defense of brand new members to the alliance. Russia, however, has completely underestimated the solidarity of the alliance, realizing that NATO is in essence a worthless entity unless Article 5 of the treaty is immediately enforced. NATO warns Russia that an attack on one ally is considered an attack on all allies. To reinforce the point, NATO troops are sent into Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the alliance's most vulnerable members given their direct proximity to Russia. Russia, however, sees this as an unacceptable show of force, and the move proves to be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Without warning, Russian armor pours into Latvia and Lithuania, linking up with forces in Kaliningrad. World War III has officially begun. For the first month of fighting, Russian forces push as far west as Poland, but the offensive grinds to a halt as NATO members finish mobilizing and their resistance solidifies. With American troops and equipment making landfall in France and Germany, NATO is now launching vicious counterattacks against Russia's forces in Poland. In the Pacific, the American Navy steams towards Russia's eastern coast, bringing with it a marine expeditionary force meant to open a second front in the war and split Russia's forces. Russia is faced with a losing proposition and decides to gamble. It authorizes a single nuclear strike against Berlin, betting that while European NATO members may retaliate with their limited nuclear arsenals, the Americans won't risk the destruction of their cities to support their European allies. The date is now April 12th, 0205 hours Zulu. American and Chinese infrared recon satellites both pick up the telltale fiery plume of an ICBM launch from a missile farm in the south of Russia. Two minutes later, the American president is awoken from his sleep and given the news. Russia has launched a single nuclear device, unknown payload, likely target in Western Europe. The US Air Force's Global Strike Command has for weeks been flying nuclear alert missions with its fleet of B-52 bombers, maintaining a nuclear armed force in the air 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, as its predecessor, the Strategic Air Command, once did for decades during the Cold War. With the detected launch of a Russian nuclear weapon, a priority flash is immediately dispatched to the airborne forces and alert forces on the ground. Flight crews stationed overseas in Japan, on the west coast of the United States, and in Europe all review their single integrated operational plan, which lays out the exact flight route, refueling track, and targets for each of the bomber crews. Most aircraft have two primary targets, with two alternate targets to be struck should they be unable to make it to their primary targets. Within minutes, the crews are in the air, and those already on alert patrols immediately set their course for the positive control turnaround point a pre-planned point near Russia where the air crews will automatically turn around unless they receive an order to strike. At missile sites across the American Midwest, the giant concrete shutters that protect the buried missiles inside their launch facilities are automatically rolled back, and the security forces personnel tasked with defending those sites go on full alert. Their orders are to defend the silos until every missile has been launched, after which they are to escort surviving missile crews out and back to a rendezvous point well away from the missile farm for these sites will be a priority target for incoming Russian missiles. Inside underground bunkers, missile operators rehearse launch procedures, each man responsible for a group of missiles. The entire system only requires two out of four of the operators to authenticate a launch order, just in case two of the men get cold feet about launching a nuclear Armageddon and refuse their orders. Deep in the Arctic, Pacific, and Atlantic Ocean, the US's extremely low-frequency communication system flashes a nuclear alert to America's ballistic missile submarine fleet. Each sub carries 24 Trident missiles, and each missile carries up to eight independently targetable warheads with a yield of 475 kilotons. America's fleet of hunter-killer attack submarines have for weeks been stalking and eliminating Russia's aging ballistic missile submarines, and the survivors are bottled up near the Russian shore where they can be protected with 
shore-based firepower and anti-submarine patrols. Now, America's attack submarines set course for Russia's coast, and their mission is to eliminate Russia's surviving nuke boats, though it will cost America's submarine fleet dearly, as Russia's Air Force and Surface Navy fiercely defend their surviving ballistic missile subs. At 0209 hours, the American president is told that the American recon assets have positive confirmation of a nuclear detonation in Berlin. The Russians have fired an older, single warhead ICBM, yet with a yield large enough to completely destroy the city of 3.6 million. On a hotline direct with the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the president is told that Britain is already issuing a fire order to retaliate for the attack. The president knows that the attack on Berlin was a gamble by the Russians, who don't believe that the US will risk an escalation and attacks on its own cities to defend Europe. An emergency flash is dispatched by the US's ELF communication system to a lurking Ohio-class submarine currently on station deep beneath the ice of the North Pole. After authenticating the order, the sub breaches through the five-foot-thick ice and the door on a single dorsally-mounted launch tube props open. The navigation system on the Trident II missile located inside the launch tube is activated, and a mission trajectory is automatically loaded into the flight computer. Then, a steam generator ignites a solid-grain rocket motor, which feeds superheated exhaust into a tank of chilled water. The water evaporates and expands, forcing the missile within the launch tube to be launched upwards and out after which the first stage motor ignites and the missile screams upward and towards space. An astro-inertial guidance system on board the missile uses star positioning to fine-tune the accuracy of its trajectory, as GPS has long been unreliable due to Russian attacks on NATO satellites. The Russians have bet wrong, and minutes later, eight 475 kiloton warheads detonate over the Russian missile facility which launched the Berlin attack. Simultaneously, a British attack strikes the cities of Ekaterinburg and Novosibirsk, with a population of 1.5 million or 3 million together. NATO has responded in kind to the Berlin attack, and America has both punished Russia's nuclear forces for the attack and shown that it will stand with its allies. In the halls of the Kremlin, a desperate power struggle plays out. 3 million Russians lie dead, and the US has obliterated one of Russia's major nuclear missile facilities, destroying dozens of ICBMs in place. Russian ballistic submarines, considered to be the most survivable element of the nuclear triad, have also been decimated by American attack submarines, though the US has lost 12 subs of its own in its quest to eliminate the remaining Russian boats. Military leadership clashes with the civilian leadership and demands a retaliatory attack on American missile facilities. With US reinforcements in force on the Western Front, and Russia Russians starting to lose ground in Poland, battlefield commanders have for the last week been requesting a release on strategic nuclear weapons to use against American infantry and tanks. The fierce debate on the use of tactical weapons is reignited, and when further nuclear attacks are denied, Russian military leadership stages a stunning coup. The Russian president is removed from power, and Russian commanders receive authorization for the use of a dozen tactical weapons against NATO forces in Europe. Within a half hour, NATO troop concentrations in Poland are hammered by low-yield nuclear attacks, killing tens of thousands. American reinforcements fresh from the states and currently massing around the Rammstein military facilities in Germany are hit with three tactical devices. The Marine Expeditionary Force in the Pacific, staging out of Japan, is also struck by a single device, as are the two naval carrier battle groups supporting the invasion. By 9 am, American military forces have suffered more casualties than all wars since World War II combined, and the ability for NATO to push back Russian forces in Poland is eliminated. While Russia has maintained an inventory of low-yield tactical nuclear weapons to counter America's overwhelming conventional firepower advantage, the United States has not kept an active inventory of tactical devices for decades. This leaves the American president with few options for a comparable retaliatory attack. While the yields on America's airborne submarine and ground-launched nuclear devices can be dialed down, there's no way to broadcast that fact to the Russians, and little chance they'd believe it. An attack with traditional ICBMs, submarine-launched missiles, or airborne nuclear cruise missiles will seem to Russia like a full-blown attack and risk escalating the war into a total nuclear confrontation. Yet the president has little choice. Tens of thousands of American service members are dead. US forces in Europe have been badly damaged by the attacks, and both carrier battle groups supporting the Pacific invasion are reporting major losses of ships, aircraft, and personnel. The Marine invasion force in Okinawa is combat ineffective four divisions reporting over 55% casualties each. Resigning himself to a list of terrible options, the president orders a retaliatory attack using ground-based ICBMs. The Air Force's Global Strike Command nuclear bomber fleet is to approach and hold at their failsafe points, ready to proceed to their targets should Russia retaliate again. 
At Minot Air Force Base in North Dakota, a launch order is authorized by the two-man Minuteman launch crew, and a single Minuteman III missile roars into the night sky. Sixty seconds later, the second stage of the missile ignites, separating from the spent first booster stage. Adjustments using the second stage thrust vector control keeps the missile on its course, and another sixty seconds later the flight computer separates the second stage and fires the engine on the third and final stage. By now the missile has reached space, and as the third stage engine burns out, reverse thrust separates the three warheads and their penetration aids from the launch vehicle. Some of the penetration aids explode, showering space with millions of pieces of reflective aluminum which wreak havoc on radar used by missile interceptors, while other aids simulate the real warheads and serve as dummy targets for any Russian interceptors. With no real Russian anti-ballistic missile defense programs though, the warheads and the dummies all re-enter the Earth's atmosphere completely unharmed. 23 minutes after launch, three separate 475 kiloton nuclear explosions rock Eastern Europe. Russian forces in Poland are obliterated by two nuclear strikes many times greater in magnitude than those used against NATO forces, while yet another Russian nuclear missile facility is struck by the third warhead. With American weapons targeting their missile fields and systematically eliminating Russia's ability to respond to nuclear attacks, the final order is given for a full-blown nuclear response. American reconnaissance satellites and electronic eavesdropping assets all pick up the telltale signs of preparatory operations for a nuclear launch across Russia's remaining missile farms. The order to attack is mirrored in the US, and launch officers in North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana receive the order to launch. Simultaneously, American airborne assets receive an emergency flash, which when authenticated authorizes the air crews to proceed to their targets with full nuclear release. American ballistic missile submarines breach through the thick polar ice, or rise to 25 feet below the waves of the Pacific in the North Sea. As Russian missiles clear their silos, it's America's nuclear ballistic missile subs which launch the first wave of retaliatory attacks, almost as fast as Russian ground forces. American submarine-launched missiles target Russia's remaining missile fields in a desperate hope to destroy them before they can finish launch operations, but for the most part the American strikes fail to stop the launches. Secondary military targets are then struck, with major Russian military bases, supply depots, troop staging areas, and airfields all being obliterated in nuclear fire within 10 minutes of the start of the Russian attack. As Russia's ICBMs climb into the atmosphere, a wave of American ballistic missile defense systems immediately spring into action. Having spent billions on ballistic missile defense since the 1980s, all in a bid to make Reagan's Star Wars concept a reality, America now attacks the incoming missiles with a variety of tools. Airborne laser systems in Europe and flying in the Pacific manage to strike at a handful of ICBMs during their vulnerable ascent stage, superheating the missile body from hundreds of miles away with a powerful aircraft-mounted laser system. As the missile climb into space, ballistic missile defense sites across the west coast of the United States launch their ground-based interceptors. Using a powerful radar, the interceptors scream toward the incoming missiles in a bid to destroy them through kinetic impact before they can re-enter the atmosphere. The Russian missiles, however, immediately disperse their own penetration aids, and a shower of billions of pieces of aluminum chaff wreaks hell on American interceptor radar. The interceptors switch to their visual interception systems, and advanced computer programs frantically scramble to identify the incoming warheads visually, ignoring the clouds of chaff. Half of the interceptors miss their targets, the other half manage to strike, yet of the successful intercepts, a full third are of dummy warheads. To make matters worse, the US only has an inventory of about 60 interceptors ready to fire and are completely overwhelmed by an incoming horde of hundreds of independently targeted warheads. 24 minutes after launch, the west coast is the first hit. One megaton strikes against Los Angeles, Seattle, Portland, and others obliterate the most populated cities on the American west coast. A follow-on 450 kiloton strike destroys the Los Angeles harbor area, along with tens of thousands of homes and the naval base at San Diego. Edwards Air Force Base in the California desert is struck by two 450 kiloton strikes, as is Vandenberg Air Force Base. Three minutes later, nuclear impacts strike the American Midwest. North American Aerospace Defense Command at Peterson Air Force Base is incinerated by a megaton blast, and the Cheyenne Mountain Complex is struck by two ground penetration munitions, though the blasts manage to do little damage to the deeply buried facility. Strikes continue to roll eastwards, and a saturation of 300 kiloton strikes decimates the American farm belt. These munitions are programmed to be ground bursts, resulting in the scattering of millions of tons of highly radioactive dirt across America's most fertile farmland. 
Another three minutes later and the east coast is struck by the Russian ICBMs. Washington is obliterated by two separate megaton blasts, as is New York City, the financial heart of America. The American president, however, is safe from the nuclear blasts. He has long ago boarded what is nicknamed the Doomsday Plane, an airborne command post from which he can still manage America's remaining military and civilian forces. With satellite and ground communications completely eradicated, a fleet of Air Force planes now makes up a global command and control system, linking up surviving military forces with the president. Soon, his plane will land at an intact airfield and he'll be helicoptered out to a surviving supercarrier, from which he will continue to command the survivors of America's military and oversee the reconstruction, if any possible, of what remains of America, all from the safety of the Atlantic Ocean. Day 1 the plan to invade Russia had been in motion for three months, with massive amounts of men and material moved into staging areas around Europe and Japan. The powder keg everyone feared would be lit was about to explode. It all began with Lithuania blocking rail shipments from Russia to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, in protest over the war in Ukraine, effectively cutting it off from resupply. For weeks Russia blustered and threatened and then did the unthinkable. Russian troops crossed the border into Lithuania to seize and secure the railways, linking the critically important Kaliningrad with the motherland. NATO immediately activated its rapid response force, pushing Russian troops out of Lithuania. Now the United States is preparing to do the unthinkable, and something that's very likely to trigger nuclear war. It will invade Russia. US troops have been staging in Poland, Norway, and Japan. The obvious choice may be one of the Baltic nations, but port facilities and airfields here are too close to Russia and under the threat of constant attack. At zero hour, the American attack begins on Russia. It starts with a series of explosions along the western air defense perimeter Russia has established on its home soil to defend against NATO air attack. It's an extremely robust system of SAM satellites, fighter bases, and radar installations, the densest air defense network in the world. But the United States has several tools for the job. The first is the B-2 stealth bomber. With its lack of vertical surfaces, it's the only stealth aircraft in the world that can also defeat long-range tracking radar, which even the best stealth fighter is vulnerable to. The only clue to the incoming attack are intermittent anomalous pings on Russian radars, but by the time Russian fighters arrive to investigate, the B-2s are long gone. Radar and communication nodes are the first to be targeted by American B-2 stealth fleet. This knocks out a significant amount of Russian long-range radar, and a few hours later B-51 bombers armed with standoff attack munitions fire volleys of missiles to crater Russian airfields and destroy fixed SAM sites. Unlike Russia's attempt to knock out Ukraine's air defense network at the start of the war, this is a concentrated and well-coordinated attack reminiscent of the shock and awe of the first desert storm, when the US and allies destroyed the second-best and most importantly Soviet-built air defense network in the world in hours. F-35s move in to finish the job and knock out air bases along Russia's eastern border, as well as destroy rail infrastructure. Russia's mobility depends disproportionately heavily on railways, hence its problems inside Ukraine. And crippling railways means Russia can't move troops and equipment until the rails are repaired. F-35s are nowhere near as stealthy as the B-2s and have to get much closer than the B-52s to launch their own attacks. But as Russian interceptors rise to meet them, they're greeted by a swarm of US Air Force F-22s, which swat Russian fighters out of the sky from beyond visual range. The US loses several F-35s and fourth-generation aircraft in the attacks, but Russia's ability to defend its western border from air attack is crippled. There are still many mobile radars and SAM units to deal with, but these are under dire threat from constant wild weasel attacks by the US Air Force. Once feared as a near-peer competitor to the US, the war in Ukraine has proven that the Russian Air Force is not even capable of neutralizing a much weaker country such as Ukraine. Poor training, lack of communication, antiquated tactics, and bad maintenance all add up to devastating losses for Russia's air forces. Even as the US airstrikes begin, American ground forces are already rumbling to battle. Abrams' main battle tanks and Apache attack helicopters smash into Russian defensive lines in Kaliningrad. With overwhelming air support, the battles are brutal but short. Russian armor is no match for modern American weapons, and its tank forces are so depleted by the fighting in Ukraine that modern Russian tanks are few and far between. As Desert Storm proved, Cold War Soviet tanks are no match for even early model M1 Abrams, and especially not when working in conjunction with close air support aircraft like the Apache or the A-10 Warthog. By the end of the first day of the battle, Russian ground forces have suffered their worst defeat since the opening day of Operation Barbarossa. Day 3 US forces have moved deep inside Ukraine where they're en route to reinforce Ukrainian units in the east of the country. 
Under intense air assault, Russian forces have been retreating across the entire eastern front of the war. Ukrainian troops have used overwhelming American air power to inflict devastating losses on retreating Russians, and American ground forces are having to rush to catch up with them. There is fear of overextension, but the constant U.S. air and missile assault leaves little room or time for the Russians to counterattack. The key to America's deadly efficiency is information. The U.S. military is the most networked military in the world, and unlike Russia, employs overwhelming amounts of smart weapons. It's been tracking Russian forces since the start of the war in Ukraine, and sharing that information with Ukraine to devastating effect. However, the Ukrainian army always lacked the hardware to make full use of the information. The U.S. doesn't. Adding to Russia's woes is a fundamental lack of operational security in its military. Most of Russia's radios are unsecured, allowing the U.S. to scoop up vast amounts of signals intelligence. After spending 20 years hunting down terrorists in the Middle East by snooping through millions of radio and cell phone intercepts, the U.S. has gotten extremely good at the job. This is why in the real world, Russian generals have been dying on a regular basis, their location pinpointed by the U.S. and transmitted to Ukrainian forces. Now that the U.S. hardware is in play, the slaughter is exponentially greater. Russian command chains are broken across the Eastern Front, and its forces in general retreat to more fortified positions inside the cities of Eastern Ukraine. Day 7 the battle for Kaliningrad is officially over. The fighting was brutal and intense, but under-equipped and demoralized Russian forces were ultimately overwhelmed by U.S. firepower. Psychological operations against Russian troops have been particularly effective. First is an overwhelming display of U.S. power in the form of precision air and long-range artillery strikes. Then radio broadcasts and even leaflets delivered by the U.S. Air Force promise amnesty for any Russian soldier who surrenders. With a large number of conscripts who are accustomed to poor, even abusive treatment, the psychological operation to demoralize Russian forces has been a great success. It doesn't help that many Russian forces here have been recently rotated out of the brutal fighting in Ukraine. If the Russian army could barely win against Ukraine, what hope does it have against the full might of the U.S. military? In the east of Ukraine, American ground forces have joined the fighting alongside their Ukrainian allies. The arrival of vast amounts of American firepower has reinvigorated Ukraine's frontline forces, who are eager to liberate captured territory. But Russia is an artillery army, meaning they field many times more artillery than any other military in the world. And despite intense counter-battery fire and use of ground-attack aircraft, the U.S. is suffering its worst losses since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Day 14 the fighting in Kaliningrad is down to small guerrilla operations by Russian resistance forces. NATO forces from Spain, Germany, Poland, and Italy conduct anti-guerrilla operations, freeing up U.S. forces to continue pushing into the Baltics. Rather than invade the Baltic nations as it once was feared Russia would do in case of a war, the Russian army has chosen to strengthen its defenses along the Baltic border instead. A wise move given the Russian Air Force's inability to deter U.S. air operations. Without adequate air cover, any ground offensive against a military with the largest, most modern air force in the world is doomed to failure. Now U.S. forces execute a push into Belarus from Lithuania and Poland. Belarusian resistance forces have been gathering inside Poland for weeks, undergoing training and being equipped by the U.S. military in anticipation of an operation to liberate their nation from dictator Lukashenko. A popular uprising against Lukashenko severely hampers Loyalist forces' ability to repulse the invasion, and Russian forces sent in support are under intense and constant air attack. In Ukraine, the fighting has reached major occupied cities in the east, with Russian forces slowly but surely being expelled. However, urban combat is notoriously difficult and time-consuming, and heavily favors the defender. The U.S. is suffering its first major casualties in the fight to liberate East Ukraine. However, U.S. forces have been engaged in urban combat for two decades in the Middle East and have superior training and equipment. Cutting off supply lines to occupied cities also cripples the Russian resistance, as does morale issues which have reached critical levels. When they were fighting just Ukrainian forces armed with U.S. weapons, Russian frontline troops were already suffering from severe morale problems. Now faced with vengeful Ukrainians backed by American troops, morale is at a crisis point. Many units surrender without firing a shot. Day 21 a national mobilization effort across Russia has met with mixed success. With U.S. involvement in the Ukrainian war, the anti-war movement has picked up considerable steam. Many young Russians are refusing to show up when mobilized, and attacks on conscription offices are on the rise. The U.S. has fully mobilized its reserves as well, and behind closed doors at the highest levels of American power, discussions are being held on a new draft. While the U.S. completely outcompetes the Russian military, actually invading Russia and toppling the Putin regime will require many more combat forces than currently available. 
and the only way to generate the necessary manpower is a draft. Casualties are also mounting, and while the losses are heavily on the Russian side, the US has suffered thousands injured and half that number dead. Of grave importance are losses in hardware. Modern US manufacturing is poorly suited for mass replenishment of combat losses. With current US defense production a fraction of what it was in the past, an invasion into Russia will cost huge amounts of hardware, and that is not going to be quickly replaced. US industry can surge to building 28 Abrams a month, but if the US is to maintain a credible deterrent against China, it'll need many times that number. Production of fighter aircraft is likewise limited, with perhaps 150 F-35s a year now being built. A surge might bring that number to 200. To put it simply, US focus on advanced weapons and a reliance on overseas manufacturing means that American civilian manufacturing is poorly suited for a transition to wartime production of weapons. It's either going to have to win this war quickly or resort to less and less sophisticated weapons to do so. Day 30 At the end of the first month of fighting, Russian forces have been pushed back to within miles of Ukraine's eastern border with Russia. It's only stubborn resistance inside dense urban cities that's slowing US forces down. Russia has learned not to engage the Americans or their Ukrainian allies in open country anymore. It's just inviting destruction either from the air or from smart precision artillery. A plan for an amphibious assault on the Kamchatka Peninsula is cancelled as fears over mounting losses of equipment have led to a redeployment of forces from Japan to the European theater. Instead, the US Navy launches a number of raids against Russian military airfields and ports in the region, destroying the Russian Pacific Fleet completely. Russia's Far East, however, is relatively strategically unimportant to the nation, as it's too far from Russia's economic hubs to matter much, thus the losses do little to affect the war. The strategically important port of St. Petersburg has been blockaded since the start of the war, and the US Navy launches periodic strikes against Russian forces in the city. Russia fears an amphibious assault incoming and American Marines are spotted staging inside of Estonia for just such an operation. But it's a feint, meant to draw Russian attention to the defense of the city and away from the fighting in Belarus. Inside Belarus, Lukashenko is a president in exile as US and liberation forces free the capital city and march on a retreating loyalist force, hastily making for the Russian border. Under intense air attack, few of the forces make it to the border with any semblance of cohesion. Once at the border itself, they're met with betrayal much like Russia did in our real world to its separatist allies retreating inside Ukraine, the country now refuses to allow non-Russian forces to cross the border. Rather than fight, many surrender. Day 45 US armor chases retreating Russian units across the Ukrainian border and into Russia itself. For the first time since World War II, Russia is now under invasion by a hostile foreign power. Along the Belarusian border, US air and long-range artillery has been devastating Russian defensive positions in anticipation of an assault across the border. Precision strikes have targeted lines of communication, supply depots, and concentrations of heavy equipment. Russia has far more artillery than the US and responds with overwhelming volleys of fire. However, the US is better at counter-battery fire, and artillery duels tend to end with the US on the winning side. US air power has taken significant losses dismantling Russia's vast air defense network but is still extremely capable and available in large numbers. It's this air power that's most lethal to Russia's artillery forces, who are under regular air attack. US stockpiles of smart weapons have begun to run low, though, after a month and a half of intense combat operations. Dumb bombs are being upgraded with smart kits to make them weapon or GPS guided, and superior targeting capabilities by US planes means that even dumb gravity bombs strike with great precision. By comparison, Russian smart weapon stockpiles are now completely depleted. Already running dangerously low by the fifth month of the war in Ukraine, Russia's stockpiles of modern weapons are all but exhausted. It's now putting Cold War relics into the fight with predictably poor results. But Russia has still a significant pool of manpower and conscripts to throw against the invading US forces. As the invasion of Russia is set to formally begin, American commanders consider the dangerous logistics of going up against hundreds of thousands of Russian conscripts. Even if armed with vastly inferior equipment, the sheer number of defenders means US forces could be overwhelmed if they overextend. The best strategy is to keep those troops from even fighting in the first place. US PSYOPs have been working overtime to demoralize Russian troops and convince the Russian people to rise against the current regime. The US promises that it has no intention of holding any seized Russian territory. In fact, it would be wildly impractical to do so, and instead states that its goal is the removal of the Putin regime. This message resonates with many disenfranchised Russians, especially amongst the younger generations, 
The crushing defeat suffered by Russian forces in the last 45 days helped steer many toward an unwillingness to fight. But many Russians see it as their duty to defend their homeland from any invader and have fierce loyalty to the Putin regime. A civil war is brewing inside Russia, and it might be the US's only hope of a successful invasion. Without support from the people, it's unlikely an attempt to remove Vladimir Putin from power will be successful. And that's if he doesn't resort to the use of nuclear weapons. Given the Russian military's incompetence, it's all but certain that the US will also face the use of tactical nuclear weapons against its forces. This can only mean one thing and equal retaliation by the United States. The dangerous climb up the nuclear ladder that only leads to one place, complete annihilation. Despite its vastly superior capabilities, even the US, sole superpower on Earth, simply cannot successfully invade Russia and defeat it without, in effect, defeating itself. Missiles soar over the border of Finland. Russian tanks plow through a series of defenses. Soldiers slaughter one another as they battle for Helsinki. Vladimir Putin has lost any ounce of sanity and has invaded Finland. Lucky for the rest of the world, this will be the last thing he ever does. Finland is more than capable of defending itself, but they have a surprise up their sleeve. As Russia invades another neighbor, they're not just met by Finnish troops, but tanks, aircraft, and naval vessels that have an American flag emblazoned on them. Putin's gone too far this time, and the United States will make him pay. This is one of the many possible scenarios that could unfold if Russia attacks Finland. The extent to which the United States would get involved in a conflict between Finland and Russia depends on what actions Putin takes. A full-scale invasion would elicit a very different reaction from the United States than a series of skirmishes along the border of the two nations. That being said, if Putin resorted to using nukes against Finland, the US response would be swift and catastrophic. Let's take a look at several different scenarios involving a war between Finland and Russia to see the extent to which the United States would go. Now before we get started, let's make one thing very, very clear. Attacking Finland is the last thing that Russia should be worried about right now. Russian forces are so consumed with the war in Ukraine that an invasion of another country would be unthinkable. Putin just doesn't have the manpower, weapons, or vehicles to wage another war without being crushed on multiple fronts. Therefore, he would literally have to be out of his mind to invade Finland. Although if anyone is crazy enough to invade a second country while losing a war they're already fighting, it would probably be Putin. Finland shares an 800-mile border with Russia, which is the longest of any nation in the European Union. This along with the fact that Russia and Finland have had a turbulent past has Finnish leaders a little on edge. Finland has a population of just over 5.5 million people, while Russia's population is around 143 million. However, it is important to remember that Russia is massive. In fact, Russia's landmass is around 51 times larger than Finland's. When all this is considered, it appears Finland would be on the losing side of any conflict between the two nations. But as we know from the war in Ukraine, size doesn't always matter. Finland's economy has been on an upward trend since 2015, and so is close to reaching $300 billion annually. The Russian economy, on the other hand, is starting to stall and eventually will go into crippling decline as the sanctions placed on Russia by the West take hold. These will cause long-lasting effects, and a lot of Russia's current and future economic problems can be traced back to the United States policies. The exact opposite can be said about the economic relationship between Finland and the US. Economic agreements between these two countries have only helped Finland's economy. When we look at the future of Russia and Finland, it seems that the latter is in a much better position than its neighbor. However, Vladimir Putin probably doesn't look at statistics or data before making decisions. At the very least, he tends to ignore information that does not confirm what he wants. Therefore, a Russian invasion of Finland might be driven by pure greed and paranoia rather than any type of strategic planning. So let's look at Finland's military and then focus on exactly what the United States would do to aid the Finnish defense forces if Russia ever attacked. The Finnish defense forces have been preparing to protect the nation from Russia ever since its conception. Finland gained independence from the Russian Empire in 1917, but quickly found itself once again under threat of invasion by the Soviet Union during World War II. Finland managed to maintain its sovereignty at the end of the war, but has been incredibly wary of its neighbor to the east ever since. The Finnish Air Force consists of around 166 aircraft, of which only 55 are fighters. More specifically, these planes are US McDonnell Douglas FA-18 Hornets. These are formidable aircraft, but it is the 64 Lockheed Martin F-35 Lightning IIs that Finland has on order that will really strengthen their military capabilities in the air. Finland also has around 240 tanks, most of which are Leopard 2s, often considered one of the most capable tanks in the world. They've also been shown to make quick work of older Soviet-era tanks, like the ones Russia's been using more and more in Ukraine as its stockpile of tanks quickly diminishes. 
Finland also has around 800 artillery guns and 75 MLRS vehicles. The Finnish Navy is pretty much non-existent, with around eight fast attack vessels and a handful of minesweepers. When compared to the Russian military, even in its weakened state, Finland is definitely outmanned and outgunned. But again, numbers aren't everything, and if a war ever broke out between the two nations, Finland would have some powerful allies, including the United States. The U.S. formally established diplomatic relations with Finland in 1919. Then in 1944, the U.S. severed its ties with Finland when the nation fought alongside Nazi Germany to protect itself from a Soviet invasion. However, once World War II ended, diplomatic relations between U.S. and Finland were once again re-established. During the Cold War, Finland's proximity to the USSR was of a particular interest to the United States. However, Finland was adamant about remaining neutral in the conflict and refused to openly aid the U.S. or allow nuclear weapons to be deployed within their borders. However, the Finnish government was much more invested in the West winning the Cold War than the Soviet Union. This is because it seemed likely a powerful Russia would eventually want to extend its borders further and Finland was a logical choice for a future invasion. The fear of a Soviet Union that could dominate Asia and Eastern Europe led to certain agreements and under-the-table dealings between the US and Finland. This helped strengthen the ties between the two governments. However, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the US ramped up its efforts to help support Finland in its non-alignment policies while also reinforcing their cultural and economic ties to the West. Basically, the US promoted any agreements that would bring Finland closer to NATO and Europe. And although it claimed to support the neutrality of Finland, the US government almost certainly had ulterior motives for Finland due to its strategic location. If Finland became more reliant on the US and Western powers, it was unlikely that communism or a similar form of authoritarian rule would take hold in the nation. And for the US and much of Europe, that was and is still the goal. Then in 2016, the United States and Finland signed a bilateral statement of intent. There were several objectives of this agreement. The first was to deepen bilateral and multilateral dialogue and defense policies. What this meant was the US wanted to start working more closely with Finland to ensure its military tactics and procedures were closely aligned with its own. In extension, this would set up Finland to join NATO more easily in the future since interoperability between militaries is a requirement for being accepted into the organization. The statement of intent would also increase the strategic information shared by both nations. Obviously, the one country that both Finland and the US were most concerned about was Russia, and therefore the information sharing likely had a lot to do with Finland's neighbor to the east and what they were up to. Another major aspect of the agreement was to increase the planning of joint training exercises which would not only benefit Finland's military but would also set the groundwork for US troops and vessels to be located in and around the area. The statement of intent included the United States' desire to increase armament cooperation in collaboration in research, development, test, and evaluation as well. With each aspect of this agreement, it became more and more clear that the US wanted to militarize Finland in a way that it could easily work with them in the future if their neighbor ever became aggressive. Everything that is discussed in the statement of intent between Finland and the United States seems to be set up to groom Finland to become part of NATO in the future. This itself could have been part of a plan of deterrence to keep Russia in check, but it also allowed the United States to be in a unique and strategic position to aid Finland if they ever went to war. The United States and Finland have also been in cooperation in peace support missions such as NATO-led operations in the Balkans, Afghanistan, and Iraq. It's hard to ignore just how much time, effort, and resources have gone into helping Finland grow its military and modernize its tactics. The United States has played a huge role in doing this, and therefore it would be very unlikely that they would sit by and do nothing if Russia ever invaded Finland. So in the current state of things, Finland and the United States have good relations, several trade agreements, and the US is heavily invested in maintaining the status quo of pro-Western ideologies and alliances in the country. This means that if Russia did invade Finland, the US would respond. The extent and severity of the response would be directly connected to the type of attack Russia initiates against Finland. Scenario 1. Russia invades Finland using similar tactics as in Ukraine. In this scenario, the United States would likely provide a huge amount of military, financial, and humanitarian aid to Finland. Again, the attacking force would likely be much weaker than the initial invasion of Ukraine because the war has taken a significant toll on the number of soldiers and weapons that Russia has at its disposal. That being said, the leadership of Russia has shown time and time again that they don't mind throwing huge numbers of inexperienced young men at another military force with the hopes of overwhelming them. In the past, this occasionally worked, but with devastating consequences 
in terms of casualties and resources lost. The United States, like the rest of the world, has learned a lot from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. If Russia began posturing and moving troops to the border of Finland, the US would not take such actions lightly. When Russia did this in Ukraine, the United States and the West threatened sanctions, which they later imposed. However, this obviously did not stop the invasion itself. Therefore, the US would likely take a much more aggressive approach if it seems that Russia was going to use tanks, armored vehicles, and troops to attack Finland. The United States would likely send similar types of weapons that they've proven to be effective in Ukraine. The great thing for both Finland and the US in this scenario is that they literally know what works well and what works really well against the Russian military. The US would send javelins to allow Finland's far inferior numbers to decimate Russian tanks and vehicles. The javelin is a fire and forget weapon because the missile locks onto its target before being launched. This means that when the Finnish troops fire at a Russian target, they can immediately fall back to cover even before the missile hits its mark. This would provide the Finns with excellent mobility and striking power that Russia would not be able to deal with. Like in Ukraine, the Finnish landscape would be littered with the husks of destroyed Russian tanks. Along with the Javelins, the US would also send M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or the HIMARS. The US Army identifies HIMARS as a full-spectrum, combat-proven, all-weather, 24-7, lethal and responsive wheeled precision strike weapon system. And at least in the war in Ukraine, this has been absolutely true. HIMARS can launch six long-range rockets either simultaneously or at different times, and then immediately move its position to get out of danger. The rocket's range is about 50 miles or between 70 to 80 kilometers. These vehicles would allow Finland to decimate any Russian forces within their borders and push them back out of their territory. The rockets are incredibly accurate and would allow the Finnish army to hit targets far behind the front lines, such as weapon caches or command outposts. And we've seen in recent months, the United States would almost certainly send tanks to Finland as well. A-1 Abrams could be used by Finland to launch their own offensives and quickly take back any territory that Russia's invaded. These tanks are state-of-the-art and could make quick work of entire battalions of Soviet-era tanks. Of course, the United States would also send guns, explosives, and artillery rounds just like they have in Ukraine. The United States may even take things a step further and provide Finland with more aircraft or at least expedite the delivery of the F-35 Lightning IIs that Finland's already purchased. What it comes down to is that the US would not hesitate to deliver military aid to Finland. As the war progressed in Ukraine, the US has ramped up its commitment to deliver weapons and vehicles that the Ukrainian military desperately needs. However, if Russia was to invade Finland, the response by the United States would likely be much more immediate. To put this into perspective, the United States has sent close to $80 billion in aid to Ukraine since the war began. The US has the largest economy in the world, and although $80 billion is a lot of money, it's only a drop in the bucket when it comes to the US defense spending. In 2021, the United States spent about $801 billion on its military. There is little doubt that Congress would pass a Finnish relief bill that would authorize huge sums of money and weapons to be sent to Finland if they were ever invaded by Russia. There's also the possibility that the United States would take a much more aggressive stance if Russia started to amass troops on the Finnish border. Rather than waiting until Russia invaded, the US could deploy its own forces in a joint operation with Finland, which would act as a deterrent for Russia. If Russia invaded and American troops were caught in the crossfire, it may be seen as an act of war against the US. They could claim that Russia was not only the aggressor but attacked American troops intentionally, allowing the US to declare war on Russia. This tactic has been used by NATO in recent months as they send more and more troops to countries that share a border with Ukraine. This has been done to stop any further progress Russia could make if it won the war. The moment Russia attacks a NATO force, either on purpose or by accident, all nations including the United States would declare war on Russia, and that's not a war Putin could win. And this brings up another interesting point about a Russian invasion of Finland. Sweden and Finland applied to join NATO in May of 2022. Neither country has been accepted yet due to Hungary and Turkey holding out on their ratification. However, there might be a way for the United States and NATO to get around this technicality if Finland were attacked. Finland is a member of the European Union. Until recently, Finland has tried to maintain its neutrality, but an aggressive Russia has caused them to drop that stance and seek alliances. Since the countries in the EU engage in the common security and defense policy, Finland could invoke this article if Russia attacked, which would bring other European nations to their aid. If Russia continues to wage war while other EU forces are in Finland, it could be considered an act of war against those nations, many of which are NATO members. This would inevitably trigger Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and every member of NATO would declare war on Russia, including the US. 
Ukraine was an EU candidate when Russia invaded, so it did not have the benefit of the common security and defense policy. Finland, however, is a much different story. They are currently a member of the European Union, which means if Russia invaded, it is highly probable the US would find some way to join the other European NATO members in declaring war against Russia. Scenario 2 Russia uses grey zone tactics and launches conventional missiles into Finland but does not invade. If Russia attacked Finland by firing missiles or disrupting its trading capabilities in the Baltic Sea through blockades, the US's response would likely be slightly different than if there was a full-on invasion. These disruption tactics would definitely cause concern, and if missiles were fired, Finland and the rest of NATO would certainly call it an act of war, but they might not retaliate with force. There would undoubtedly be a misinformation campaign by Russia saying the West was setting them up or the missiles were an accident, but in reality the rest of the world would know such an attack was meant to scare Finland and the rest of Europe into making concessions. This might have been more effective before the war in Ukraine, but if Russia tried to pull a stunt like this today, the US would have none of it. It's possible that, like with Taiwan, the US might openly state that if Russia continued to be aggressive or invaded Finland, the US would stand by them. This is not so much an alliance as a promise. In this case, the US would almost certainly deploy troops to Finland and NATO countries nearby in preparation for a retaliatory strike into Russia. This would be done to deter any further Russian aggression, and it would likely work as Putin knows that even at its strongest, the Russian military could never defeat the US. Perhaps one of the best indicators of what the US would do in this scenario is by looking at what they've already done. In November of 2022, President Joe Biden approved a $323 million arms sale to Finland. This sale included tactical missiles and joint standoff weapons, so it seems the US is already helping Finland prepare for a conflict with Russia. There's no other reason for Finland to procure tactical missiles from the US other than to mount a defense or act as a deterrent against a Russian attack. But things don't stop there. The US then approved an additional $380 million sale of missiles to Finland only days after the first arms deal went through. The second sale was possibly for Stinger anti-aircraft missile launchers and other similar equipment. As of right now, the US and Finland believe that a Russian attack by air is the most likely scenario if Putin dares to become aggressive against Finland. The United States released a statement explaining that the proposed sale will improve Finland's defense and deterrence capabilities. Finland intends to use these defense articles and services to increase its national stock. This critical platform will bolster the land and air defense capabilities in Europe's northern flank, supporting US-European command's top priorities. This makes it very clear that even though Russia is in no position to attack Finland, the United States and NATO are still proactively working to deter even the thought of Putin setting his sights on his Nordic neighbor. However, if the mad dictator decided to launch an attack anyway, Finland would already have some defenses ready to go, and there is little doubt that if the missiles were launched or aircraft were used by Russia to attack Finland, the US would make it one of its top priorities to get Finland the anti-air defense capabilities they need. It's also probable that the US would deploy more forces to the region, similar to scenario number one, to send a message to Russia if the attacks continue, things will escalate. It's hard to imagine a scenario where Russia becomes an aggressor and the US doesn't find a way to insert itself into the conflict in Finland. Both nations have already been actively working together to prepare for such a scenario that the foundation is already in place. The US is willing and able to play an active role in the defense of Finland if it ever comes to it. Scenario 3. Russia attacks Finland with nuclear weapons. This is definitely the most unlikely scenario, but one worth examining. Finland does not have any nuclear weapons within its borders, at least that we know of. Therefore, a nuclear strike against Finland would be met by a unified global response against Russia. Pretty much every nation in the world, including China, would condemn Russia's actions. The United States would immediately go on high alert, and every branch of the US nuclear triad would await striking orders. US submarines would deploy to strategic locations alongside the Russian coast. B-2 bombers would take to the air and infiltrate Russian airspace. Land-based ballistic missile command centers would double-check trajectories over the Arctic to ensure optimal accuracy. A nuclear launch against Finland would absolutely bring the US and Russia to the brink of war. Not to mention, the rest of NATO would also actively be arming their nukes just in case Putin decided to launch any more missiles. This would be an end of the world scenario. As we said, this is highly unlikely, but if the scenario ever did occur, the US would be at the forefront of bringing Putin and Russia to its knees. A Russian nuclear strike against Finland probably wouldn't result in World War III because China has made it clear it would not support Russia using nukes in Ukraine or in general. China itself has a strict defensive-only policy when it comes to using nuclear weapons, and no matter which way Putin spends it, launching a nuke at Finland would never be seen as a defensive action. 
North Korea might back Russia, but Finland, the US, and NATO have little to fear from North Korea. Japan and other East Asian countries that have closely allied themselves with the West would need to be slightly more wary. But North Korea's military capabilities are pretty limited as it mostly relies on old Soviet tech and nuclear missiles that may or may not achieve liftoff before detonating. It's also probable that China would keep North Korea in check if Russia launched a nuclear attack on Finland, as they do not want to see the world end in a nuclear holocaust either. So if Putin ever launched nukes at Finland, the US would not be the only country coming to their aid. It would likely be a worldwide effort to remove Putin from power and make sure no further nuclear weapons are deployed. However, if the US felt that Russia would launch more nukes at Finland, or any other part of the world for that matter, it might feel warranted to launch its own nuclear attack against Russia to send a clear message that they are done messing around. These strikes would target already known Russian launch sites to hopefully destroy them before more nukes can be used. This could result in a series of exchanges that would leave parts of the planet irradiated and result in the loss of countless lives. Scenario 4 The Most Likely Scenario Russia is too weak to attack Finland. Even if the US hadn't already engaged in providing support, weapons, and joint military operations with Finland, Russia is in no position to invade another country. It is badly losing the war in Ukraine thanks to the resolve of the Ukrainian people and the weapons sent by the West. Men are being conscripted from across Russia to be used as cannon fodder, as Putin desperately tries to hold on to the little territory Russia still controls in Ukraine. The scenarios discussed in this video would almost certainly lead to the Russian military being decimated, as they could not hope to fight two different countries simultaneously. Putin just doesn't have the strategic capabilities or resources at his disposal. And with each scenario, it's almost inevitable that the US would get involved in some way. The most likely outlook for the future of Russia right now is that they'll continue to fight in Ukraine until more Western tanks and weapons arrive, and the Ukrainian military eventually pushes them completely out of their country. At that point, Vladimir Putin will have to admit defeat, and the repercussions for his regime will be drastic. At the very least, he'll lose the faith of the Russian people and his power will be greatly diminished. There would be no hope for a Russian victory if it launched any type of attack against Finland. In fact, an attack against Finland would be the nail in the coffin for Russia as it would likely result in the US and members of the European Union taking a much more aggressive action or perhaps even declaring war on Russia. And since Russia can't defeat the much smaller Ukrainian military, it has no hope of winning a war against the US and its allies. So the probability of Russia attacking Finland is small. All. We'll never say never, as Vladimir Putin has clearly shown he's out of his mind, but if Russia ever did attack Finland, the United States' response would be swift and merciless. Vladimir Putin is sitting in his office, his top lip curled into a snarl. He's just been given his armed forces tanks inventory. The losses are staggering. The Russians were losing about 5 tanks a day earlier in the year, but it increased to 10 tanks a day after Ukraine's counteroffensives in the east and west. Legions of T-72s, T-80s, and T-90s have been destroyed. It's a nightmare for Putin. To suffer losses like that, the opposing side must have formidable weapons. As luck would have it, Ukraine has no shortage of them thanks to the West. The US providing aid to Ukraine is hardly anything new. The Ukraine-Russia-US story is a long and complicated one as to how these nations have interacted with each other, overtly and covertly, in recent years and long before the war. US help has been there for the right people for a while. Russia has also grown its influence in Ukraine and it's been that way, well, for a long time. In 2014, the US helped overthrow Ukraine's elected president, with Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland even being caught on the phone handpicking a new Ukrainian leader. So when we talk about US aid to Ukraine, it's a convoluted story going back way before the Russian invasion. The tale has many sides, which anyone paying taxes should arguably understand. The Russians have repeatedly said that the US has been dictating things behind the scenes, which has resulted in what they say is nothing more than a proxy war. The US has accused Russia of flagrant abuse of powers. Up until recently, Ukraine didn't take that much newspaper space, and when it was talked about, it was often in a positive light. Corruption and neo-Nazis often filled the stories. Now Putin is using neo-Nazi propaganda as justification for the invasion. There's the so-called realist account, as provided by the American political scientist John Mearsheimer, who believes the US has orchestrated the war for its own selfish reasons, pushing the world closer to a nuclear catastrophe. Mearsheimer doesn't get invited to many parties these days. He hasn't been on CNN for eons. Holding that view can make you a lot of enemies in the US and Ukraine. It'll get you called a Putin propagandist, especially when you say something like Mearsheimer told The New Yorker recently, we are going to blame the Russians, so we invented the story that Russia was bent on aggression in Eastern Europe. Mearsheimer is just one of the many vastly unpopular political experts who think the US has been pulling all the strings to cause havoc to Russia. 
They still think Putin is wrong though, they still blame him for what he has done. You'd have many more friends if you espoused another view, the corporate media view for the most part, which is that Putin won't stop until he's satisfied that Russia is as great as it was in the past. That Putin is the epitome of evil, he's out of control, he won't stop until Russia has built a new Russian empire, which is why he needs to be stopped, which is why Ukraine needs billions in aid paid for by all you taxpaying citizens. So, in some sense, this is why the US can give so much aid, and for the most part its citizens are okay with it. It's the same in other countries such as the UK, even if it is struggling right now. Today we're going to talk more about how the US is aiding Ukraine in the practical sense, and we'll leave out all the small print of the why part. Neither will we try to understand what Vladimir Putin is thinking. We will just say this though, we don't want to celebrate weapons and war. We don't want to make this show sound like weapon worship. The biggest losers in this conflict are the soldiers dying on both sides and the civilians suffering in large numbers. We only hope they'll find some amount of peace soon. As you'll see at the end, this could be wishful thinking. When you get to that end, if you pick a winner, you'll probably say the arms industry, the BAE systems of this world, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, the Raytheon's, their shareholders are also winning, which happen to include some members of Congress and some members of the UK Parliament. You can't ignore that either when it comes to aid. Over $100 billion in aid to Ukraine has been spent so far by all countries, but expect that to shoot up as the weeks and months pass. Most of it has been and will be military aid. It's not all about weapons though, it's about food, clothing, infrastructure and more. This is humanitarian aid after all. If you add up all the aid provided by the US, the New York Times says the package is $54 billion, but that was back in May. Things have changed since then as you'll soon see, still that number is more or less correct. Just to put matters into perspective, last year the US government spent $43 billion on highway grants, $63 billion on public housing, $260 billion on education, and $56 billion on health insurance premium tax credits. You might now think the US's $54 billion is an immense amount, but in terms of their GDPs, Estonia, Latvia, and Poland have spent more than the US on Ukraine aid. In order, Lithuania, the UK, and Canada came after the US. In terms of US aid, $12.5 billion has gone to providing weapons or other supplies, $9.4 billion has gone to economic aid, and $6 billion on military and security assistance, $7 billion to food assistance and healthcare, $4.7 billion on grants and loans for military supplies, and $8.1 billion on military deployments and intelligence. It's surprising how many countries are helping out Ukraine. The number is around 50. We bet you didn't know that Argentina has just sent 1,700 tons of foodstuffs, medicine, and clothing to Ukraine. Bulgaria has also just sent over 2,000 helmets and 2,000 bulletproof vests. But tens of millions in aid is coming from many other nations, and for the wealthier ones the aid is in the billions. France has sent Ukraine some top-notch military equipment, and we're talking about enough weapons and machinery to start a small war. It's the same with the UK. It sent a whole host of weapons to Ukraine including thousands of anti-armor weapons and Javelin anti-tank missiles. It spent $54 million alone on Ukraine-bound Black Hornet nano drones. God only knows how they'll be used. We told you business was booming for the arms industry, revenues have shot up, records are being broken as heads, legs, and chests are blown asunder. The profits of the people that make it possible have literally never been so good. In terms of raw numbers, the US is not only the biggest aid provider to Ukraine right now, followed by the UK, Poland, and Germany, but it's the biggest provider of military aid to nations worldwide. While humanitarian aid pales in comparison, the US is also the world leader in that regard. 8.2 billion for 2021, followed by Germany at 1.8 billion, the EU at 1.5 billion, and the UK at 840 million. The US's military aid comes from the budget of the Department of Defense, which as you know is a huge budget. It's 722 billion for 2022, and the DoD has requested that to be raised to 813 billion for 2023. The US defense budget started to increase drastically in 2001 when it was 331 billion dollars. In 2005, it reached $533 billion. It wasn't even $100 billion in the late 60s and early 70s when the US was fighting in Vietnam and secretly bombing the hell out of Laos and Cambodia. Still, in terms of inflation, the 1969 defense budget would be $679 billion in today's money. We'll talk about some new numbers soon, but first, we need to ask how the US actually sends so many weapons to Ukraine. We mean in logistical terms, the answer is twofold. One way is by air. For instance, the US's giant air transport planes can transport an insane amount, with the Super Galaxy being able to carry 130 tons of equipment. 
That means you could pack it with two M1A2 Abrams main battle tanks, or as many as 10 armored vehicles, or perhaps 16 high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, aka Humvees. Having a few military transport planes flying every week will help, but in August 2022, the Washington Post said the Pentagon was expanding its use of maritime shipping. The Pentagon obviously won't say what routes those ships will be using, but did say that many of the weapons will go straight to Ukraine, while others will add to stocks already in other European countries. We guess you can now see why Russia has been losing so many tanks. It seems the entire world has Ukraine's back. Even China, which some say is taking the side of Russia, has remained neutral and isn't sending Russia any military aid. The bad news, or the very worst news, would be if things got nuclear, because Russia could hold its own. That's scary, and some analysts don't count out nuclear war. Now let's look at some of the weapons the US has already sent to Ukraine. At the top of the list, we'll put the 1400 or so Stinger anti-aircraft systems. Anti-aircraft weapons have been very useful and have already taken out a number of aircraft on both sides. On October 1st, an anti-air missile shot a Russian Ka-52 attack helicopter to pieces in Zaporizhia Oblast, but we can't say exactly what weapon was used. The US has also sent about 8500 Javelin anti-armor systems. News reports tell us that these things have been partly responsible for all the damage to Russian tanks that we talked about in the intro. Raytheon and Lockheed Martin have been busy making these things while the US sent around 32,000 units of different types of anti-armor systems. The list of weapons goes on and on, but let's just mention a few more things that have been sent already. One package included 20 Mi-17 helicopters. On top of this, there were 200 Max Pro mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles, eight National Advanced Surface-to-Air Missile Systems, hundreds of armored high-mobility multi-purpose wheeled vehicles, and 200 M113 armored personnel carriers. Then you have things such as counter-unmanned aerial systems, air surveillance radars, patrol boats, night vision devices, thermal imagery systems, satellite imagery systems, cold weather gear, electronic jamming equipment, explosive ordnance disposal protective gear, and much more. It's still not enough, according to the US media. Some more recent items talked about in the media that we think are part of the $54 billion budget include artillery and coastal defense weapons, ammunition for the artillery, and a bunch more advanced rocket systems. Now, we imagine you can really understand Russia's tank problem. Analysts are saying that the recent losses for Russia have been nothing short of astounding. On October 19th, the country lost 1,392 tanks, 801 were destroyed, and the rest were just abandoned or were taken without being hit. Ukraine has also lost tanks, but not anywhere near as many. We should also add that Russia hasn't reported its losses, though the news comes from the Western media. Never mind how cynical you think it sounds, you should always question what's reported in terms of wins and losses in wars. Throughout modern history, the numbers have been cooked up with propaganda to placate and buck up the public. We're not saying that's the case here, but just bear that in mind. Russia will be doing the same, of course. It doesn't help that Russia has been using tanks from the 60s and 70s. The T-62 is so old that one of the abandoned tanks was found and inside it someone has written, I hate Nixon. Just kidding, but you get the idea. Modern tanks are far less exposed than older ones. According to Forbes, Ukraine now has quite the collection of captured T-62s. As for what Ukraine wants more of, not long ago it put in a request for high-mobility artillery rocket systems. These things, which will set you back about $3.8 million apiece, come from Lockheed Martin, are incredibly useful despite some reports of civilian casualties. Some members of the Taliban might also have been hurt, of course, although according to the International Security Assistance Force, the rockets were 300 meters off their targets. Despite the misses, military experts called HIMARS indispensable, or as one website said, combat-proven all-weather 24-7 lethal and responsive weapons. And that's why Ukraine has them on its Christmas list. As part of that same package, the US said it would also send some M777 howitzers, 18 of them, each weighing in at $3.7 million created by the British company BAE Systems. Recently, Ukraine said it needed longer-range weapons since Russia already had them. Obviously, it doesn't help if the enemy can hit you from further away. A Ukrainian presidential advisor explained it's hard to fight when you're attacked from 70 kilometers away and have nothing to fight back with. Ukraine can return Russia behind the Iron Curtain, but we need effective weapons for that. The BBC reported in September that the US had agreed to send new aid, this time amounting to around $2.7 billion. The BBC said the package would include howitzers, munitions, Humvee vehicles, armored ambulances, and anti-tank systems. Again, we can't tell you if this is already part of the $54 billion aid package or a bit added to it. We say a bit. $2.7 billion is hardly just a drop in the ocean of blood. It was agreed anyway without much opposition at all. As usual, the added money was greenlit by both sides of the US's political divide. This war and the attendant aid is about the only thing Democrats and Republicans can agree on for the most part. 
This is another reason why the aid can keep flowing. No one's against it, although not everyone feels the same about the situation. As you might know, former presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard just left the Democrat Party. She's taken an anti-war stance and just called the Democrats an elitist cabal of warmongers. She is in a very small minority of US politicians, and if you look at her Twitter page, half the public likes to call her a traitor. The highly critical Noam Chomsky take on the US foreign policy is not exactly embraced these days by the leaders of the free world. At a sprightly 93, Chomsky's no fan of both sides of US politics in their present guises. He'd prefer real diplomacy to happen in Ukraine, which might not happen anytime soon. No one in their right mind would be a fan of Putin, so you have to wonder how this will all end. Endless war seems to be in the cards. If any entity is thrilled about this, it's the military-industrial complex, not the actual people fighting and dying. In an interview, Chomsky recently talked about the utter incompetence of the Russian military, but he issued a warning about the Western media narrative, saying, Whenever there is a virtual unanimity on complex and murky issues, something is afoot, something is missing. Another former war correspondent and journalist said, We are either looking at endless war or a potential nuclear holocaust. This will likely mean that next year there will be more billions in aid, which, short of everyone shaking hands and making some deals, is the best outcome. The other outcome is the end of the world as we know it. Millions upon millions dead. How do we ever get to this? Again, that's a long, difficult story that's more complicated than some narratives suggest. This is a show about aid, but what does aid mean? It means death and destruction, so fittingly, we'll leave you with a sobering reflection from Chomsky. Unless the great powers find ways to accommodate and confront the most important threats that have arisen in human history, environmental destruction and nuclear war, nothing else will matter, and time is short. Since the start of Cold War 2.0, after Russia invaded Ukraine, Western media has become fixated on the nuclear capabilities of the Russian Federation. After all, with Putin continually making thinly veiled threats about using so-called tactical nuclear weapons, it's no wonder that people are concerned. As it turns out, those concerns are pretty valid. Due to considerable differences in Russian strategic strategy, though the overall number of known warheads remains stable, Russia has committed to modernizing its nuclear forces over the past decade. They're getting so good at this point that many suggest Russia has become a bigger nuclear power than the United States. According to known public information, the US and Russia are almost equal for reported nuclear warheads. As of 2022, Russia owns 5,977 warheads, while the US has 5,428 in its arsenal. The US actually has a slight advantage due to its number of forward-deployed nuclear warheads. For a weapon to be forward-deployed, it must be available on submarines, aircraft, and forward-launching sites in other countries. The US has 1,644 of these types of warheads, while Russia is just behind with 1,588. However, Russia does have almost a thousand more warheads in storage than the US. Warheads in storage can still be mounted on delivery systems and deployed. Why Russia has more available for its use is because the US has a backlog of older warheads waiting to be destroyed. Even though the official numbers are pretty evenly matched, in real life Russian and American nuclear capabilities are vastly different. While both countries maintain a strategic land, air, and sea nuclear triad, Russia has pursued an aggressive campaign of weapon modernization over the past 15 years, while the US has lagged behind. This is primarily because of the strategic differences between the two countries. There is much debate over exactly what Russia's nuclear strategy is and what it is not. However, there are a few points that people on both sides of the argument have agreed on. Firstly, Russia recognizes even before its disastrous war in Ukraine that its military is rather weak. Throughout the entire history of the Soviet Union, the Red Army has to rely on a steady stream of less than eager conscripts each year to man its military. Even after the USSR fell in 1991, the Russian Federation has tried and failed numerous times to transition to an all-volunteer force. Poor pay, appalling living conditions, and inhuman treatment by superiors have continued to plague the Russian army to this day. Because of this, most of its personnel and the Russian armed forces are unmotivated and poorly trained conscripts. Even though Russia recognized that it had to improve the quality of life for its troops after the Russian invasion of Georgia in 2008, little has changed. The poor state of the military's combat effectiveness has not gone unnoticed, even at the highest levels of the Russian government. Because the Russian army would have been outgunned and outmotivated in a conventional war with the US and NATO forces, Russian politicians have decided they would use nuclear weapons to bolster their power in a conventional armed conflict. If regular Russian forces faced imminent defeat on the battlefield, the doctrine of using a low-yield or tactical nuclear weapon would take effect, but more on tactical nuclear weapons later. 
Scholars also agree that another unspoken but official reason Russia has pursued aggressive nuclear modernization is to protect itself from a war against China. Due to China's sheer number advantage over Russia, many agree that Russia would use nuclear weapons to offset this advantage. But in regards to the US, many believe Russian strategic doctrine calls for defeating American nuclear capabilities, so a retaliatory strike would be impossible. This hotly debated topic would involve this possible scenario. In the event of an imminent nuclear war, Russia would make the first strike, and Russian missile forces, submarines, and aircraft would all launch strikes against US missile silos and airbases. Though submarines would still survive, the strategic effect of a strike aimed at preventing the US from striking back would hope to make the US surrender without a fight. An even more controversial theory is the belief that Russia might escalate to de-escalate. What that entails is using a nuclear weapon, whether strategic or tactical, against a state not directly involved in fighting but that might be supporting the conflict. Known as a bolt from the blue attack, this attack would deter other nations from getting involved in the war Russia's fighting. It remains unclear if Russia would ever seriously consider this strategy, but the fact that it's ever been debated in Russian circles is a scary thought. What is definitely not up for debate, though, has been the weapon modernization program Russia has gone on since 2008. Throughout the Cold War, both the US and Russia continued to produce nuclear weapons at a fever pitch. It was not until the 90s that both nations agreed to reduce their nuclear arsenals drastically. Over the next two decades, the US and Russia greatly reduced their Cold War stockpiles. However, Russia has opted to entirely replace its nuclear stockpile with modern weapons, while the US has decided to maintain current inventories. Russia has continued to develop a variety of known and claimed weapon systems that some argue beat out US capabilities. One of the most potent is the avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle. A hypersonic glide vehicle is the way of the future in missile technology because these missiles can travel at 10, 20, or even 30 times the speed of sound, and they aim to defeat any air defense system by simply being too fast to attack. Combined with advances in flight paths causing the missiles to weave and change course mid-flight, it means these are the wonder weapons of the future. Though much debate has been surrounding the avant-garde, it's not known if it's operational yet. However, though the US has been experimenting with hypersonic missiles, military officials have never proposed to make them nuclear-armed. Russia has explicitly stated that the avant-garde will be a nuclear missile. Even though the avant-garde is still a few years away from operational deployment, Russia is developing several terrifying nuclear weapons. Among them include an RS-28 Sarmat. The Sarmat aims to replace the aging Soviet missiles that still make up the bulk of the Russian nuclear forces. The Sarmat is a deadly weapon system that can fly faster and farther than any previous silo-based nuclear missile. Traveling an impressive 18,000 kilometers, the Sarmat is designed to defeat current and projected air defense systems. Due to its shortened boost phase, satellites would have difficulty tracking the missile. Russian planners are also believed to have programmed the missiles to fly to the North or South Pole to bypass US Navy destroyers poised to shoot them down. The Sarmat also carries an impressive 10 to 15 warheads, known as multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicles. One Sarmat missile can carry enough nuclear ordnance to destroy at least 10 targets. While MIRVs are not a new concept and have been around for decades, US use of that technology is now non-existent. Before President Obama took power, the US did have the capability of having MIRVs on Minuteman 3 missiles. However, as part of his attempt at a good faith relation with Russia, President Obama ordered that US missiles be capable of carrying just one nuclear warhead each. By 2014, all US missiles now carry just one warhead. However, the US still retains the capability to add more warheads if the government wants to, since no binding treaty forces the US to do this. But a weapon even scarier than these two is the Burevesnik nuclear-powered cruise missile. Being propelled by an onboard nuclear reactor, the Russians claim the missile will have unlimited range and reach speeds never seen before. Being able to constantly change direction and loiter indefinitely, the missile is a wonder weapon. The only problem is the US already tried this back in the 1950s and then quickly shut down the program when it realized how ecologically destructive this weapon would be. A nuclear-powered missile would spew radiation across the countryside as it traveled, a feature briefly seen as a positive by some US military planners who quickly realized if they made this weapon, then the Soviets would respond in kind. Though the Burevesnik will probably never see operational use, both the Sarmat and the Avangard constitute developments in Russian strategic nuclear weapons that pose a real threat to US sovereignty. The US has opted not to produce any new nuclear weapons during this time. 
Instead, the U.S. government has decided to perform midlife extensions programs on existing ordnance. U.S. defense contractors have been busy updating the Air Force's unguided bombs and silo-based missiles for the past several years. However, it was not until the past few years that Congress and the military took talks of funding new nuclear weapon projects seriously. Currently, Congress has agreed that there is a desire to produce a new ICBM. Still, no date has been set to begin funding for research, much less reaching operational capability. Another great tool Russia has that the U.S. is reluctant to add to its inventory is a tactical nuclear weapon. There's no official definition for tactical nuclear weapons. Still, the general consensus is these are nuclear weapons that are capable of being fired from land, sea, and air platforms, whose intended purpose is to create a tactical advantage on the battlefield rather than destroy cities. Though the U.S. and NATO have consistently warned that any nuclear weapon of any yield would be treated as a strategic strike, Russia fundamentally disagrees with this notion. Going back to its Cold War days, the Russian military knows that in an actual conflict, its planes, ships, and ground forces are just not as good as what the West can muster. To close this technological gap, Russia has equipped all its forces with nuclear capabilities for use against conventional targets. Among the most prolific tactical nuclear weapons are the Iskander and Kaliber missile systems. These two missile systems are now a mainstay in Russian military units. While the Army has fixed and mobile launch platforms for Iskander missiles, the Navy and Air Force both can launch Caliber missiles. Both missiles can be fitted with conventional or nuclear warheads, and Russian Navy ships and submarines could decimate NATO ships with low-yield nuclear weapons in a conflict. The U.S. has made some advances in tactical nuclear weapons. Just two years ago, Congress approved funding to produce 5 to 7 kiloton nuclear warheads for use on Trident II missiles. Known as the W-76, these warheads are the only nuclear weapons in the U.S. inventory that could be considered tactical. Such a shift in policy shows the U.S. has taken concerns about using tactical nuclear weapons seriously. However, Russia still fields a massive tactical arsenal. Estimates range from a few hundred to almost 6,000 tactical weapons. Because treaties do not talk about or track these kind of weapons, Russia has been producing them and not reporting their existence. Because of that, there's a lot of mystery surrounding what the Russians actually have. One example of a known tactical weapon is a nuclear-tipped S-200 and S-300 missile. Why Russia would put nuclear warheads on anti-air systems is due to a lack of precision. If Russia really needs to shoot something down, they want to ensure a kill. Shooting a nuclear missile at the inbound missile or aircraft makes up for the lack of adequate radars or training. Russian forces also boast some unique capabilities. For example, the Russian Navy claims it's developing an autonomous nuclear vehicle that can be deployed from submarines and is capable of creating nuclear tsunamis. Russian naval units allegedly possess nuclear torpedoes, depth charges, and anti-submarine rockets. Many of these were leftover Soviet weapons that Russia has decided to keep in stock. As for the U.S., it remains unclear if the government will procure more tactical nuclear weapons. But what is clear is that if a real war broke out, the U.S. would be at a serious disadvantage if Russian developments pan out as promised. A column of Ukrainian armored vehicles accompanied by tanks approaches their ready positions, prepared for a fresh assault into the Russian defenses outside Kherson. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has been wildly successful, beyond even the scope of the most optimistic military planners. Russia can't hold the line against Ukrainian grit and firepower, and its troops are on steady retreat across the entire Eastern Front. On Friday, September 30, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin had annexed four regions of Ukraine, declaring them Russian territory. This now allows him to use all available means at his disposal to neutralize the Ukrainian counterattack. Now, with his back against the wall, Vladimir Putin becomes the second person in history to order the use of nuclear weapons in war. A brilliant fireball lights up the night sky, incinerating the column of Ukrainian vehicles. Even inside their armored shells, the Ukrainian soldiers are killed instantly. Those who were far enough away to survive the heat and blast are killed by the radiation bombarding their bodies. Several hundred Ukrainian soldiers and a few dozen vehicles are destroyed. The attack has been largely insignificant in terms of military value. Ukrainian forces have mastered the tactic of dispersing and reuniting again for sudden offensives, but it sends a clear message to Ukraine and the rest of the world. Thousands of miles above the planet, a United States satellite, part of the American Space Surveillance Network, detects the distinct double flash of a nuclear explosion. The alarm is instantly relayed via communication satellites using the Secure Link 16 encrypted radio frequency system. Within 30 seconds of detection, the alarm has already reached a U.S. Space Force monitoring station in North America and similar offices around the NATO alliance. Minutes later, the alert reaches the desk of U.S. President Joe Biden. 
Picking up a secure phone, he dials a direct connection to General Mark A. Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the most powerful military officer on the planet. President Biden speaks only three words into the receiver, Execute Plan 36. The coded order is relayed via U.S. communication satellite to Stuttgart, Germany, and the office of the commander of U.S. European Command General Christopher G. Cavoli. Within minutes, the authenticated order is transmitted to U.S. forces in RAF Bentwaters and RAF Lakenheath inside England. A separate communique is dispatched to the USS supercarrier George H.W. Bush, currently stationed in the Mediterranean. The Bush is loitering in waters off the southern coast of Turkey, and the ship immediately turns into the wind as its flight deck erupts in a flurry of activity. Ever since Putin's threats of using nuclear weapons, the American military has been prepared to respond. Beneath the deck of the Bush, F-18 Super Hornets are having AIM-160 MALDs attached to wing hardpoints. Each Hornet can carry two of the large weapons, a capability kept secret from the world until now. Two squadrons of the high-performance aircraft are quickly made ready and begin the journey the flight deck above where they stand ready. In England, crews rush to man a fleet of eight B-52 Stratofortress bombers. The big planes are the backbone of the U.S. bomber fleet and can bring a frighteningly large amount of firepower to bear thousands of miles away. Joining them are four B-2 bombers also kept on alert status, their crews ready to go at a moment's notice with bellies full of weapons. Within 15 minutes, the first planes are taking to the sky and turning southeast toward mainland Europe. Two hours later, the bomber fleet links up with two squadrons of U.S. Air Force F-22 Raptors, taking off from bases in Germany. The Raptors are flying in stealth configuration, which means their wing pylons are clean of weapons. The internal weapons bay, however, is loaded with six AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and two AIM-9 short-range missiles in the side bays. The formation continues toward the Black Sea, the F-22s leading the way. An hour later, the F-22s link up with a loitering U.S. Air Force tanker aircraft in order to top off their fuel stores. The B-52s loiter as the F-22s refuel. With enough capacity to fly strike missions in Europe from their home bases in America, the B-52s have no need to refuel. As the F-22s refuel, NATO AWACS aircraft flying along the Ukrainian and Turkish coasts sweep the skies with their powerful radar, looking for any potential hostile targets that could pose a problem for the mission. The aircraft's powerful radar only has a range just above 250 miles, so they can only see across approximately half of the Black Sea. Soon, they'll move for a closer look, but in order to maintain the element of surprise, the AWACS stick to their normal flight pattern instituted at start of the Ukraine war. The F-22's refueling, however, is the signal for the USS Bush to begin launching her Super Hornets. One by one, the high-performance strike fighters take to the sky, their compatriots wheeling in the skies above the carrier strike group and waiting until both squadrons have taken to the air. Then the planes split into two groups, taking similar but distinct routes north and into Turkish airspace. One route will take the group west of Ankara, while another will take the other group over Sivas. An hour later, both squadrons pivot northeast, heading straight for the Black Sea. The B-52s, B-2s, and F-22s have now reached the Black Sea. The United States' operation to punish Russia for its use of nuclear weapons is a go. The B-2s take the lead now. The entire formation has turned south and then east again, which will allow it to skirt Crimea by 70 or so miles, well out of the effective range of Russian air defenses in the region. The target is Novorossiysk and the Russian naval base located there. After the sinking of the Moskva, the Russian Black Sea Fleet has moved its largest surface combat vessels here in order to keep them out of range of Western anti-ship weapons provided to Ukraine. The AWACS aircraft have shattered the formation, sweeping the skies with their powerful long-range radar. The job is to look for enemy fighters, thus allowing the accompanying F-22s to operate without their own search radars on, ensuring their stealth. However, the powerful radar is being picked up by Russian sensors in Crimea. The Russians now know that an attack is coming. NATO hasn't deviated in any significant way from its pre-announced patrol routes for months, and the only reason an AWACS aircraft could be approaching Russian shores is if it's backing up a major air attack. It's not long before the AWACS planes pick up the signature of multiple Russian fighters taking to the skies. The data is relayed via data link to the Raptors, who stand ready to greet the Russian challengers. It's now time for the Super Hornets to do their part. Skirting along the very edge of Russian long-range radar, the Hornets fire off their MALDs one by one. In minutes, 40 of the big missiles are screaming straight at mainland Russia. But the weapons aren't bombs. The miniature air launch decoy is an advanced drone that can perfectly replicate the radar return of nearly any aircraft in NATO's arsenal. Currently, the decoys are spoofing Russian radar returns to convince them a flight of B-52 bombers is incoming from the direction of Turkey, escorted by F-18s. This is a credible threat. The U.S. maintains multiple air bases in one of NATO's most geographically strategic allies. Payloads away, the Hornets turn around and head for the the bush. 
Russian long-range air defense radar in Crimea has spotted the real B-52s, but the appearance of a flight of B-52s escorted by F-18s incoming from Turkey is a more pressing threat. Russian ground crews have been scrambling to put three squadrons of interceptors into the air. Now a squadron consisting of a combination of MiG-29s and MiG-31s are wheeling south from air bases in Crimea and the Russian mainland. The jets are in full afterburner mode which consumes fuel at a frightening rate but pushes them to supersonic speeds. They must get to within 70 nautical miles of the incoming B-52s so they can intercept them with their long-range air-to-air missiles. The R-77-1s, NATO codename Adder, are inferior in range to their American AIM-120 counterparts, with only a range of 68 miles. This is roughly the range of the expected harpoons carried by the American B-52s, who have a range of around 75 nautical miles. Russia always doubted the US would respond with its own nukes, and this only left one possible target for American vengeance, the Russian Black Sea Fleet. An alert reaches the Russian vessels and waters just off of Novorossiysk. The fleet currently consists of the guided missile frigates Ladny, Admiral Essen, and Admiral Makarov, which has taken the role of fleet flagship after the loss of the Moskva. Landing ships Nikolai Filchenkov, Orsk, Azov, Novocherkask, Cesar Kunikov, and Yamal are all at dock. The smaller guided missile corvettes Vyshny Volaychok, Samum, Ingushetia, and Gravuron take up stations around the frigates. This is the bulk of the Russian Black Sea Fleet currently in operation, with a few vessels on duty in the Mediterranean. US Navy submarines and F-15 Strike Eagles from Europe are already en route to destroy them. The entire fleet turns with their noses parallel to the incoming threat. This will allow each ship's SeaWiz systems maximum opportunity to engage any missiles that penetrate long-range air defenses. S-300 and S-400 batteries along Russia's eastern Black Sea coast open fire on the incoming decoys. The decoys are easily within the 242-mile range of both systems for targets with a radar return as large as a B-52. The number of incomings is overwhelming. This is a major American air assault, and the air defense batteries expend most of their missiles. The vessels of the Black Sea Fleet opt to let the shore units do their work and focus on defending against any aircraft or missiles which slip past. American B-2 stealth bombers open up with AGM-158 CLRASM anti-ship missiles, the planned replacement for the Harpoon. The US military still operates only a small number of the weapons and only recently adapted them for use with a B-2. Each of the four B-2s unleash a volley of 16 of these low-observable anti-ship missiles, and Russian radar screens light up as they detect the 64 incoming missiles. The attack is a complete surprise, and the missiles are moving so fast that shore-based air defense batteries have no chance of catching the missiles before they reach their targets. The fleet is on its own to defend against the attack. But the LRASM's low observable features is making the missiles difficult to target. To make matters worse, their missiles now dive toward the ocean, flying just above the water as they scream toward their targets. The missiles are within several dozen nautical miles before Russian radars can not just detect them, but target them. The Russian ships immediately fire off decoys. These immediately begin to fire off electronic signals meant to be more powerful than those emitted by real vessels, thus luring in anti-ship missiles to strike them instead. However, the American missiles are built with optical target recognition systems, ensuring that the weapons can tell the difference between decoys and the real thing. At just over three dozen miles, the Russian radars finally can target the LRASMs, and the frigates are the first to open up with long-range surface-to-air missiles. It's like trying to hit a speeding bullet with another bullet, and the LRASMs can be difficult to target. Of the 64 incoming missiles, 16 are struck and destroyed. With just miles left to go, the corvettes open up with short-range Komar missiles. These missiles have a much smaller warhead, but several manage to strike true. Another eight LRASMs are knocked out of action. The American weapons now enter the terminal attack phase and suddenly pitch up, climbing high into the sky. More Russian anti-air missiles fly out to try to swat them out of the air. Another six LRASMs turn to fiery wrecks. Each missile identifies its own target, prioritizing the larger frigates. The sky fills with tungsten from the frigate SeaWiz systems. Ten more LRASMs are destroyed before striking true, but 22 find their targets. The 1,000-pound warheads slam into the Russian frigates. The Admiral Essen takes 10 of the missiles. She's already destroyed by the time the last three slam into her, but the missiles aren't smart enough to identify lethal battle damage. The Ladny only takes two and remains afloat with moderate damage. Admiral Makarov takes six LRASMs to the deck. The rest of the weapons either strike the smaller corvettes or explode in the water, missing their targets. Only two of the Russian frigates remain alive, along with three of the corvettes. Two Russian ships are quickly sinking below the waves. The attacking B-2s turn around and head for home, visible on Russian radar only for a moment as each bomber opened its bay doors. 
To the south of the fleet, the Russian interceptors are now in range to engage the MALDs and open up with R-77 missiles, ripple firing at the incoming formation. Each missile will find its own target, and with such a dense concentration of forces, should have no problem striking true. The Russian fighters are rapidly turning and burning for home. Fully aware that American AIM-160s have a longer range than them, the lead Hornet should have opened fire by now, yet strangely no incoming missile threats are detected on radar. Reporting this to ground control, Russian commanders are beginning to grow suspicious. A second wave of interceptors is redirected west toward the incoming flight of eight B-52s. This happens to put them directly on course to intercept the B-2s, who are slow and vulnerable. In full afterburner, the Russian fighters will soon be in range of not just detecting but targeting of the stealthy aircraft. Right now, their focus are the big American bombers, who are completely vulnerable and helpless. Radar detects no accompanying fighters, which makes the Russian pilots very nervous. There are only two possibilities here. The eight B-52s are actually decoys, and the main attack is the 40 aircraft formation to the south, or the attack from the south is the decoy and this is the real thing. If the latter is the case, there can only be one reason why radar isn't detecting any accompanying fighters. The US has put its F-35s or F-22s into the fight. The intercepting fighters get their answer shortly after entering the Black Sea. The F-22s have skirted out into the Black Sea and away from the shore, keeping out of range of shore-based radar which can detect them within 100 or so miles. The Russian interceptors have even weaker radar and can only begin to pick up traces of the stealth fighters within 50 or so miles, but can only get good targeting locks from a few dozen miles away. The F-22s turn on their own targeting radar long enough to get a solid lock on the incoming Russian MiGs. On their radars, the Russians detect only a brief blip, as each F-22 rapidly volley fires their AIM-120Ds. The AIM-120Ds have a classified range, easily in excess of 100 nautical miles, and the MiGs don't even get to within range of the B-52s before they're forced to take evasive actions from the incoming missiles. Each missile has flown high into the sky immediately after firing, and now plummets down on the Russian fighters. Each pilot tries to notch the incoming missile but most of them strike true. The surviving fighters are forced to turn around at full afterburner, but the Raptors already have loosed another volley of aims at them to encourage them to retreat. The only way to defeat the American stealth fighters is to overwhelm them with numbers and absorb their long-range missile attacks. Once at close range, the Raptors would have been at a disadvantage. But the Hornet-launched decoys fooled the Russians into splitting their forces. With the skies free of enemy fighters, the B-52s are safe to get within 75 nautical miles of the surviving Russian vessels and loose their harpoons. 96 anti-ship missiles are soon screaming toward the Russian ships. The frigates immediately respond with their long-range air defense missiles. The harpoons are far older technology and don't have the same low observability features of the LRASM. Long-range air defense managed to take out 20 of the incoming missiles as the harpoons get within a dozen miles of the ships. Then the corvettes open up with their shorter-range missiles. Each ship is rapidly volley firing their entire missile stock, knowing their lives depend on it. 20 more of the harpoons are knocked out before they get into range of the fleet Sea Whiz. Tungsten once more fills the sky as a wall of lead rises up to greet the incoming missiles. 22 more harpoons are knocked out, either by missiles or Sea Whiz. Decoys manage to lure away a dozen or so of the harpoons, but 22 of the surviving missiles strike true. The 500-pound warheads smash into the corvettes and frigates, most of which have already been damaged by the LRASMs. Despite having half the warheads of the previous rocket volley, the blitz of missiles is lethal. As the B-52s head for home, Russia sends up more interceptors to take on the flight of MALDs to the south. The decoys are easily blown out of the sky by air and ground-based defenses, but all that does is expend precious resources Russia can no longer easily replenish. Their job is done. They succeeded in diverting Russian attention south and splitting up its interceptors. The Russian Black Sea Fleet has been destroyed. All that remains is four submarines which Russia doesn't dare put to sea for fear of being targeted and a complement of landing and support craft. The surface combat vessels were the important targets, and Russia suffered an irreplaceable loss. In the span of an hour, it went from the dominant military power in the Black Sea to the weakest. Blockades of Ukrainian ports are no longer possible, and Russia has been punished for its use of nuclear weapons with the loss of hundreds of sailors and billions of dollars in hardware. What remains to be seen is if the deterrent has been effective or if President Vladimir Putin will resort to even greater use of nuclear weapons as retaliation. If so, the United States stands ready with its allies to respond with either conventional or nuclear power. Miss Adams stares out at the confused looks the high schoolers in her classroom have on their faces. She lets out a sigh of exasperation. Let me explain one more time, she says, turning to the map on the wall and pointing to Eastern Europe. Ukraine gained independence. Before she can finish her thought, a strange sound fills the classroom. It's the sound of a siren. The shrill noise is dull at first, but as the dust from decades of neglect works its way out of the system, the siren becomes louder. What is that? The students say, looking around the room. 
Miss Adams looks out the window. All is quiet. She walks over to the door and opens it. There's no one in the hallway. Slowly, the other doors start to open, and her colleagues peer their heads out. The teacher in the room next door shrugs. Miss Adams walks back into the classroom and shuts the door behind her. She looks at her class. They shift in their seats. Is it a fire alarm? Someone asks. But that doesn't seem right. There are no flashing lights, and a fire drill wasn't in the plan for today. Everything's fine, she tells the kids. But everything doesn't seem fine. Miss Adams walks over to the window once again. She squints her eyes, and in the distance, she can see the skyline of New York City. She turns around and walks toward the phone on the wall to call down to the office. As she walks away from the window, there's a bright flash. Screams erupt from the classroom full of children. They dive under their desks as the room begins to shake. Moments later, the windows explode inward. Shards of glass go flying across the room. Miss Adams falls to the floor. A piece of glass sharp as a knife whizzes over her head and slams into the wall, breaking into hundreds of little pieces. The students are protected from the mayhem as they hunker down under their desks. The siren continues to blare. Miss Adams shakes her head to clear her foggy vision. Her eyes are ringing. She slowly stands up and looks around. The students are scared, but they look to be unharmed. Miss Adams turns toward the window. Her jaw drops. The New York City skyline is gone. She slowly approaches the opening. Warm air blows into the classroom. Stay under your desks, she says to the students. Miss Adams stares out the window where New York City once stood. A giant mushroom cloud now rises from the earth. The surrounding area is aglow with radioactive fires. A tear falls down her cheek. A nuclear bomb has just hit the east coast of the United States. At the same time Miss Adams' history class was interrupted, an intelligence officer named Corporal Grayson was working out of an Air Force base near Trenton, New Jersey. Grayson had just gotten settled in at his station when he spotted something strange. Satellite feeds indicated there had been a missile launch from the Russian-Ukrainian border. This had become a relatively common occurrence over the last several months. So Grayson chalked it up to the Russians' brutal tactics in their war against Ukraine. However, as Corporal Grayson moved from satellite to satellite to try to identify the impact site, he became increasingly worried. The missile had not yet detonated, which meant it was either a misfire or Ukrainian forces weren't the intended target. Grayson zoomed out on his search radius. The missile hadn't exploded anywhere in Europe. What's going on? He said out loud. Then he picked something up. It was his worst fears come to life. Grayson pushed his chair away from his workstation and darted for the red phone on the wall. This is General Rod, the voice said on the other line. Sir, we have a problem. You need to get to the control room right away, Grayson whispered into the phone. Moments later, an entourage of highly decorated officers barged into the communications room. Grayson was furiously typing on his keyboard. I think the Russians launched a long-range missile, he yelled over his shoulders. The officers immediately dispersed to the different stations around the room. They looked at the data to determine if the president needed to be informed of the threat right away. Fighter jets were scrambled. They took off toward New York. I've got it, Grayson yelled. But the officers rushed over to his station and looked at the data coming in. A blurry image started to come into focus. Mother of God, one of the generals said. Is that the Russian hypersonic missile we were briefed on a while back? Yes, sir, Grayson confirmed. And it's headed straight toward New York City. The day the nuke detonated over the east coast of the United States was the day World War III started. The blast was immense, as the bomb had a one megaton payload. Times Square and most of Manhattan were vaporized in the initial blast. In an instant, over a million people died. As the shockwave and radiation spread outward, millions more would perish. The explosion heated up the surrounding area to thousands of degrees, incinerating buildings, cars, and roads. The superheating of the air also caused a massive change in pressure, which resulted in a shockwave with winds blowing hundreds of miles per hour, strong enough to blow people off their feet and cause trees to topple. This shockwave extended for three miles in all directions, but it was the radiation from the explosion that would end up killing the most people. As the mushroom cloud rose into the air, it carried radioactive particles with it. The wind pushed these particles northeast. The fallout covered parts of Brooklyn and Queens, but the Bronx was the borough that received the largest dose of radiation. The fallout continued to travel with the wind, which carried it up the east coast of the United States, reaching as far north as New Hampshire. Hours after the blast, Corporal Grayson has a moment to breathe. He's been relieved by another officer so he can contact his wife, who is a school teacher in New Jersey. She teaches history, and he knows that she has an excellent view of the New York City skyline from her classroom, or at least she did, until it was wiped off the face of the earth. Grayson dials his cell phone. The phone rings and rings and rings. Come on, pick up, please pick up, he prays. There's a pause in the ringing, then a familiar voice answers. Thank God you're okay, Grayson says in the receiver. Miss Adams is still in the school. 
it's become a shelter for families needing food and water. Many in the community commuted to the city for work, and even though the town was spared from the blast and the initial fallout, at least half of its residents were lost in the attack. Corporal Grayson explains what's happening to his wife. A nuke was fired using a long-range hypersonic missile. The United States believed Russia was still decades away from making the weapon operational, but as Putin became more and more frustrated with his shortcomings in the war with Ukraine, he took drastic measures. It was more luck than anything else that the hypersonic missile actually worked. But now the east coast of the United States is consumed in flames and radiation. Putin couldn't be happier. After the bomb detonated, the United States immediately went into lockdown. All flights were grounded, the borders were closed up, no one was allowed in or out. The armed forces were instantly mobilized, and since it was clear where the nuke came from, soldiers were ordered to report to their bases for immediate deployment. New York City is in ruins, and much of the northeast coast will be covered in fallout. The military sends doctors and medics to the surrounding areas to help the hospitals deal with millions of people with burns, radiation sickness, and wounds caused by blunt force trauma. The death toll will continue to rise, and over the next several years anyone who received even a small dose of the initial radiation will need to be examined for cancer. The nuke will have long-lasting effects on the east coast of the United States, but none of that might matter, as NATO is about to go to war with Russia. After the nuke struck Manhattan, the US immediately reached out to its allies and informed them of what was going on. They needed to take care of things at home, but Russia had declared war on the free world, and now the nations of NATO needed to make them pay. The UK and France armed their own nukes and await the orders from high command. Even though the United States had been attacked, military leaders know the consequences of retaliating with nukes. If World War III becomes a nuclear war, the entire planet will be at risk. There is no winners in a war where NATO and Russia continuously fire nukes at one another. However, this does not mean they will not be going to war. After the nuke hit the East Coast, all negotiations were off the table. The US will be invading Russia, and Vladimir Putin will pay. A nuke hitting New York City is a worst-case scenario, and the enemy knew this. There's no doubt that wherever a nuclear bomb detonates, there will be mass destruction and countless lives lost. However, New York City is the most densely populated urban center in the US. By firing a nuke here, it ensures it'll cause the most amount of casualties. Another side effect of nuking New York City is much more widespread. If a nuke hits the east coast of the United States, economies all around the world will crash. This may not be the most immediate concern, but if New York City is wiped off the face of the planet, the world economy could collapse. All-out war will likely occur, so nations around the world will start gearing up. The private sector will pool its resources and start building more weapons and machinery to help in the war effort. The US dollar and economy will probably tank as investors pull their money from the stock market. But what if another nuke detonated somewhere else on the east coast of the United States? Regardless of the exact target, the results would likely be the same. The US military would mobilize and immediately strike whoever was responsible for the atrocious act. All NATO countries would send aid to the United States and help in any way they could. The nuclear arsenals of NATO would be put on high alert, and at any given moment the world could be plunged into nuclear war. A nuke going off in New York City would most definitely cause the most casualties as far as targets on the east coast of the United States would go, but there's another key location that an enemy could strike. If someone wanted to hit the heart of America, they would detonate a nuke in Washington, D.C. Moments before the nuke strikes New York City, the President of the United States sits in the Oval Office sipping coffee. It's been a long night. Decisions needed to be made about further sanctions being placed on the countries aiding Russia in the war against Ukraine. Suddenly, a squad of Secret Service agents bursts through the door. The President startles, spilling his coffee across the desk. Sir, we need to get you out of here, the lead agent yells. The President grabs his jacket from the back of his chair and is escorted out of the room. What's going on? He asks. There's no time to talk. Agents rush him toward Marine One. The helicopter's propellers are already spinning. The agents desperately try to get the president on board. Where's my family? He asks. They'll be right behind you, sir. The agent yells over the chopper's blades, cutting through the air. The president stops dead in his tracks. I'm not leaving without them, he says, but it doesn't matter. Before anyone can protest, there's a bright flash. A nuke explodes in downtown DC. The dome of the Capitol building instantly melts. Washington Monument goes up in flames like a torch. The White House is obliterated. In a millisecond, the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the US government are all wiped out. Luckily, the vice president was visiting family on the other side of the country. She's immediately informed of the incident at the Capitol and is rushed to a secure location where she starts making decisions about rescue efforts in DC and New York City and how to best help the people in those areas that need medical attention. She contacts one of her closest advisors, a general working out of an airbase in New Jersey, to become her new Secretary of Defense. The National Guard is deployed to the surrounding regions. These soldiers are provided with radiation suits and iodine tablets. 
to give them an extra layer of protection. They have to wait several days for the fires to die out before they can search for survivors in downtown DC. During this time, anyone who is exposed to the fallout is brought to the closest hospital where they are treated for burns and radiation sickness. The initial blast killed half a million people in DC and wiped out most members of the US government. As the wind swept through the capital, it carried radioactive particles north, covering Maryland, Philadelphia, and parts of New Jersey. The fallout reaches as far as Connecticut, where it isn't as deadly but can still cause complications, especially for anyone who ingests contaminated food or water. If Washington, D.C. was destroyed, there could be a slight delay in action as a new chain of command would need to be put in place, but as soon as the vice president or whoever was next in line to become president was sworn in, the full might of the U.S. military would be unleashed on whoever committed the atrocity. B-2 bombers carrying massive payloads or their own nuclear bombs would take off and unleash a firestorm upon enemy military bases and at key strategic locations. Nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers would be repositioned to areas where they could launch counteroffensives and fire high-powered conventional missiles at the enemy. Next, there would be boots on the ground and tanks rolling toward the enemy capital to remove the current regime from power. NATO would mobilize to aid in the war effort, but one thing is absolutely sure to happen. If the east coast of the US was attacked by nuclear weapons, there would be retaliation on a scale that the world has never seen before. Time would be of the essence as the longer the enemy remained in control and had access to their weapons arsenal, the more likely it would be that another nuke would hit the US. Perhaps the next nuke would be fired at the southeastern coast of the US. Marcus sits on his fishing boat with a line in the water. He hasn't caught much today and decides maybe it's time to head in and cut his losses. He begins reeling in the line when suddenly it gets stuck. Marcus pulls and pulls, but whatever's on the hook is gigantic. He smiles. Perhaps this will make up for not catching anything else that day. He hopes it's a tuna or a swordfish. At this point, he thinks it could be a tiger shark, as whatever he's caught won't let him reel it in. Suddenly, the water all around him starts to bubble. The boat whips back and forth. Marcus lets go of the rod and grabs onto the side of the boat for dear life. Out of the depths of the ocean, a metal hull appears. On the side is a five-pointed red star. It's a Russian submarine rising to the surface. Marcus shouts in terror as his boat capsizes and he's thrown into the water. A few moments later, Marcus surfaces. The Russian sub sits on the water like a giant metal whale coming up for air. He watches in horror as a hatch opens up on the top of the sub. There's a rumbling sound and a missile launches from its tube. It rises up into the air, arcing toward downtown Miami. For a moment, Marcus can't breathe. He watches as the nuclear warhead falls from the sky. It disappears for a second before a bright flash of light fills the sky. Marcus goes blind for a moment. He thrashes in the water trying to catch his breath and reorient himself. He blinks hard just in time to see the Russian sub sink back down below the water and disappear. He looks around for his boat, hoping he can climb onto it and wait to be rescued. Surely the Coast Guard will come to the aid of the people of Miami. Marcus spots his capsized boat and starts swimming to it. Before he can reach the side, he feels a wind against the back of his head. Marcus slowly turns around and treads water. He closes his eyes and shakes his head. A tidal wave created by the nuclear blast is rushing toward him at hundreds of miles per hour. In that moment, he thinks about his family. He wonders if there's any way his wife, who works in the local fish shop, could have survived the blast. He then thinks of his twin brother, who is the president's detail in the Secret Service. He hopes he's okay, even though deep down he knows no one is safe. Marcus grabs onto the side of his boat and grips it tightly. The sea was his entire life, and now, it will claim it. Approximately 200,000 people die instantly in Miami as the result of the nuclear blast. The fallout would likely drift out into the Atlantic, with some radiation reaching the Bahamas. It is the thought of this horrifying scenario that would lead the United States and NATO to take immediate action and destroy any enemy nuclear launch site or housing facilities as quickly as possible. That being said, if US and NATO forces invaded a country with nuclear capabilities like Russia, there's a good chance they would deploy everything they had in their arsenals. Cities across the world would be targeted by nuclear weapons, and millions of people would be vaporized or succumb to the horrors of radiation poisoning. Regardless of who fired the nuke or why, there's a very real possibility that if the east coast of the United States was bombed, the world would come to a terrible end. The last thing the United States or most countries want is nuclear war. However, if a nation like Russia was the one who detonated the nuke and the US tried to fight back, Russia would likely unleash their entire arsenal which contains enough nukes to cover most of the European and North American continents in radioactive fallout. There are several cities that are likely to be major targets on the East Coast if a nuke was ever launched at the US. New York City and Washington DC are definitely the two most likely areas to get hit, for reasons mentioned earlier. However, cities like Boston, Atlanta, Annapolis also could be targets. 
The problem with being on either coast when it comes to war is that submarines equipped with nuclear warheads could theoretically find their way to an area where they could hit several key targets. Take DC for instance. If an enemy sub loaded with several nukes found itself off the coast of Delaware in Maryland or even worse, in the Chesapeake Bay, it could hit several major East Coast cities all at once. Baltimore, Richmond, Philadelphia, Annapolis, and DC would be within firing range. The terrifying part is that once the nukes were deployed, it would be impossible to stop them before they reached their targets. This would give residents in these cities little time to seek shelter and hide from the oncoming apocalypse, that is, if they received any warning at all. The last time serious nuclear drills were carried out in the United States was during the Cold War. The sirens and fallout shelters of that era have fallen into disuse, and it's highly unlikely the average US citizen knows where the closest fallout shelter is. Even if there was time to warn a population of an incoming nuclear strike, it's doubtful people would know what to do. There would be mass hysteria up until the nuke reached its target and detonated. Make no mistake, if a nuke hit the east coast of the US, it would almost certainly be the end of the world. The only way that World War III wouldn't start would be if whoever detonated the device had no political ties or worked for a terrorist group. In these circumstances, the world might rally around the attack and decide that nukes are much too dangerous to be used in conventional warfare. Perhaps if this happened, all countries that possess these doomsday devices would decommission them and lock them away so they could never be used again. This is wishful thinking, however. It's much more likely that if nukes ever did go off on the east coast of the US, the world would be put on a path to nuclear war, and missiles would start flying across the planet in a desperate attempt to wipe out the enemy before they themselves are wiped out. In this scenario, Miss Adams, Corporal Grayson, the Vice President, Marcus, and every other human on the planet, including you, likely wouldn't survive. Despite being mortal enemies for several decades throughout the Cold War, the New World Order following the fall of the Soviet Union has seen American and Russian special forces conducting many of the same missions, combating common foes that seek to spread radical agendas and promote terrorism, and acting as the elite vanguard of their nation's forces, just how similar or different are US and Russian special forces. That's what we'll explore today in this episode of the Infographic Show, US Special Forces versus Russian Special Forces. Forces. Special forces refers to elite military units tasked with unconventional or especially difficult missions that require great skill and generally engender great risk. From Sparta's famed 300, who helped thousands of other Greeks hold the line against an invading Persian horde in ancient Greece, to the infamous Otto Skorzeny and his brilliant raids against Allied targets during World War II, special forces have always existed in spirit, if not designation, throughout human history. At their core, special forces are nothing more than highly skilled operatives conducting missions too complicated or difficult for large conventional forces to accomplish. But it was only after World War II that military Militaries around the world formally created small elite units and designed them as special forces. No matter their country of origin, all special forces hold five basic mission types for which they are responsible. Counterinsurgency. Though the counterinsurgency role of special operations forces has come to the limelight in recent years thanks to America's global war on terror, the first heavy use of special forces in counterinsurgency operations came during France's and then later America's war in Vietnam. Partisans and terrorists have always constituted a major threat to friendly military forces, and work by undermining any potential gains made by defeating enemy conventional forces. Partisans and terrorists can be difficult to combat, as they do not wear identifying uniforms and wage asymmetrical warfare, or irregular warfare, typically from inside friendly lines. The need to combat these shadowy threats gave rise to one of SF's most important missions, counterinsurgency. Counterinsurgency ops are a mix of law enforcement and military missions requiring detective skills to track and locate insurgents and then eliminating or apprehending them. With the risk of so much collateral damage in terms of civilian casualties, counterinsurgency is a job best left to special forces rather than conventional forces, and an over-reliance on conventional forces to do the job in Vietnam is at times attributed for the poor performance of the US in the war. Unconventional warfare. Without a doubt, the cornerstone of special forces operations, unconventional warfare, or UW, covers a very wide range of mission types. These can range from targeted assassination of high-value targets, or HVTs, disruption or overthrow of governments, or conducting guerrilla raids deep inside enemy territory. A special forces icon, Major Benjamin Talmadge, fought the British during the American Revolutionary War and was famed for leading raids deep into enemy territory and striking at British supply trains. And striking at British supply trains, burning them to the ground or stealing the supplies to bring back to American 
forces greatly in need of arms and ammunition. Frowned upon at the time by his military contemporaries, especially other American forces who viewed his execution of war as improper, Major Tallmadge has become a hero to the American SF community and a template for special forces doctrine for centuries to come. Direct action missions can be best described by a motto familiar to many American soldiers. Our job is to kill the enemy and break his shit. Ranging from seizing and capturing high-value personnel, materials, or locations, to outright destruction of enemy assets, direct action engagements are very high intensity and very brief duration engagements meant to surprise an enemy and hit them where and when they are least expecting it. This is another area where special forces shine over the use of conventional forces. With smaller unit sizes and more specialized skill sets, special forces are able to move much more quickly and thus strike in much more unexpected ways or times than larger less maneuverable conventional forces. Foreign Internal Defense Foreign internal defense missions involve special operations forces training and equipping foreign allied military forces. Different than security force assistance missions, foreign internal defense ops are more geared at aiding allied foreign forces to combat insurgency, terrorism, and even disrupt enemy special force missions against them. Today in Korea, American special forces regularly train with their South Korean counterparts to respond to and eliminate the threat from North Korean special forces. And with an estimated special Special forces strength of over 200,000 soldiers, South Korea faces a huge security challenge in the event of war from North Korea's most elite soldiers. Special Reconnaissance Special Reconnaissance missions are a major part of where American SF forces earn the nickname the Quiet Professionals. Typically consisting of very small unit sizes, SR missions are meant to collect information deep in hostile or politically sensitive territory with the explicit goal that the unit's presence is never detected. Because valuable intelligence can be rendered worthless if an enemy realizes it's been discovered, SR missions require the utmost stealth and secrecy. Sometimes, SR missions can be carried out in extremely politically sensitive situations, necess necessitating the complete disavowal of any involvement by the nation conducting them. This means that any discovered or captured operatives may be completely on their own, making SR missions some of the riskiest a special forces operative can undertake. Security Force Assistance Security Force Assistance Operations involve the use of special forces to coordinate with friendly allied militaries and aid them with training and developing military doctrine. Long a hallmark of US Army Rangers, SFA operations may range from making contact with guerrillas deep in enemy territory or simply a deployment to an allied, less developed nation that needs help establishing a proficient military force. So with similar missions, and in recent times with similar terrorist enemies, how do US and Russian special forces compare to each other? With the vast amount of their operations kept secret for decades, it's impossible to ascertain which force is more effective than the other as there simply exists few, if any, true comparison points. Also due to the difference in ideology and doctrine, US, Russian, and special forces may undertake many of the same types of missions, but can vary widely in how and why they conduct them. The old adage of apples and oranges may apply aptly here. However, we can look at some major similarities and differences between the two. Both nations operate a number of different units under the general designation of special forces, whose missions and training can vary dramatically. On the whole though, one of the major differences between US and Russian special forces is the composition of their units. American special forces tend to adhere to a doctrine of skill specialization in which each member of a team has a unique specialty and numerous and overlapping subspecialties. For instance, one team member will be the team medic, but will also have training in communications and demolitions, though his primary job is to serve as medic. Russian special forces tend to favor a more general approach without unique specializations, which is why, on the whole, Russian special forces are more focused on the direct action mission of special operations, a deficiency identified in modern times that has seen some expansion in training for Russian operators. While select American special forces such as Army Rangers and Navy SEALs share a similar and more narrow focus, the American special forces community as a whole is a far more flexible organism than Russian special forces 
forces, able to undertake a greater variety of missions and bringing more varied disciplines to the table. The narrower focus of Russian special forces is an unfortunate holdover of the Soviet era, when the Soviet military forced their special operations forces to focus almost myopically on the destruction of NATO missiles and high-value targets in the case of war. Another major difference between US and Russian special forces is a general disregard for collateral damage by Russian operators, who are more concerned with results than public perception. One famous example is the response to the kidnapping of four Soviet diplomats in 1985 by the Muslim Brotherhood, conducted in retaliation for Soviet support of Syrians. Dispatching the KGB's Alpha Group, the Russian operatives arrived in Beirut, Lebanon, just as one of the hostages was executed. Rather than moving to rescue the remaining hostages, Russian operators instead tracked down and took hostage several family members of the terrorists, torturing and dismembering them and sending body parts to the terrorists. The tactic worked, and the remaining hostages were released, and no Russian diplomats were molested again for two decades in the Middle East. Yet while Russia's adoption of brutal tactics may have been effective in this specific case, it comes at a major cost of public perception, and could in fact backfire by raising public anger against Russia. Russia's ongoing difficulties with Chechnya is believed to be compounded by brutal retaliatory measures by Russian security forces. Preferring the hammer to the surgical knife, though, is a long hallmark of Russian military doctrine, and further evidenced by the slow adoption of precision-guided munitions by a military that prefers to intimidate via overwhelming firepower without much regard to collateral damage. This doctrine would once more come into play during the Moscow theater hostage crisis of October 2000. 2002, when 850 hostages were taken by Chechen terrorists. After two and a half days of standoff and no concessions from either side, Russian special forces pumped an as yet undisclosed gas into the building and initiated an assault which would see all 40 terrorists killed, but as an adverse reaction to the mystery gas, 130 hostages also died. When Islamic militants took several hundred school children and teachers hostage in Beslan in September 2004, Russian special forces once more laid siege to the hostage takers. After a furious firefight, all of the terrorists were killed, but so were 186 children and 20 Russian operators, though witnesses reported that many of the Russians died or were wounded trying to heroically shield children from the fighting. Striving for decades to build a safer and more structured world order in order to avoid the mistakes of pre-World War II Europe, the US has for a long time sought to preserve its identity as a global leader, recent presidential election notwithstanding. Knowing that such heavy-handed tactics as Russia's would endanger that perception, US Special Operation Forces are more focused on avoiding unnecessary deaths and obeying rules of engagement. While this may at times perhaps limit their effectiveness in a given situation, it does preserve a generally positive perception of American special forces which has made them welcome in nations around the world as they aid allies and regional partners such as the Philippines in combating their own terrorist threats or improving the capabilities of their military. American SF doctrine of maintaining a light footprint effect, however, does come with a cost, and in the last two decades they have suffered significant casualties in their efforts to combat terrorism around the world. It is impossible to truly determine which force is better than the other without directly pitting the two nations in open conflict, which thankfully has never happened. However, from the bold parachute raids behind German lines into occupied Soviet territory in World War II, to daring attacks against British supply lines during the American Revolutionary War, both Russian and American special forces share a common heritage of courage and professionalism. Though they may differ in doctrine and ideology, ultimately, both Russian and American special forces have one similar job kill the enemy and break his shit. One of the best indicators of how effective a military is, is good logistics. After all, it does not matter how far a weapon can shoot, how fast it can go, or how many soldiers you can put into the field if they cannot be supplied, rearmed, and taken care of properly. The US military has mastered the art of logistics, with a huge domestic industrial base combined with overseas basing, pre-positioning, and forward-deployed replenishment capabilities. The US can sustain combat operations anytime, anywhere. Such logistics prowess has been shown by the US fighting a two-front war half the world away for almost 20 years. Russia, on the other hand, has experienced logistics woes during its invasion of Ukraine. Media and military pundits have frequently bashed the Russian army's poor logistics, but they've yet to really explain why their logistics are so bad. Until now.
Before we deep dive into how Russian logistics cannot compare to the US military, Russia has not done everything wrong. One forward-thinking innovation the Russian military has made is choosing smaller vehicles. For example, their primary main battle tanks like the T-72, T-80, and T-90 are about 10 feet shorter and 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams. Putting the effectiveness of each tank aside, purely from a logistics perspective this has an advantage. Shorter tanks take up less room inside ships. Lighter tanks also use less fuel when shipping them, and they also make for speedier transport. The Russian Navy has also set itself up for sea access. At the end of World War II, what was formerly known as East Prussia got broken up and mostly absorbed into Poland. However, a tiny sliver of it went to Russia, known as the Kaliningrad Enclave. This tiny portion of Russian territory is crucial in giving Russia year-round access to a warm water port. This is because ports like St. Petersburg or Archangel freeze over during winter, preventing the deployment of ships and submarines. Because Russia desires more warm water ports, this was one of their primary motivations for involvement in Syria. Due to their assistance, Russia obtained perpetual basing rights to Latakia on Syria's Mediterranean coast. Capturing the port of Sevastopol was also a significant factor in the 2014 invasion of Crimea. Because of Russia's need for a more desirable port on the Black Sea, Russia aimed to retake what used to be one of the Soviet Union's primary ports. Due to its steep decline from the port to the sea floor, Sevastopol has been favored as a submarine base for decades and serves as a major logistics hub. But of course Russia has had to violate international law to get Sevastopol, putting the benefits of their generally lighter combat vehicles and aggressive stance at getting warm water ports aside. Russia's military as a whole has failed on the land, the sea, and in the air to provide adequate support for forward deployed units. The most obvious example of Russian failures has been its total lack of sea and airlift capacity. In 1992, just after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian Air Force had about 500 planes with a combined lift capacity of nearly 30,000 tons. Additionally, the Russian Navy operated about 80 amphibious and logistics ships with enough room to fit over 600 tanks. With fewer than 20 ships and around 100 airplanes left, Russia's forward-deployed combat capacity is just shy of 6,000 tons of gear and about 200 tanks. Such a dramatic decrease in lift capacity severely limits combat operations beyond its borders. Another crucial factor that limits lift capacity is the lack of support for ships and aircraft outside Russian borders. During the Russian campaign in Syria, it was a known deficiency that Russian warships could not resupply their troops in theater. Unlike the US Navy, the Russian Navy does not practice nor even have the capability of regular underway replenishment. Underway replenishment is a method of refueling and re-equipping ships at sea, spearheaded by the US Navy during the First World War. In underway replenishment operations, US Navy and NATO vessels come alongside at distances of about 180 feet from the oiler. One vessel will shoot shot lines over to the other and bring the spawn wire and in-haul outhaul lines over. These then connect the ship to pump fuel and slide pallets of food, parts, supplies, and ammunition between the ships. Though the Soviet Navy had limited capacity for refueling operations and no capacity for taking stores during missions, the Russian Navy has abandoned even trying anymore. Though every US Navy ship regularly conducts underway replenishment, Russian ships do not. Instead, they have to waste time and money pulling into ports to refuel, rearm, and re-equip. The Russian Air Force does not fare much better. Because Russia alienates most of the world, few countries will afford them overflight rights. Overflight is the permission that military planes have to obtain from any country they fly through. If a country says no, that aircraft has to divert to a route that takes them through airspace they are allowed in. Thanks to the NATO alliance and friendly relations the US has with most of the world, there are few airspaces that American aircraft are denied overflight. But for Russian planes, their friends are few and far between. Because of this, Russian aircraft supporting combat operations have to take longer routes that waste time, fuel, and money. But even if more countries like Belarus permitted Russian planes to fly through their territory, Russia lacks overseas bases to support their aircraft. Unlike naval aviation which can launch and recover on aircraft carriers, ground-based planes have to have runways. The US has spent the past few decades building relationships that have allowed American aircraft basing rights around the world. The Russian Air Force does not have this luxury. Because of this, with a few exceptions such as Syria and Belarus, Russian aircraft would have nowhere to land unless Russian troops secured overseas bases by force. Another crucial factor to consider is the over-reliance of the Russian army on railways for transportation. Because Russia is so large, with huge territories of virtual wasteland, their military relies more heavily on rail systems than any other European country. 
The Russians adopted this strategy because during the Cold War they set up most of the USSR and Warsaw Pact countries with a standard wide gauge track. They did this so in the event of a war they'd always have plenty of railheads to disembark supplies so they would not have to travel too far to forward units. But this logic has a few major flaws. Firstly, the Russians must assume that they'll always control a large majority of their vital rail hubs. Secondly, because of their over-reliance on rail, the logistics units meant to support forward-deployed units pale in comparison to US and NATO units. On average, Western militaries have three to four times the number of logistics personnel as Russia does for servicing equivalent-sized units. Because Russia has not been able to take many population centers, they are stranded in a sort of logistical desert in Ukraine. With no railheads to draw supplies from, the few logistics troops left have to service forward-deployed units in massive truck convoys that depart from the closest rail hubs Russia does control. Usually, these convoys have to leave from Russia or Belarusian territory. Once on the road, these convoys suffer constant attacks from Ukrainian drones and artillery strikes. Additionally, because of the Russian policy of treating its draftees, these often unmotivated, poorly trained, and even more poorly led soldiers are left to service the trucks and vehicles that keep the army supplied. Because of the backwardness, corruption, and hazing in the conscript system, little to no maintenance gets done on these vehicles, which cause a large number of them to be lost before Ukraine can even take a shot at them. Just how bad Russian logistics are at supporting faraway campaigns was studied extensively in a RAND Corporation study in 2020. The RAND Corporation is one of America's oldest and largest military think tanks, and both congressional and military officials frequently cite their reports. According to RAND's own war games, the Russian military would have extreme difficulty supporting formations of troops beyond a brigade level past the borders of Ukraine, Poland, and the Baltics. For any campaigns past Eastern Europe, it's been estimated that Russia could not support units larger than a battalion level. To put these numbers into perspective, a battalion, depending on the military, has around a thousand soldiers, and a brigade usually has several thousand soldiers. This means that anything outside Russia's borders, their military can only ensure battalion-sized units are fully manned, equipped, and supplied. Such a finding has come true in Ukraine, where large Russian formations frequently ran out of fuel, food, water, and ammunition. Why Russia has had a hard time supporting forces outside its borders is not only due to nations not granting them basing rights or their inability to replenish at sea, their own system works against them. In the Russian military, conscripts have always made up most of the fighting force. However, the disastrous wars in Chechnya turned public opinion against the government for deploying conscript soldiers in frontline positions. During those wars, recently conscripted men were rushed to the front, and thousands of Russian men died because their government did not care to train them properly. Because of public outrage over conscript casualties in Chechnya, the Duma also passed legislation that made sending conscripts into combat outside Russian borders illegal. Because of this constraint, Russian commanders have difficulty properly manning their battalion tactical groups. Legal constraints before the 2022 invasion saw commanders scrambling to properly man units in time for out-of-area deployments. Oftentimes, soldiers from units in the Far East would have to be brought in to man units in western or southern Russia, preparing to deploy to Donbass or Syria. Because of this dilemma, it's now obvious that part of the reason Putin rushed to annex parts of Ukraine he controlled was so he had the legal basis for sending hundreds of thousands of conscripts he planned to enlist to the front line. Conscription also hurts Russian logistics, because before the invasion, the policy was that conscripts had to primarily serve in support roles. Russian officials gave positions like mechanics, supply clerks, and all the other support roles to conscripts. Taking mechanics as an example, these troops serve a vital function not just in the serving military, but in maintaining stored equipment that, if not taken seriously, can have disastrous effects. In the US military, planes, tanks, ships, and vehicles held in storage receive routine maintenance. Whether provided by contractors or reserve personnel, the US military ensures that equipment held in long-term storage is available for immediate use, if the military ever needs it. The Russian military doesn't work the same way. In principle, Russia also maintains its vast Cold War stockpile of equipment. However, the war in Ukraine has shown that old habits die hard. During the Soviet era, it was common practice to make conscripts maintain and clean equipment. Volunteer soldiers saw these kinds of jobs as beneath them and forced the men who did not want to be there to do it. Of course, this led to work that was done poorly, if done at all. Another way that stored vehicles were improperly maintained was greedy army officers looking to line their pockets. Because Soviet equipment is among the most common gear in a lot of countries' militaries, spare parts are in high demand. 
Enterprising Soviet officers used to sell parts and pieces from vehicles to make extra money. After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the Russian military did its best to stamp out these practices. During the major Russian army overhaul in the early 2000s, it was reported to Putin that the military had stopped these practices, but it's clear now they had continued. After Russia started taking heavy losses in tanks and armored vehicles, tons of Cold War equipment was dusted off and brought into the fight. Only there was just one problem. A lot of it did not work. Broken equipment and tanks so gutted from the part theft as to be left inoperable have been so prevalent that some reserve tank units reported 90% of their inventories as write-offs. Russian part woes also extend to the crushing sanctions their country has faced since the invasion. Even though Russia boasts a robust arms industry, they relied on abundant imports from Western countries for advanced parts. Everything from microchip processors to advanced optics had to be outsourced to foreign countries. Even though Western countries often import parts too, unlike Russia, it's highly unlikely US supply chains will be interrupted. Even if Russian industry could support its arms needs, the government does not have the money. This is because Russian officials have poured what few defense dollars they have left over into developing wonder weapon type projects like super quiet submarines and hypersonic missiles. Ordinary equipment like gun sights, fire control computers, and communications equipment get left out. The budget constraints even affect the lives of ordinary soldiers to the degree that it hurts combat effectiveness. A hodgepodge of videos coming out of Russia shows that the military does not have the money for even basic things like uniforms, bulletproof vests, and first aid kits. Often enlistment officers tell men to purchase their own gear if they want to survive. Additionally, the soldiers' families are not taken care of. Conscripted men are taken off the street and put on the front lines within weeks or days of their induction. These men leave behind jobs and families that need support. Russian military leadership has said they do not have the money to care for soldiers and their families. Putin directed local government to work out whatever payments they could afford. In some Russian districts, men are given a sheep, and others get several kilograms of fish or some cabbage as payment for their service. Even when they're deployed, soldiers are told they're not being paid a salary and they should just do their job. It is this fundamental difference in how the Russian military pays its soldiers and cares for their families that truly makes the US better than Russia. No matter what, US service members get paid twice a month and get a housing allowance if married or above a certain rank. They get free health care for themselves and their families and a ton of other benefits like money for tuition. The Russian government simply does not have the money or desire to ensure their own troops are properly fed, clothed, and paid. To just show how little Putin cares for his troops, Russia has stopped listing soldiers as killed, but instead as missing in action. This distinction prevents families of Russian service members that the government knows are dead from receiving their life insurance benefits. November 2, 2021, the world is reeling from the economic devastation brought about by the coronavirus pandemic. And for world powers, as some might see it as an opportunity to make a move. Believing the United States is too distracted by China and the lingering effects of the coronavirus, Russia makes its move in Eastern Europe, seeking at last to reunify its military conclave of Kaliningrad with the motherland. It will also cut off the renegade Soviet provinces of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia from NATO and force them back into the loving arms of Mother Russia. NATO immediately responds, but quick reaction forces stationed along Eastern Europe are no match for the overwhelming might of the Russian army. It'll take weeks for NATO to organize a proper military response, but the United States has already begun to strike back. Not in Eastern Europe, but in the Pacific. A US naval task force, part of the US Pacific Command, is on its way to attack the headquarters of the Russian Pacific Fleet in Vladivostok. Russia's Far East has always been problematic for the Russian military to defend. The incredible size of Russia makes reinforcing the Far East extremely difficult and impossible to accomplish in a timely manner. Then again, the US stands to gain little by attacking Russia's Far East, except for knocking the Russians out of the Pacific for good. A push into Russia from the east is impossible. The distance to any military objectives worth seizing in the west entirely too far, and transportation networks easily sabotaged by the Russians. Russia, however, is not ready to give up its presence in the Pacific. And luckily for it, the Russian Pacific Fleet is its second most powerful fleet. Suffering from years of neglect, though, that's not saying much. Steaming out of their home port to meet the first American carrier strike group en route to their shores is a fleet consisting of six destroyers and a half dozen corvettes, led by the cruiser Varyak, flagship of the Russian Pacific Fleet. The Russians know they're outmatched in open water, so instead they opt to use the same tried and true tactics of the 1904 Russo-Japanese War. They'll be fighting the same way they fought the superior Japanese Navy and the same way the Soviet Union expected to fight the American Navy, utilizing the doctrine of a fortress fleet. 
Supported by shore-based installations and aircraft, the Russian Pacific Fleet never strays more than a few dozen miles from shore. But the first strike against the Americans will come from below the waves. The Russian submarine fleet has suffered from similar levels of neglect as the surface fleet. However, with only one active carrier in the Russian Navy, great emphasis has been put into maintaining available Russian submarines. Gone are the glory days of the Soviet Navy, when hundreds of Soviet subs prowled the world's oceans, forcing the Americans into a game of underwater cat and mouse. Russian military command does not believe their Kilo-class submarines, dating back to the waning days of the Cold War, are survivable against the American fleet. Therefore, Kilos are ordered to remain silent, close to the shore, dashing in for attacks of opportunity once the enemy fleet is fully engaged. The three improved Kilo-class subs have a greater chance of approaching the American strike group, but only the Petropavlos Komchatsky is combat ready. The attack will fall on the small fleet of Oscar IIs, capable of launching long-range attacks with anti-ship missiles. Had the attack come just 10 years earlier, the Russians would have likely found great success using their subs against the Americans. After developing the greatest anti-submarine warfare capabilities on the planet during the Cold War, the United States allowed its ASW capabilities to seriously atrophy, resulting in a series of embarrassing mission kills on American carriers during training exercises with friendly nation subs in the early 2000s. However, the Americans were quick to correct their mistake, even contracting a Swedish submarine for two years to help them restore their ASW capabilities. The American 2021 fleet is not the 2001 fleet that couldn't see a submarine in the swimming pool. The four Russian subs must close to within 350 nautical miles to launch their granite anti-ship missiles. They don't dare close in for torpedo strikes against the American carrier, knowing they'll be easily spotted well before then. In order to reduce the chance of detection, the subs approach the carrier strike group on a 30-degree offset from each other, which has the benefit of greatly increasing the search radius of the strike group's ASW assets. The Americans know that their first strike will likely come from beneath the waves, and they've been prepared. ASW helicopters fan out dozens of miles around the strike group, equipped with torpedoes and sonar that they periodically dip into the ocean to listen for the telltale acoustic signature of a Russian sub. American attack subs always held an advantage over their Soviet and Russian counterparts, and during the Cold War, US subs tailed Soviet subs without being detected, allowing them to record a vast acoustic library of all known Soviet and now Russian submarines. Further aiding the efforts in the hunt for the Russian subs are the P-8 Poseidons based out of Guam, Japan, and South Korea. With the world's largest air tanker fleet, the United States is able to drastically increase the range of its Poseidons allowing the aircraft to sweep a corridor across the Pacific for the carrier strike group. The Poseidons lay down vast fields of airdrop sono buoys. On contact with salt water, the sono buoy's batteries activate. Some of the buoys are set to active search mode, pinging the ocean for miles around them with powerful sonar and listening for the report. Others are set to passive, listening for the telltale sound of a Russian sub. But further aiding the hunt for Russian submarines is a brand new development by the US Navy, a radar that can penetrate the waves and detect the underwater wake of a submarine. The subs can't evade the vast fields of sonar buoys deployed by the Poseidons, and eventually each sub begins to generate a good track. Poseidons now drop down to just a few hundred feet above the waves, allowing their magnetic anomaly detector to verify the presence of Russian submarines below. Upon confirmation, each Poseidon drops two torpedoes. The torpedoes don't even need to score a direct hit. Even a miss of 100 feet generates so much pressure that the submarine's hull will rupture. Round one goes to the Americans. Submarines aren't the only way to kill a carrier, though, and Russian Tu-22 bombers are already airborne. During the Cold War, Soviet military planners knew that attacking a carrier strike group would be an extremely dicey proposition. Official battle plans called for attacks with a minimum of 100 bombers, with an estimated loss rate of 50%. Even then, a mission kill was likely but not an outright sinking, merely taking a carrier out of action for a few months to a year as it underwent repairs. Today, the Russian Air Forces only have 67 222s, and most of them are stationed in the much more important Western beater. What they do have is the Granite anti-ship missile, capable of being launched from standoff ranges that should hopefully keep the bombers safely out of the strike group's air defenses. Two dozen 222s leave the Russian coast behind. The American carrier is moving at full power, making it a surprisingly fast and evasive target. Russian satellites fix the carrier group's location for the bombers, but only for 15 minutes before they dip past the Earth's horizon and lose radar contact. The best way to fix the carrier long term would be to use airborne radar assets, but with American airbases in Japan hosting fleets of fighter aircraft, 
the AWACS planes would be splashed in a matter of hours. The greatest difficulty Russian forces are having in taking the American carrier out is simply finding the damn thing. Satellite surveillance gives the 222s a box a few hundred square miles wide where the carrier could potentially be hiding. Now the bombers must approach that target box and remain within range of their granite missiles, 388 miles, until a new satellite fix can help the bombers get better targeting data. The bombers could turn on their own radars, but that would make them stand out like a spotlight in a dark room, making them easy prey for the carrier's combat air patrol. While the Russians are having difficulty fixing the carrier's location, the Americans are not having similar problems. Even under intense cyber attack, the American recon satellite network is vast, outnumbered only by the Chinese in physical assets but not in capabilities. AWACS planes launched from Japan each have a detection range of just over 250 miles, and once more supported by aerial refueling tankers, the US Air Forces are able to cover a wide swath of Russia's Pacific coast with radar coverage. Further supplementing the land-based AWACS planes are carrier-launched Hawkeye airborne radar planes and EA-18 Growlers. The Russian attack wave is easily vectored, and the carrier's combat air patrol is dispatched. While the 222s must get within 388 miles to launch their attack, the carrier's F-18 Hornets and the new F-35Cs each have a combat radius of over 1,200 miles. Guided by airborne radar, the F-35s take point. The 222s realize they've been targeted when the F-35's fire control radar illuminates them, but by then it's too late. Countermeasures spoof a quarter of the incoming missiles, but 10 of the bombers are still down. The limited missile capacity of the F-35s is its greatest weakness, able to carry only four missiles internally in order to preserve its stealth capabilities. Instead, the F-35s are forced to switch to guns, and for the first time in decades, US fighters strafe enemy aircraft with guns. Cannon capacity is also very limited on F-35s, however, and the Russian planes are built tough. Three more 222s are splashed, leaving nine. They're still hundreds of miles from launch, though, and the follow-on F-18s may not be stealthy, but with Russia unable to provide effective air cover past its shores, they don't need to be. The bombers are sitting ducks, speeding straight into a head-on deathmatch with the approaching Hornets. Wisely, the surviving nine 222s turn around and head back for home. Round two, once more, goes to the US. As the surviving 222s arrive home, however, the crews are sent for chow and a few hours sleep. As they rest, the bombers are being refitted with a brand new weapon, just delivered from the Western Theater. The Russian military still has very small numbers of them and must use them extremely judiciously. But with the strike group now within 1,500 miles of the shore, the time is now. Half a day later, the 222s are once more back in the air. They know they'll be immediately spotted by the American satellites and AWACS planes once they leave the Russian coast, but this time they don't need to get so close to deliver their deadly payload. The Americans can't believe it. The Russians must be crazy, they're trying the exact same attack that just failed so catastrophically. Vectored in by Hawkeyes and Air Force AWACS, the Combat Air Patrol once more moves to intercept the incoming threat, well outside of anti-ship range. This time, the 222s only need to get within 1,000 miles of the carrier. They have to once more rely on targeting data from the overhead satellites, meaning the American carrier can only be fixed for brief moments in time. The carrier isn't close enough to the shore for installations to aid in tracking. They must once more target a very large box of the Pacific Ocean, but this new Russian weapon is fully capable of finding its own targets. It's perfect for the task at hand, and long before the American's combat air patrol can intercept him, each 222 drops two 10-meter black and silver missiles from their wingtip pylons. The Zircon anti-ship missiles immediately fire their rocket engines, boosting them to over two times the speed of sound. The rocket engine now detaches from the missile and falls to the ocean below, as the missile scramjet fires into action. The missile scramjet engine has no moving parts, instead it compresses incoming supersonic air and simply adds fuel, which causes the superheated air to explode. The energy redirected behind the missile by the engine nozzle. It's a brilliant design, but only works when you're already at supersonic speed, which has limited its use by militaries for decades. The missiles rise to the edge of the stratosphere where the air-breathing engines can still supply needed oxygen, but high enough that the missile's onboard targeting suite can pinpoint the American carrier. A stealthy body helps the missiles evade the American Aegis radar sweeping the sky. As a satellite enters proper phase over Earth, it sends a new fix on the carrier to the missiles, redirecting their course and greatly increasing their accuracy. 
A few dozen miles from their targets, the strike group's Aegis radars begin to pinpoint the incoming missiles. Traveling at Mach 9, though, the strike group's missile defenses have less than 30 seconds to respond. The strike group's missile defense systems are fully automated. Humans are no longer fast enough to respond to deadly hypersonic threats. Only a machine is up to the task, and Americans have built themselves one hell of a missile defense machine. Beams of powerful electromagnetic energy reach up toward the missiles in an attempt to directly interfere with the sensitive electronics of the targeting suite or confuse them. Three missiles suddenly careen wildly off course, tearing themselves apart thanks to their hypersonic speed. Fifteen missiles remain, twenty seconds to impact. The destroyer escorts prepare to launch decoys. They first deploy chaff as a means to make the missiles think a better target is somewhere else through its superheated metal flakes. However, it soon becomes apparent that these missiles are much more advanced than the Americans thought when they don't even begin to alter course. Quickly altering course themselves, the destroyers deploy their more advanced Nulka rounds that are more powerful and try to walk the missiles away from the formation. 15 seconds to impact. The Russian missiles are finally within intercept range of the strike group's destroyers, and within moments salvos of interceptors are fired. However, the Russian missiles are moving at such incredible speeds that a superheated layer of plasma around them is making radar lock difficult to maintain. It takes three seconds for each volley of interceptors to be fired, and by the time the second volley is fired, the Russian missiles are too close to be intercepted by American rams. Another four Russian missiles are splashed, eleven missiles remain. Five seconds to impact. Each missile is now moving at almost 7,000 miles per hour on their descent phase. The layer of superheated plasma around each missile grows in size as the missiles plunge down and the atmosphere thickens. The last line of defense for the strike group comes online and will have mere seconds to respond. On ships across the strike group, SeaWiz cannons have already been placed on standby. The plasma surrounding the descending missiles once more makes radar lock difficult to achieve. The missiles move so unbelievably fast that by the time they've entered SeaWiz range and the SeaWiz systems have swiveled the cannons in the right direction, there's only two seconds left to fire. Most of the cannons never fire, there simply isn't enough time for the onboard radar to work out a good lock through the layer of plasma around each missile. A few do, but their accuracy is abysmal. Only a single Russian missile is knocked out a mile above the carrier. Ten missiles have penetrated the carrier's defenses. Two of the missiles have suffered manufacturing defects and never detonate as they strike the carrier. The Zircon hypersonic anti-ship missile is after all bleeding-edge tech for the Russians. Bugs in the software and defects in the manufacturing are inevitable. The missiles are moving so fast, however, that sheer kinetic energy alone punches a hole through the decks of the carrier, each missile penetrating almost to the bottom hole. The electronic brain in one of the other missiles has slightly misjudged its geometry and explodes in the ocean a few hundred feet away from the carrier. The other seven, however, find their mark. The hypersonic missiles move so fast that they penetrate several decks before the onboard explosives are triggered, which only increases the destructing potential of each missile. Armed with 800 pounds of explosives, the Zircon carries only half the explosive power of a granite anti-ship missile. But with seven direct hits, it doesn't matter much. Explosions rip through the inner decks of the carrier, buckling the flight deck and destroying dozens of aircraft in the below deck hangar. Secondary fuel explosions rock the ship as black smoke belches out. Hundreds of sailors have died in seconds. Hundreds more will die soon. The carrier is dead in the water, but she doesn't sink. The incredible size and engineering of a supercarrier makes it almost impossible to sink with anything less than a massed missile attack. That's why the Soviets planned on using a hundred bombers to do the task. Russia's new Zircon hypersonic missiles are deadly to the US Navy but they are still available in such low numbers that unless Russia dedicated the majority of its stockpile to a single attack, sinking a US carrier is still incredibly unlikely. Achieving a mission kill, however, is very likely, and though the carrier won't sink, it'll be out of combat for at least a year as it undergoes repairs. Modern Russia would be very hard-pressed to sink a US carrier. Finding and hitting a carrier out at sea is incredibly difficult, especially when it's on the move. Without a recon fleet of air assets the size and scope of the US's own fleet, and the ability to dominate the skies far from its own shores, Russia's first problem is just finding American carriers in the first place. Of course, in the real world, Russia is moving to develop land-based variants of the Zircon anti-ship missile because it recognizes that in a realistic scenario, its 222 bombers would be unlikely to survive long enough to actually get in range of a carrier out at sea thanks to the US fighter bases in South Korea and Japan.
Russia and the United States have long been two of the largest international powers in the world. As a result, both countries have their own specialized and expansive security agencies, the Central Intelligence Agency or CIA and the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation or FSB. Established shortly after the Second World War in 1947, the CIA has been responsible for the gathering and analysis of highly sensitive information all over the world on behalf of the United States federal government. The FSB was formed more recently, in 1995, as a modern replacement for the Soviet Union's KGB. It's tasked with various responsibilities such as counterintelligence and counterterrorism operations, surveillance, border security, and investigating any violation of Russia's federal law. We previously covered how the CIA and KGB fared against each other in CIA vs KGB, which was better during the Cold War. But how do their modern, present-day equivalents hold up? We're pitting the CIA and the FSB against each other to see if we can determine which of them is the superior spy agency. So what do each of these agencies actually do? The main role of the CIA is to serve as the United States Foreign Intelligence Service, meaning that they're designed to gather intel internationally. The CIA, in theory, holds less jurisdiction to operate on home soil. Any investigations and operations that take place within America itself are usually handled by other agencies, such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, otherwise known as the FBI. This is actually the first key difference between the CIA and the FSB. While the CIA's focus is on external threats and intelligence gathering, the FSB's role is to safeguard the Russian state from within. While the nature of the FSB is perhaps more akin to the FBI, that doesn't mean they haven't been involved in some CIA-style secret and dangerous operations, or that they don't have some pretty gnarly skeletons in their closet. So with that in mind, how do the two spy agencies compare in terms of their dark and duplicitous deeds? Let's start with one of the many secrets that the CIA likes to keep under wraps. Did you know that the Central Intelligence Agency has a top secret assassination unit? Conspiracy theorists and even official sources have linked the CIA to a number of infamous, high profile, and historically significant assassination attempts, from Cuban revolutionary Fidel Castro to Osama bin Laden. However, it was revealed that in response to the September 11th attack on the World Trade Center, US President George Bush authorized the Central Intelligence Agency to use a covert assassination unit in order to track down and eliminate members of Al-Qaeda. Journalist Evan Wright highlighted that this marked the first time the US government outsourced a covert assassination service to a private enterprise, as the CIA brought in private contractors to carry out their secretive assassinations. The entire operation was even hidden from Congress themselves meaning that the CIA had the power to abduct or kill anyone they believed to be associated with Al-Qaeda, without their actions being tracked back to the US government. That's a scary level of power and freedom for an organization to be granted, made even more scary by the fact that it was kept top secret for so long. No information about these assassinations was known to the public until almost a decade after President Bush had authorized the CIA to conduct them. And there's even rumors that the CIA are still using private security contractors to carry out assassinations to this very day. The FSB has just as many dark secrets of their own, however. For example, did you know that the FSB runs their own covert kill squad? No? Well, that's probably because they don't want you knowing. Meet the Alpha Group. These guys are one of Russia's toughest military squads, an elite team run by the FSB themselves. Very little is known about the actual directive of the Alpha Group, although many believe it's their job to act under direct orders from Russia's political leaders, meaning these guys most likely answer to President Vladimir Putin himself, a leader infamous for killing off critics. So what exactly is the Alpha Group? Officially, they're a subgroup of Spetsnaz, Russia's special forces. First established by the KGB in 1974, control over the Alpha Group was assumed by the FSB when they were founded to replace the KGB in 95, and the Alpha Group has been in their back pocket ever since. Their main job is to act as a counterterrorism unit, responding directly to any violent attacks that may occur. Of course, that doesn't mean the FSB couldn't find other uses for their private elite squad. One of the Alpha Group's most famous operations, the Nordost Siege, took place under the newly instated FSB only seven years after the Federal Security Service was established. On October 23rd of 2002, a group of almost 40 Chechen terrorists stormed a concert hall in Moscow, taking 916 people hostage during an in-progress performance of a musical called Nordost. 
Several days of failed negotiations later, the FSB authorized a head-on assault, deploying Alpha Group to eliminate the threat and rescue the hostages. However, this wasn't to be any small feat. The Alpha Group soon found that the entire concert hall had been rigged with explosives that could be remotely triggered by the terrorists at the slightest sign of anyone trying to get inside, which would very likely have killed everybody inside. Given this tricky situation, the FSB instructed the Alpha Group to pump a nerve gas through the ventilation system as a way of incapacitating the terrorists while they gained access to the concert hall. With precise fire from silenced weapons, all terrorists in the hall were eliminated. We shot without fail. Hitting the body could lead to explosives detonation. That's why we aimed for their heads," said one anonymous former officer of the Alpha Group. Apparently, it took as little as five minutes for the team to eliminate every single one of the terrorists inside the main concert hall and a further 10 to track down and take out any stragglers in adjacent rooms. The Nordost siege was over in a quarter of an hour, and while challenging for the elite Alpha Group, the FSB's direction and coordination resulted in them saving hundreds of civilians. However, 67 were killed in the siege, and a further 63 died in the hospital shortly after, supposedly as a result of the nerve gas that was pumped into the concert hall and ambulances being unprepared to treat any hostages that were exposed to it. Naturally, the CIA has plenty of operatives of its own at its disposal, enough to rival the FSB Alpha Group. What you probably didn't know is that some of them may even have psychic powers. It sounds like something taken straight from David Cronenberg's scanners, or even the MK Ultra offshoot responsible for giving Eleven her powers and Netflix's Stranger Things. But the CIA are supposedly highly interested in the application of psychic abilities. According to declassified documents released in 2017, they tested the abilities of one Yuri Geller. Geller's a British-Israeli TV illusionist, best known for bending spoons supposedly with the raw power of his mind. While this is a trick that has long been met with skepticism from the British public, Yuri Geller's illusions allegedly managed to draw the attention of the CIA themselves. According to Geller himself, the Central Intelligence Agency wanted to ascertain if the entertainer was truly clairvoyant and telepathic. He even made the claim that they wanted me to stand outside the Russian embassy in Mexico and erase floppy disks being flown out by the Russian agents. This was all a part of a bizarre CIA program known as Stargate, yes exactly like the movie, which was focused on recruiting psychic warriors to operate on behalf of the CIA. After all, gathering intelligence becomes a much easier job when you've got an operative that can literally read an enemy's mind. The strangeness of the CIA's activities doesn't end with private assassins and psychic powers though. In fact, in a classic old-school spy fashion, the Central Intelligence Agency may have perfected the recipe for invisible ink. Often synonymous with spies, invisible ink is a great way to conceal top-secret instructions for undercover operatives or to keep highly sensitive information classified and away from prying eyes. Featured within those same declassified documents from 2017, is the CIA's own recipe for homemade invisible ink, just like grandma used to make. The recipe goes as follows. Make a silver print, fixed and bleached in mercury chloride. To make visible, dip in hypo. Ok, so maybe that's not the easiest concoction to recreate. The report featuring this recipe also includes instructions on how to open sealed letters without the recipient knowing, as well as what to do with messages that are printed with invisible ink on the human body. According to the report, in order to destroy any secret messages written on a body, that body needs to be thoroughly scrubbed down and washed with lime or lemon juice to hide any traces of the message. Russia's own intelligence agency has their own preferred modus operandi, of course. During March of 2018 in Wiltshire Cathedral City, UK, father and daughter Sergei and Yulia Skripal were found on a bench with foam spilling from their mouths after being exposed to a deadly poisonous nerve agent known as Novichok. Skripal was an intelligence officer who'd been moved to the UK in 2010 as part of a spy exchange. This assassination was eventually linked after an investigation conducted by the UK government to agents working for the GRU, another of Russia's intelligence services. Far from the James Bond-style spy thriller mystery of the CIA and their invisible ink, this incident was far more tragic. While the attack was carried out by the GRU, it's important to remember that the FSB could very easily conduct a similar attack. After all, they've already proved their fondness for nerve agents in the Nordaw siege. It's fair to say that the nations of Russia and America haven't always had the best relationship, and trust between the two countries has never quite recovered since the Cold War. This is something that can be seen mirrored in the interactions between the CIA and FSB. The ever-present rivalry between the United States and the Russian Federation persists even today. It's widely believed that the FSB was directly involved in the email leaks that undermined Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. 
Additionally, they've also played a hand in supporting a number of extremist parties in Europe, murdered Chechen opposition leaders in both Turkey and Austria, and perhaps most infamously of all, influenced the 2016 US presidential election. On January 10, 2017, a dossier published by BuzzFeed, albeit unverified and uncorroborated, suggested that the FSB had been collecting compromising evidence on Donald Trump. Many suspected that the goal of this was to blackmail the would-be president into acting as Vladimir Putin's puppet at the head of the US government. Whether this was true or not, President Trump's actions toward Russia have been seen by many as soft, and many military members considered his defense of Russia, even after learning of bounties put on US troops' heads by Russian agents, as tantamount to treason. But the CIA aren't above interfering in Russia's affairs either. Decades prior to the 2016 election, they recruited a Russian official who gradually began to climb the ranks of the country's government. This informant within the Kremlin became one of the CIA's most valuable and protected resources, feeding them information that pointed to the potential involvement of Russia and the FSB in the 2016 election. However, this informant who served as the CIA's only eyes into their inner workings of the Russian government was eventually extracted from the country for his own safety, with the CIA still protecting his identity to this day, although some believe it might have been the ill-fated Sergei Skripal. So which is the better spy agency? In one corner, secret assassins, psychic powers, and invisible ink. In the other, highly skilled elite special ops teams and a lot of nerve agents. It's almost too close to call. We'd like to think the CIA assassins with powerful telepathic abilities could hold their own against the FSB. And who knows, maybe somewhere in the world, in the shadows where civilians aren't allowed to look, a fight like that is going on, and we'd never even know. But if we're keeping our feet firmly rooted in the realm of reality, meaning psychic warriors need to be discounted and secret mind control projects like MKUltra are just seen as expensive and unethical failures, we feel like we need to give this one to Russia. While the CIA's history as a spy agency is definitely illustrious and influential, just ask the many countries and organizations they infiltrated, they don't quite match up to the calculated ruthlessness of the modern Russian FSB. Not to assassin shame you or anything CIA, but at least the FSB doesn't need to subcontract its extrajudicial murders. Just saying. Better enjoy this show while you can, in case some shadowy government agents come knocking at our door after this one. Now be sure to check out CIA vs KGB, which was better during the Cold War, and CIA Project Stargate and other declassified secrets. How successful were they?